so there was somebody in the chat earlier that asked, what does an event like Cocodona do to grow the sport? Like, what are the strengths of this particular type of event versus other prominent events in our sport? And I think part of the answer is what you're looking at on this live stream, which is what Brett and I were just talking about. Just the, the festive nature, the athletes aren't too deep in the pain cave yet. They're really acting in terms of camaraderie and I don't know. There's just, there's something more approachable about it. And I do think there's like a reality TV piece to it as well. Like as you see these journeys develop over a very long extended stretch of time. Yeah. And like you just see like deep storylines forming over the course of the race. And it does happen over the course of enough days where you really get to see that unfold. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Oh no, that was that was the end of that yeah, was the end of that. Someone drank a Bud Light. Thirty-seven miles in. Yeah, maybe. What? No judgment here. Yeah, I just I love the whole like pulled pork sandwich thing at the aid station. Me too. I just think it's so awesome. <laughs> Don't tell Kid Rock. <laughs> I know. Gosh. <laughs> Run to liquid death flavor number two. What do you got? I have severed lime, I which is sparkling, and I, I, well, I assume it's lime flavored. I've got rest in peach. <laughs> That's got quite a bit more lime flavor to it than uh, your standard like lime Lacroix. And push the run. Not only are we seeing these races sell out, but the live stream numbers too. It's interesting that you know we got close to two thousand people tuning in for this particular event. It's awesome. Yeah, we get to be a fan. We get to be fans of the sport, and now there's enough of us where it's maybe slightly less weird, and it's cool. It's in fact cool <laughs> to be a fan of 250 mile races. You heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> Angela says a Modelo and chips and cold salsa and guac sounds pretty good. Ooh, man. Pretty soon we'll see one of these aid stations sponsored by Modelo. <laughs> that would be pretty sweet. Yeah, we had another fast pack sighting talking about Megan McCarty for a second if I can find some oh yeah there it is we got a sighting on the the Bud Light tall boy that was at a K Money's table so maybe K Money maybe someone from K Money's crew I've I've completely gone all in on K Money um, I don't remember his name anymore because it's K Money <laughs> K Money's tables. Interesting. He's got the tackle box full of gear, <laughs> two different types of sunscreen, some roll-on sunscreen, maybe like a like a uh, one of those like little health superfood shots, a spring smoothie, a Bud Light Tall Boy, and then I saw just out of the uh, corner. Um, oh, what was it? There was another Gatorade, but I think this one was actually sugar. It was just. A lot going on you know there's a lot oh, of. oh that's what it was it was a hairbrush there was a hairbrush oh in the mcdonald's burgers finn that's what yes. you said yes you Look said this this race was going to be mostly fueled by burgers i think okay so you know how we talked about chad wright being one of our favorites early on k money is giving chad wright a run for his money right now dude he's giving him a run hey, for his k money <laughs> yeah we have such an eclectic spread of just right. gear on this table right now. See, I mean, the is they. You thought, you this is a crew a that I genuinely believe is prepared for anything. I bet they got road flares in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Do you think all those hamburgers are just going into the pack? I mean, because, yep, 
There you go, K Money. I love the McDonald's strategy. Looks a little bit like Kid Rock. Just like, it does. Like a kid version of Kid Rock. <laughs> <laughs> Rick yeah, I mean, Flair says those burgers are good for 250 miles or 250 years, whichever comes first. Maybe the quote of the yeah, day. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Uh, when I was in high school, my my science teacher had a Big Mac that was just sitting on the top of one of his cabinets that he bought his first year of teaching and just let it sit there. And he had been a teacher for like 20 years by the time I came through. And it looked almost identical to day one. It was creepy. Maybe that's how you preserve, preserve your insides. Eat McDonald's. Oh, there's so much action. So much action going on. We got someone jet boil. What are we jet boiling? What are we jet boiling? Hot dogs. Frozen hot dogs. Oh, it's like a camping sous vide. We got to get the hot dogs up to, you know, correct operating temps. Probably, what do we go for medium rare hot dog? 127 <coughs> degrees uh, before you let it rest. Yep. Yep. Oh, through hiker culture. I love it. Jet boil hot dogs. <clears throat> I love it. That is the scene right there. I love that. Yeah, I'm going to stick to like a filet and a real sous vide. You can have your uh, jet boil hot dogs. I'm loving all the close up shots of all the Gatorades now that there's just like a, a, a really big fascination with sugar, no sugar, high electrolyte. Low electrolyte? Gatorade. Why would Gatorade make a low electrolyte? That's just soda. Holden, Don has come through. I believe he's about two miles, one mile past the aid station at this point. I guess we also missed Michael McKnight coming through in that crowd, but Michael McKnight is through too. Yes, I was just wondering about where Mike McKnight was. And uh, yeah, definitely... And we did uh, just send a live stream link to Mike McKnight's crew. So hopefully over the course of this week, we'll be able to uh, check in with, uh, with his crew from time to time just That's to awesome. uh, keep tabs on, uh, on him. So, no, like oh. Fun. Hot dog, water, and pickle juice. Hot dog, water, and pickle juice. Dehydrate it into a powder. <laughs> Tailwind, that's like a April Fool's type tailwind advertisement right there. Interesting. Like, do you even really need to cook hot dogs? I mean, what if maybe the right answer was to not thaw those hot dogs out and just have like a little hot dog popsicle? <laughs> I mean, you know, glycerade. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. Dehydrated hot dog. That's a trail name for sure. So good. Oh, that fellow right there in the aid station. Yeah, that was a violent hiccup. So we had Megan McCarty in earlier. Mm -hmm. She's a physical therapist now living in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Shout out to the New Mexico trail running scene. But she is a former Arizonan and loves the state. And that's part of her reason to be back here has run the Ure 100 miler, is marrying her fiance, who is her crew captain, just two weeks after the race. That's cool. I'm doing the same thing for Run Rabbit if I can finish that race in uh, mid-September. So one thing I'm curious about, I mean, we know Killian Quartz tracker has been sometimes sluggish to update, but as of the most recent refresh, it shows Michael Versteeg overtaking Killian yeah. um, which would be one of the first lead changes in a while um, you know that's going purely off of the trackers I'm very curious what their status will be in the next aid station that we have eyes on but uh, just something to speculate about and then on the on the women's race uh, Sarah Osazuski is solidly in first at the moment 
Brett, there's a question in the chat here. What do you think the average weight of the packs that these runners are carrying is like coming out of this aid station? So I think they're probably, well, because I think they have to minim minimum of four liters of water as they leave, which is, how many liters are in a gallon? Five? Is it four? Four. A gallon weighs eight pounds. So, so you know, we're looking eight pounds base for just water right there, potentially even more. Um, you know, the amount of gels that we saw, like, like Sarah, us as you see, she probably carried at least a full pound of spring gels yeah. in her pack. Um, you know, then you have jacket, lights, other things like that. Like, we're probably looking 10 plus pounds for your pack. And that was something that I thought was interesting over the course of uh, Eric Sensman's uh, Coca Donut adventure that you can see on YouTube, The Long Way Home. Yep. He actually mentioned about how like they kind of need to do like a little pack reset. Um, I think uh, Sarah Osuzuski also talked about that. It was like you got to make sure your crew kind of resets your pack for you every X number of hours because as we've all come to in uh, races, you just start to accumulate crap in your pack and it just starts to settle to the bottom that you just don't need. Um and some, you know, as a runner, as you just get more and more delirious, you kind of just forget about it. Before you know it, you're, you know, you're carrying around, you know, 15 pounds when you maybe only needed five. Yep. So, you know, that weight's definitely going to change a little bit. But I bet at a minimum, most of these packs are in that kind of 10 pound range. So that's that's something you absolutely need to train with. And how much how much do those McDonald's hamburgers weigh? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, McDonald's hamburgers have shrunk in size over the years. They're, like, so disappointing. Like, I, I could eat, like, four of them. Like, it made sense that, uh, you know, that he that he had six burgers in his pack because that's, like, one real burger. Mm. Aid Station Fireball says the human head weighs eight pounds. So there's at least one human head in every runner's pack because – Americans don't use the metric system. They will use anything but the metric system. So it's like, how much do these packs weigh? Roughly one human head. <laughs> Brett, are we calling ourselves Coca Donuts now? Dude, I feel like it. <laughs> I feel like a Coca Donut. I could go for a Coca Donut. Oh, I could go for what kind of donut could you eat right now? Uh, probably like a. I always I always default to like maple bars. Um, I love maple bars. I ch I like the old fashioned donuts. I just kind of like that dense kind of d dense. Not, like big fluffy donuts are nice, but I do like kind of like the cakey kind of dense donuts. I could go for a Boston cream. What kind of donut do you think Andrew Glaze goes for? <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I really, I didn't think that there would be this much action coming in and out of these age stations. So, you know, apologies if we're not able to identify every runner that comes through uh, in real time, but their trackers are all doing pretty, pretty good. Bacon maple bars. Oh, bacon maple bars. I mean, I live in Oregon, so you know, I've had my had my fair share of voodoo <coughs> donuts. Uh, up in Eugene. Uh, that's I think that's where I had my first ever bacon maple bar. One of my favorite donuts from Voodoo Donuts is uh, it's called the Grape Ape, and it actually has like a purple frosting, and then they dunk it in like grape tang powder, and it's actually incredible. <laughs> oh, plus one to the curry donuts actually as well. Um, not quite what everyone would be thinking when we say curry donut, but those are incredible. That's actually a good question. What's the expected finish time for top finishers, and what's the DNF rate? Um, you know, that DNF rate's going to change quite a bit from year to year, um, just due to the factors of course conditions. Uh, but 
Oh, wait. Um, and then the course has changed a little bit every year. So, like, last year, Joe McConaughey won it in 59 hours. Um, in 2021, Michael Versteeg won it in 72 hours, and that was because they were two pretty different courses. On the ladies' side, Annie Hughes won it last year in 71 hours, and then uh, Maggie Guterell in 2021 won it in 85 hours. So those are, you know, those are just the winners of the last two years, and those are those are the best data points that we have. Um, but I guess. One thing we know for sure is that there are lots of hours left in this race. Um, I think that's Chad Wright right there. I think you might be right. I think this might be Chad Wright's hiding. Chad Wright, uh, Chad Wright looks a little tired. I'm being blunt about it. Yep. I, I realize now that that was actually a hat. I thought it was one of those like airplane neck donut things. But uh, just a bucket hat. AJW sighting there. <coughs> Producer Matt, do you know if we have any shots just outside the aid station, like in the five miles post aid? To don't believe we will have eyes on our runners until uh, Camp Kippa. Gotcha. So according to, so yeah, Michelle in the chat, according to our tracker, Sally is just under two miles from this aid station. So we've seen a lot of runners jogging the descent into Crown King, maybe 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes. Oh, yeah, and, like, how are the athletes going to be sleeping when it's time to sleep? Are they just going to pull off to the side of the trail and do a dirt nap? Are they going to cowboy camp? Are they going to wait to aid? Maybe that also changes depending on, like, their their napping experience, napping background. Like, I've never even taken a dirt nap, Finn. How many have you taken? I've taken a lot. Yeah. More, more than I uh, – no more shit. more dirt lot. naps than real naps? <laughs> I was going to say more than I care to admit, but I, I've taken my fair share of dirt naps. They're not bad, especially if you really need to nap. You'll nap anywhere. Yeah, exactly. So, like, I'm sure that a dirt nap would organically happen, you know, no problem uh, in this race. This runner that just came in here looks like uh, he just had some – he didn't have that much gear on him. Just a pack? Just a pack. Just a pack and some buns. Chad has stayed up for seven days before and ran 300 miles that week carrying a boat. He may not even sleep. I would love to hear a little bit more about this 300-mile yes. boat carrying experience. Usually when you go 300 miles with a boat, you sit in it. But not the case with Chad Wright. He's the most interesting man in the world. Boats ride him. <laughs> This runner here looks up. Oh, wait, just lost the camera. But there was a runner sitting there in, in the shades that just looked again unreal fresh, like Killian did. Some of the runners just don't. Have, either they switched shirts. The person in the white sun shirt there just mm. not an ounce of sweat or salt on them. Apparently, it's amazing. Chad Wright is not tired. Tired Lang. is Chad Wright. <laughs> No, that's 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 like worse. <laughs> Laying down is part of a strategy, as it should be. Like I think, you know, strategic sits make sense to me. Um, which was like pretty opposite. Like Sarah Osazuski, the first lady that came through, she did not sit down at all. 
She was full standing through the aid station. And, you know, I think you can't, you can't fear the chair in a race like this. Like, you, you're going to sit down at least a little bit. Uh, the mileage for the aid station that we're looking at right now is mile 37. It's true, yeah. I'm curious if uh, our aid station cameraman is listening, if there's ever an update on the uh, jet boil hot dog situation. Oh, here we go. We are going to get an update on the frozen glizzies. <laughs> Wow, they were way back there in the corner. Oh, look at that. Beautifully boiled hot dogs ready to be consumed. It looks like they will be consumed with ketchup. That's pretty classic. Maybe a little bit of beef jerky sprinkled on it. Oh, yeah. That's incredible. Thank you so much to our, our uh, aid station camera to be able to maneuver around with such ease. So one, there was a question in the chat. How much vert do you climb in these first 37 miles to Crown King? I think you're going to get somewhere around 10,000 feet of climbing. It's it's a Yeah, because you net uphill by quite a bit. You net, you net uphill by quite a bit. Uh, do we have eyes on – is that Chad Wright right That's now? That's Chad Wright, yes. He looks tired. Yep. But I also don't have any experience like seeing him race in the past, so I, I can't judge off any prior body language other than just what I'm seeing right now. Question in the chat, does Cocodona do more for the growth of our sport than Western? I think that both do a great job growing the sport. I just think in different ways. I think that there's just different audiences, and it's all good. But it's a good question. Total amount of climbing between the start and Crown King is right around 10,400 feet. <coughs> Everyone can hear me eating Doritos. Julian in the chat asks a pretty deep question. Are things on fire or is fire on things? Whoa. <laughs> I'm going to have to think about that one. <laughs> you don't ever stop clapping your hands. The distance between them just sometimes gets farther apart. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, Chad, we got a smile out of Chad right. That's great. Looking like um, coconut water. Tall boy of coconut water. And one sock. If I were going for like a like a look or a kit for Cocodona, I would probably try and emulate the um uh oh shoot, the John Kelly from Barkley Marathon a couple years ago with the orange beanie. Oh yeah, trash bag. I would try. You know, I would have to summarize. <laughs> sum summarize. That's to condense something. Make a summer version of that kit. But that would be like the look. Like that would be what I would be trying to channel. Yeah. Is like I would. I would want to bring that John Kelly energy <laughs> to uh, something like Cocodona. I would love to see John Kelly do this race. Speaking of John Kelly, John Kelly would be a fun one to see. Uh, line up for Cocodona. Brett, there's somewhat. Jason in the chat says, I got a job that works remotely just for these five days. Well, thank you so much. That is, that's incredible. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> that's awesome. Love the dedication. Yeah. Yeah. Huge kudos to the crews of the runners in this race. Crewing this race is such a massive job. Um, just not only with the logistics of it, but like having to know your runner so well where when they are completely looped out of their mind, you still know what they need and what's going to be best for them. And 
not letting them drop, etc. I mean, there's just so many fine details that get amplified over a race this long. And yeah, the crew can absolutely, you know, save save someone's race. 100%. It's funny, I actually, this, um, kind of the aid station vibes right now remind me of kind of the, like, middle of, like, UTMB at Cormier in that high school, I don't know if it's a high school gym, but in that big gymnasium where everyone gets to access their drop bags and they, like, take it out, they're seated at the picnic benches, mm -hmm. going through everything, like, taking a good eat, um, taking their time before heading back out there, because it really is, like, it's a big commitment to head back out on this course. Um, you know, and that's a choice that everyone makes every time they leave the aid stations. They're like, okay, here we go. We're heading back out. That's awesome. was that, that was a Coca Dona tattoo. What was that, Bib 122? 122. Let's see. Spell them. Got it. So Brian Jancic, who we just saw there on the feed, has finished the previous two years at Cocodona and just really loves this race as it allows him to train hard during the nicest time of the year in Southern Arizona. That's cool. That is cool. Um, I don't know exactly how many runners are going without a crew, but the number is more than zero. Like we know that Adam Glaze is, is it Adam? Andrew. Andrew. Andrew Glaze, Andrew. sorry. Andrew Glaze is uh, going no crew, no pacers. We got a Dominic Grossman sighting. And, yeah, Sally's probably coming in. Dom, Dom looks warm. He's sipping on an O'Doul's. He's got a big sun hat. Dom has been skiing a lot. Brett, would you ever do Cocodona? I'm not ready to answer that question <laughs> yet. Yeah, just I gotta watch for a few more days. Because <laughs> like, I mean, of course, like we're watching mile 37. Yeah, of course I want to run Cocodona. Every this looks so fun. Great. Let's see. We'll, let's revisit that question in 48 more hours. <laughs> Yeah, Dominic Grossman does have one of the best mustaches in not only the sport, but Absolute just... Absolute soups trainer. <laughs> <laughs> one of the best mustaches just in all of humanity. One more thing about this Brian Jancic guy, just to add color to his background, he volunteers for the search and rescue team in Pima County, Arizona, which he says exposed him to all sorts of outdoor activities, including canyoneering, trad climbing, pack rafting, and adventure racing. So, okay, just so another cool. Background. He's got he's got the adventure side of things. Yep. Um, it's on the chat that Pete Kostelnik is no crew, as well. Wow. Also, Brian says he saw the promo video for this race and he was hooked. So, kudos to the Air Viper Marketing. There you go. Got the hot dogs. Oh, the Jet Boil hot dogs are finally being served up. There they are. I can't wait to see the look on her face. She's like, oh my gosh, these are the best hot dogs I've ever had. They're cooked in a Jet Boil. It's a good question. Do you need a four-wheel drive vehicle to access the aid stations, or can you do it with any regular car? Um, I believe some aid stations uh, maybe require four-wheel drive high clearance, mm -hmm. but most of the crewable aid stations would not necessarily require that. Right. There we go. 
should be seeing Sally here any second unless she's already there. I think we're still waiting. Bib 65 just entered the ACs. And there's Sally. Oh, Sally is the joy. Sally has made it into the mile 37 aid station. Seems very happy and in good spirits. Are you liking? Yes, I am. Hi, you guys. Saying hey to the live stream. Big live stream. Let's finish the most epic time. It was so beautiful. Matt uh, Falconer in the chat says, "Will there be any course interviews like you had the first year?" And the way people talk about the time was like, "You're gonna die." Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to try our best to talk to as many of the runners as we can throughout the course of the week, keeping in mind that, uh, you know, we also want to want like them to have their space to, you know, kind of do their thing as well. Right. But we do hope to try and uh, get as many kind of aid station insights as we can and as many kind of crew insights as we can throughout the course of the week. I think we talked about it earlier, but one of the best YouTube channels to follow in our sport is Sally McRae's personal vlog. The production value is amazing. She takes you all through the behind the scenes of her nutrition, her training, her mindset for all this. Really well done. I think her husband helps with the channel as well. You just saw him in the picture there. It's excellent. So yeah. go check it out if you want a little bit more color on her prep for this race because she's really taken a an academic approach to breaking it all down and, and making it work for her. Sally's going, went straight to the watermelon. Good tactic. Just saw Chad again, still kind of sitting there. I think he's taking a break. Yeah, a bit of a long uh, gaze going. Um, yeah, Sally appears to be, you know, spirits high, everything's together. Do you know that brand of hat she's wearing, Brett? Uh, I couldn't tell you just immediately by looking at it. I mean, there's a handful of brands that make some big sun hats like that. I mean, I'll go ahead and plug Sunday Afternoons, local southern Oregon company. Actually, they're based out of uh, Phoenix, Oregon. There was another one if we're going down the rabbit hole that I loved. Yeah. Uh, Sally is a Nike sponsored athlete, so it it could very well just be a Nike Nike hat. Yeah. Um maybe maybe it's a custom one. The swoosh the swoosh will make anything for you. If you ask them enough times. Outdoor research. Billy Yang in the chat. Good to see you, Billy. Good to see you, Billy. Don maybe, Don maybe doing some, uh, getting his feet up. That's good. Yeah. yeah, get that O'Doul's in your system. Dom's a veteran here, by, by the way. Yeah. Dom finished last year, I believe, right? It was last year, not the first year. So, I mean, Dom's probably just doing a very calculated leg elevating. Um, looks like uh, Sally's got an entire box of shoes, but the ones that are queued up next look like the Nike Wild Horse 7. <laughs> it's a good-looking shoe. Yeah. Yeah, the... Uh, Nike's putting out really great products these days. I I've really been enjoying the revamp to the Nike Trail lineup. I mean, I mean I'm not I'm not a fan of the Nike Wild Horse Seven. I love the Nike Wild Horse the Eight. eight. Yep. The Eight was fantastic. The Seven I just couldn't. Yeah, Seven just had the tongue bruised the top of my foot. Um, but you know that's that's more of a personal problem. <laughs> Brett, I think Billy brings up a really interesting comment here. I think one of the 
paradigm shifts we've noticed in this type of racing is just how much more lax the aid station experience is for these runners. Even at the front of the race, like 20 to even 30 minutes isn't out of the question. They're really like going through all of the motions, getting their feet up if they can. It's even it's so different even from 100 mile. Absolutely, and you have to. I really think you need to use this time to like truly make sure your core temperature's down. You've checked all the boxes in regards to getting in any fuel hydration that you need at the time, repacking the pack and getting everything that you're going to need to go and like double, triple, quadruple checking everything. It's, yeah, it's just all, it's just that much more important because once you leave, uh, once you leave this aid station, like it's, you know, quite a few more hours before the next one. A lot of the people in the chat, and I think I agree, we want to see Billy make a film on the 200-mile scene at some point. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. <clears throat> we, would all, we would all love that. Uh, yeah, Nike's, Nike's got some really fun shoes just around the corner. <laughs> uh, and to all those Nike has terrible grip haters... Your mind is about to be blown. You want to give them a tutorial on the React foam as well? No, nah, we don't need to go into the, We don't have enough time, Finn, to go into the details of Nike React foam. This is only a 250 miler after all. Let's see. What, we got a tall boy can of Pringles. This aid station's theme has been the tall boy. Yes. Um, whether it's like a tall boy... Sunscreen, tall boy Pringles, tall boy Bud Light. They might hear me because I'm wearing these. Sally is electing to stand here. We've seen more runners as they've come in embrace the chair, which I know you're instructed not to do in a smaller ultra, but she's retaining that strategy from the other race scene. Yeah, there's definitely an amount of like, you know, I don't know if it's like fear or hesitation or just like, Sometimes the muscles lock up in weird ways when you sit down and just change up the movement pattern a ton. Um, looks like Sally's got like a pretty wide variety. I saw some Huma gels. I, saw, I see some goo. Um, Dry bananas. I saw some beef jerky. I see some pretzels. We're going, going for the wild horse as we, you know, get a little bit higher up. Um, Sometimes it's not even a factor of like changing shoes so that way they can, you know, these shoes handled this part of the course differently. Uh, just changing up like the footbed under your foot, uh, you know, it can kind of be the equivalent of like brushing your teeth 80 miles into 100 mile. Great where comparison. It, it's just like your feet wake up, your ankles wake up. Sometimes things just feel amazing uh, when you switch up the footwear. But actually, I, I brought so much blisters. So that, that could very well be what what Sally's doing right now just switching it up you know have something different to experience underfoot the brushing your teeth for your feet is a great reference because yeah if, if, if anyone hasn't tried brushing their teeth midway through a hundred mile I absolutely recommend doing it like brushing your teeth you know 12 hours into a run like that it's like the equivalent of taking like 10 goos no, this is good because I, I need to get a jet. I have to get one plane. Yep. And how's your uh, battery? I never took my phone out. So, I think it'll be. I think it's fine. I'm not using actual notification. Yeah, go grab the bottom. Yeah, she looks good. Yeah, wet wipes as well. How are you doing? You know, good. On face, feet, hands, anything. It's incredible. Yeah, let's get a check on Chad if we can. That'd be awesome. Oh, no. oh. Rick Flair, 
By the way, Rick Flair, thank you for taking an interest in the trail running scene. That's a big name right there. Um, <laughs> I, we were just talking about this. I think it's totally normal, and I think it's totally warranted too. I think this is part of the the current present day strategy of 200 mile racing. <laughs> Producer Matt just uh, just cracked a. I think it's a classic. Death. He got, yeah. Classic LD. <laughs> Liquid Death is good. Mountain Fresh. Do you love the giant plastic bins? Um, you know, it is a nice way to keep things organized. Probably going for some clothing changes. Mike Greer exited this aid station probably a half hour ago. I'm on my, th well, I've had three liquid deaths today. I've had two in this broadcast. How about you, Brett? Uh, I'm like one and a half, one and a quarter liquid deaths uh, deep today. I went with the armless Palmer first, and then I went with rest and peach. Rest in Peach is really good. I've just got a lime, lime bubbly, severed mm -hmm. lime. Should we talk a little bit about what oh. these runners have ahead of them? Yeah, but this aid? before we do, shouts to Ben's wife, uh, Melissa. Sounds like she's coming back from a foot in injury. Is almost back to training. Well, we're wishing you a speedy recovery and best of luck on the next build up. Yes. Yeah. What kind of what's the course profile looking like out of this aid station? So you are gonna have your long your longest descent of the day so far. You will have another steep climb after the 53 aid. It's going to be a pretty steep 10-mile climb. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have a descent, but, like, gosh, it's not that much. And for a 250-mile race, like, are we are we, uh, are we, we looking forward to descents in a race this long? Like, what's better, the climbing or the descending in a 250-mile race? I think climbing. I mean, my gut tells me you don't want to – put yourself in situations where you're incentivized to run for all the wrong reasons because it just feels good in the moment. Hold back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the downhills. Like, those, I, those, I fear those a little bit more. I mean, if you're looking at the course map from mile 63 to mile 100, that is one giant 37-mile descent. Yeah. See, like, that... And then there's almost, there's no descending until the very end, uh, more or less. <laughs> like you're pretty much up or flat after the after the mile 135. Yeah, you're basically climbing the rest of the race. Yeah, that's so brutal. And then like the descent at the very end, like that's not fun at all because you're descending from mile 240 to 250 off of Eldon, which is yeah, that's brutal. We thought about going up it this morning but then didn't because we were like it's pretty steep angela asks what the gap between sally and the first place female is we saw sarah through here maybe an hour and change ago at least um let me see if i can pull aid station splits i have to say one of the things about these 200 mile live streams great day for the gear industry so many organic shots on every single piece of nutrition and apparel that you could imagine yeah so per the live tracker sarah came through the crown king aid station at 134 134 so it's today. about two so hours eight eight hours 34 minutes elapsed time so yeah she's nearly two hours ahead as of right now yep 
I lose track of time. This is just time is flying by. <laughs> Oh, uh, I just refreshed my tracker and Killian Quartz uh, tracker updated. Last time I had updated, it said Michael Versteeg was in front. Now it looks like Killian is uh, about a mile up on Michael Versteeg. They're about roughly 46 and 47 miles into the race. Which, yeah, I mean, that's, that's still pretty close. like Sally's tending to some foot issues. Um, yeah, if possible, we would love to uh, pop back over to the Chad Wright crew and see if uh, Chad is making any uh, making any headway towards getting out of the aid station. If you get a chance and if you're looking to listen to a good podcast episode, Chad was on the Everyday Ultra podcast with Joe Corsione about a week or two ago just talking about his prep for this race and I think these were the these were the moments he was deliberately seeking out and excited to work through and we saw that sort of thousand mile stare a couple minutes back and yep absolutely the dark McKnight will move up tonight I predict it's a good nickname the dark McKnight. I do like that Switching back and forth between a couple cameras, trying to get trying to get some images out to everyone. Let's see. You know, one thing to keep in note about Sally McRae, this was this is the first of four planned 200 mile races this year she's going to do the triple crown in addition to cocodona i am fully an advocate for her taking as much time as she needs here there's plenty of race what is a part of the triple crown of 200 is it bigfoot moab and tahoe and tahoe okay yep. imagine if there was a golden ticket series for 200 mile races how do you even do that like <laughs> what if the winner of the triple crown got entry into the following year's Cocodona 250 you're right Cocodona should be like the championship the triple crown it. is the qualifier races you can do any of those or all three winner gets in then you go to Cocodona well those are all owned by Candace right and she's starting yeah, a, so. another 200 mile race in uh, southern Arizona so it could make sense that those four races would would commingle within the same ecosystem. Obviously, I was joking about Cocodona. Uh, it would be awesome. To, <coughs> Cocodona's the championship to bring it all together and uh, uh, you know collaborate to grow the this kind of growing niche side of the sport. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think Candace has a really strong ecosystem of her own that she, if she wanted to, she could create something like that and yeah. Yeah. be super successful. Is, is the, are these 200 mile races to that point yet where that's needed? I, I, I'm not sure they are. Like, I don't think again, like kind of like looking at, at like UTMB's elite qualification process, you're like, we don't need to make more barriers to entry to, for elites to get on the star line. Like, yeah, I think we're at the point where like, if you're really good and you want to race it, you just sign up for it. Yep. Um, and that's what I like. That's what I like. Like we don't need to encourage over racing either. On that note, I think this is a good question for the chat. For those of you out there that have done both 200 mile events and 100 mile events, which one took a greater toll on the body in your opinion? And which one did you recover relatively faster from? Hostel Nick coming in, just came into the aid station.
Patrick Morse in this in the chat says, "Fun fact: the Triple Crown will be different this year because two of the races are within a two and a half week time span." So I'm guessing like that's going to be Bigfoot and Tahoe. And for some folks that are doing that, they're going to finish Tahoe and then hop right into Bigfoot or vice versa. I'm not sure what the exact schedule is. That's wild. That's so difficult to just have to manage. I mean, up being alive. After the end of the first one, and then starting the second one. Gosh, yeah. Eight Station Fireball, actually, if you could link to that Divide 200, if there is a website for it, that'd be cool. <laughs> Deb, Deb Runs Far says, Cocodona took way more out on a cellular level. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting some debate here, though. Some folks are saying 100 miler is way harder on the body. 200s are longer, less intensity. It might come down to the person. Yeah. Just, you know, what their, I don't know, what their genetics uh, account for. So Pete Kostlinik, for folks that don't know, um, excellent multi-day athlete. I believe at one point he had the Trans America record. Yeah, he had the Trans America FKT. They, he put all of that on Strava. That was actually pretty fun. And while we just have a quick little moment here, let's go ahead and have a word from one of our uh, one of our good sponsors of this race, Satisfy Running. Since launching in 2015, Satisfy Running has become renowned for its unique take on developing technical equipment that reduce distractions to help runners unlock the high. We're excited to announce Satisfy as a sponsor of the Cocodona 250 as they curate a first-of-its-kind premium aid station recovery experience for runners as they make th their way through mile 100 at the Satisfy Fane Ranch aid station where runners will also hopefully get a nice cold can of Flota. Shout out to Satisfy for uh, for their incredible support. And Flota will be coming to market at twenty five dollars a can, apparently. So stay tuned. Pre order now. It's a premium product. Ooh. I would love to get. Matt, do you a know check. how many runners have come through the aid station so far? We have a total aid station update. I figure it's probably in that like forty-ish range. The Coca Dona two hundred and fifty is. Uh, the course, the cutoff is one hundred twenty-five hours. Just fact-checking myself on that. Cocodona 250, the overall cutoff for the race is 125 hours. So the runners have 125 hours to complete this course. I feel like that 125 course is generous, too. That's a generous cutoff time, which is cool. 75, yeah. Based on my quick count, it looks like there have been 48 runners 48. through the aid station. Okay. Okay. All right, for folks in the chat, we did the music question earlier. If you were required to eat only one thing for the entirety of a 200-mile race, what would it be and why? Also drink, but first eat. What would you be eating? I would have such a hard time fueling for a race like this with only one one type of food. Like the flavor fatigue would just get so Oh, so it'd be so brutal. Um <laughs> Donuts and Monsters, awesome. Donuts and Monsters, yeah. Uncrustables is a good one. Can I just like roll up the liquid and food into one and just go ketones? <laughs> Oh, 
Only if they're exogenous. Well, yeah. <laughs> Definitely exogenous ketones. Dehydrated hot dog water and pickle juice. That's all you need. <laughs> Mashed potatoes and roctane. Mashed potatoes and roctane, like, honestly, not a bad combo. I feel like I would probably go something in the root of burritos and then just water. Yeah. Like, well, burritos is kind of a loaded question because I can put whatever I want in a burrito. I mean, yeah, under these rules that we're making up right now, you can't change what's in the burrito. So, like, whatever you make for the first burrito is what is in all the other burritos. But yep. I feel like that would give a lot of flexibility to create, like, a really nice – uh, ultra burrito and then I would just go water to have something neutral I think I think that could work yeah what we're watching right now is our kind of our crown king saloon aid station our static cam um, I don't know if our mobile cam is up and running at the yeah. moment <clears throat> They are they are recharging, so ap apologies. <laughs> um, I know there's a lot of questions in the chat about what the status of Chad Wright is, and Ch Chad is not in danger. If anything, danger is in Chad. <laughs> that was better than <laughs> than <laughs> him being tired or something, but. <laughs> Coke and grilled cheese. See, now drinking only Coke for 250 miles and, like, not having any water, that seems hard for me because if we're going into the science of it, you know, Coke isn't isotonic. So, like, it's, like, density is slightly thicker than your blood. So, like, when it's hot out, it's really hard to digest and actually hydrate with something like Coke. So looking at it from a strategy standpoint, Coke would be tough. Yeah, Coke would be tough. Jar of mayo and a pea cup. <laughs> you got to share mean, some of these. <laughs> I don't – I mean, I understand the jar of mayo, but, like, the pea cup, you can't drink a pea cup. <laughs> Should we ask the audience whether – what they think of the naming of the race, Coca Dona 250 versus the Dona 400. <laughs> well, this is America, and we don't do <laughs> metric. So, okay, you gotta give them context, though. Where did this all emanate from? Um, well, I was just wondering. I was looking at Coca Dona 250. I was like, oh, how many kilometers is 250 miles? And it's like 401. And then I was like, oh, 400. Like, that's kind of a, that's an even bigger number. Like, let's just go for the biggest number. And then it was like, Coca Dona 400. Oh, the Dona 400. <laughs> it just sounds like a like it's on the NASCAR circuit. It's on the Sprint Cup circuit for sure. Like, you in on a Dona 400? So I guess we got to throw this out to the audience here for the chat. Dona 400 or Coca Dona 250? Where do you stand? The 401k. <laughs> yep. I'd invest. <sighs> Dona 400 sounds exactly like a NASCAR race. Like, shake and bake at the Dona 400. Yeah. <laughs> Who's going to shake and bake? That would actually be really interesting if this was um, – so, like, one of the categories at um, – oh, what's the the team race in Colorado, the stage race called? Trans Rockies. Oh, Trans Rockies, yeah. Trans Rockies. Like, Gelfie's done what, that. Yeah, what if this was Trans Rockies style where you had to run this race with a partner? The entire time like that would be such a fascinating dynamic oh. with who you pick because like you guys like literally have to do the entire race together i love that um that would be very interesting your team because if you are not tearing each other's heads off by the end of the race you are best friends for life that is a great idea I'm here for it. I'm here for the, the Dona 400 team race, shake and bake. Yeah, there's so many. And also, we could even imagine like a, a cross-country team style thing where you don't have to stick together, but like you're racing not just for yourself, but for, you a know. Team, a team race team. within Coca-Dona. A team race within Coca-Dona. 
You could just randomize everyone and put them across like five different teams. Like anyone who's on the entrance list, you're like, oh, oh yeah. the sorting hat has put you in team Hufflepuff. Like, yes. Race for them. Good luck. Hope you guys win. Because that doesn't like change anything about the race other than just adding like a fun team dynamic. Yep. Yep. I wonder if David Goggins has ever expressed interest in the Dona 400. Oh my god, he would be such a terrifying running partner for the <laughs> Dona 400. <laughs> 1.3 million feet for Coca Dona. The Dona 1.3 mil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then it'd just have like the <laughs> FT at the end of people be like, featuring who? Live running tour. I love that. The live running tour. <laughs> tomorrow, I I'm just like out of producer Matt. <laughs> decked out. I'm rolling up to the studio in my Bentley tomorrow. Just getting like, oh yeah, payday. Um. So I listened to a podcast with uh, Joe Corsione that he hosted with uh, Mike McKnight and. Mike McKnight was pretty adamant on saying that he was not a zero carb athlete. He's a low carb athlete. And he actually went into pretty um like pretty deep detail on how he strategically uses carbohydrates for fueling and it's not so much I don't eat carbs, I'm a keto athlete. It's just more strategic, low carb. He, um, a way he described it was like, he doesn't want his body to become totally dependent on only carb fueling. Um, just like in the same way how people can overdo the amount of caffeine they consume in a day. Whereas like, you know, if you don't consume that much caffeine and then you consume a bunch of caffeine, you notice that more than mm. as if you're consuming a lot of caffeine all the time. Um, that's kind of his take to how he approaches fueling with carbohydrates over the course of his training and a race. So he's definitely still eating carbs, but he's just utilizing it in a slightly different way than, you know, people on most like regular high carb diets. Mm. So to answer your question, I don't know if it was serious or not. Uh, Michael McKnight has definitely eaten at least one carb out there today. Yeah, that's a good, that was a good summary of his, uh, his discussion with Joe. <laughs> Haven't gotten an update on uh, Andrew Glaze yet uh, at this aid station. Gonna update the trackers, see if. <laughs> Troy, that's a great question. <laughs> Who's going to carry the boats and the logs? <laughs> yeah, we talked about it earlier in the show, but Andrew Glaze ran 100 miles on Friday into Saturday at the Canyons race out in Auburn, California. And I believe after finishing, he went to the airport, hopped a flight, to Phoenix and has just been eating nonstop between arriving in Phoenix and the day of this race. And he's attempting the double, which is so cool. That was one thing we talked about. That is quite the double. Way early on is like one of the reasons you might not want to stop for so long is that like recovery phase starts to kick in and you get sore and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, is there like a strategy where you finish Canyon's 100 mile and then just keep the engine burning all the way to the start? It's got like a bike trainer or something. Yeah, like just keep the metabolism hot. Don't let the body cool down. Just keep it going. Okay, this is some, someone says, I hope Courtney races Cocodone at some point. Here's another fun question for the chat. Who is somebody that has not raced Cocodona yet that is a favorite athlete of yours that you would like to see race and go into why as well? Uh, extra points if you mention someone that hasn't been already mentioned yet.
Alicia Jenkins, super fan, <clears throat> rooting for number 27. Coco Canyon's 350 wait, for Andrew. Wait, says, I know one. Is, wait, wait, is Anton in the chat right now? Why would he be <laughs> M. Kurpichka? I know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's going. Lionel Sanders in the Cocodona 250. That would be an interesting one. Ooh, Mike, I agree. <laughs> Camille. Shit in the woods. Would love to see Camille Heron run the Cocodona 250. Yeah, me too. I could see Heather Jackson doing really well at this race, actually. <laughs> no, I'm not Anton. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, there's a, there's actually a lot of people who would be very fascinating. I, I think John Kelly was one of my, like one of my my original picks. That would be uh, very interesting to see race this. Ricky Bobby. Ricky Bobby. <laughs> Ricky Bibby. Francois Dane would actually be, that's a, a very good answer just because yeah. of the way he smashed the John Muir Trail FKT a couple years ago. You know, one thing, Brett, we've talked about, which I think could be interesting to get into here, is how when you think about a lot of these long trail FKTs and 200-plus mile events, we've typically seen the, the quote-unquote higher profile athletes that come to this race. They're at sort of like the ta they tend to be at like the tail end of their competitive careers. It's their quote-unquote swan song. Do you think that that's going to remain the case, or are we going to see more people like the – Joe McConaughey's of the world, like the Annie Hughes's of the world, invest in this distance right smack in the middle of their prime? Oh, absolutely. We're seeing it in hundreds in a way we didn't see it a handful of years ago where, yep. you know, you couldn't move up to the hundred until you were like 35, but now we have people in their <laughs> 20s absolutely <laughs> crushing it. As, uh, it just as it grows, the sport grows, um, this event grows and gets more competitive, you will see more people hopping in and doing it as soon as they want to. You know, I think that's really what it is. Um, you know, it's, I mean, sure, it's a massive distance. It's a massive undertaking. But, you know, to an extent, just waiting like 20 years doesn't necessarily make you more prepared for it. Sometimes just trying it can make you the most prepared. Got a couple votes for uh, David Laney. Oh, I would be good. Yeah, I would I would be up for uh, watching uh David Laney do the Cocodona 250. But yeah, to go off what you said, that's what I think Dave Horton told Scott Jurek very early in his career. I think Scott had at the time in his late 20s expressed interest in the Appalachian Trail, in the PCT, in this long distance stuff. And Dave Horton's like, wait till your 40s, wait until you're at the tail end of your career, make it your swan song. And I totally agree. I, I love that these athletes are breaking that narrative. And they're like, this is what inspires me. This is what I want to compete in, and I'm going to try it out. Yeah. You just have to be smart about it. That's really so much of what it is. Like, understand the rest aspect and, you know, how much rest it takes yep. after after one of these events. Um, you know, that's something you see a lot of people in their younger years run into is just they don't give themselves the proper amount of time to rest. Yep. Ooh, Zach Bitter. Can you repost that, Matt? The oldest person running the Cocodona 250? That question. It's a great question. Uh, yeah, the Zach Bitter comment got me thinking. Uh, yeah, Zach Miller in the Coco 250 would be would be pretty interesting as well. How would Zach Miller train for a race like Cocodona? <laughs> I think he'd break Strava. Cool. <laughs> The little blue weekly bars would pop out of his computer screen. <laughs> I mean, would we see similar training to what like Michael Greer was doing in the build up, you know? Like three or four yes. days where it's like at least a third of the distance is covered. Yes, except Zach would be hammering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, and for those who are just tuning in, we're um, yeah, we're we've got our static cam going on the uh, mile thirty-seven aid station as we are you know recharging the mobile cam and trying to get that one uh, back to life. <clears throat> Would it be good to do like a quick update of what we've seen in the last three to four hours for people that are just joining? Yeah, then go go for it. Yeah, so Brett and I hopped on at 12 Pacific, and um, we have been hanging around this Crown King aid station for the last four hours or so, watching a lot of the front quarter half of the race come through, and Killian Court came through in first. Um, Sarah, I'm going to mess up the last name, but Ostazowski, I believe, came through in first on the women's side. Um, but Mike Versteeg on the men's side was really back and forth with Killian um, ever since. And One, at the moment, though, we actually have eyes on Killian Korth. Uh, our drone pilot has awesome. found the leader. Awesome. On this seemingly never-ending road. That is such an incredible shot. Like You can see he can't see where he's going, but we can. And just to add context, this is um, what is called the Senator Highway. So as you can say the, see the name, uh, quite misleading. Um, not, not in fact a highway, um, very much so a, a Forest Service road. But runners will be on that for um, quite some time as they make their way towards Arastra Creek and Camp Kippa and eventually to, um, to uh, Prescott and Whiskey Row. All right, that's our. Back to you in the studio. <laughs> that was that was Matt, our expert course analysis slash producer slash everything else. All, all we're doing is sitting here talking about what's happening, and any question that we can't answer, we throw it to Matt, and he has an answer. It's good yeah. to good to have a Matt in your corner. Just a couple of the personal highlights for me. And then I'd be curious to get your take. One thing that stuck out to me is just how long top runners are staying in the aid station, really taking care of their bodies, their mind, eating, cooling down, et cetera. That was the first thing. Um, and then just like the camaraderie between the runners too. Like they're still at this point where it doesn't feel like competition is at the forefront of their minds. They seem to be working together, encouraging each other, cheering each other on. <laughs> yeah, so. I'm just, I'm not sure if, wanting to win this race is enough of a why to get to the finish i don't i don't know if that's enough yep um like i don't think it can just take simply take like a competitive person to win this race i think there's has to be more reason to do it than just i, I want to win this race because i saw it on on the tv you know yeah and 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 we're seeing that at these aid stations it's like that extra camaraderie it's like it doesn't mean they're trying any less hard but, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. Yep. And then just look at the movement strategy here, too. This is Killian, and he's alternating between hiking and jogging and really leaning on the hiking portion. And this is the person that is at the very front of the race, the tip of the spear. And this is how they're moving. I mean, this is just the – this is the style at this present day in the 200-mile racing scene. Yep. And now he's broken into a bit of a jog. Um, clearly on kind of like an interval type pattern. How cool would that be if we were broadcasting this live from a helicopter right now and shouting down to Killian? I mean, do you need anything? Would, it re <laughs> would a real live helicopter be any better than a small drone? <laughs> like, it's for, the, it's for the effect. He's just getting blasted with dust. We're going Michael Bay on this broadcast. What about what about a blimp? A blimp would be pretty cool. That'd uh, be pretty sweet. That would be like sweet. just giant we need, to, and some fans. we need to get a good year sponsor. Good Aren't there year. only like oh, yeah. ten in existence? I mean, how hard could it be to build? I mean, come on now. It's just a bunch of air. I could build a blimp. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I've blown up a balloon like in my day. All right. Navigated the cattle guard. That's good. Last thing you want to do is for it to work on you. 
according to Reader's Digest, there are only 25 blimps left in ex- existence as of 2022. Wow. Is, is the, blimp, the blimp industry is not booming? You know, there's it is not, not like booming. A huge Maybe demand. we need a hot air balloon. That's a booming industry here but in Arizona. How do you make hot air balloons like move directionally? Isn't that just like best, no, best of luck to you? We need to get an expert on, I think. Do we have any hot air balloon experts <laughs> in the chat? Can we follow someone with a hot air balloon? Or does it need to be a blimp? Oh, man. Huge blimp that just says Dona 400 on it. <laughs> man. Oh, I can see it now. 47% of this point to point race ship. course is double track. See, what you're seeing here is fairly representative of the race. Maybe we should start a petition um, and we'll present it to Jamil that the next large air vipa purchase should in fact be a blimp <laughs> aka airship aka dona 400 <laughs> blimp justification shock and awe <laughs> it would be so worth it do you know what the cost is on a blimp well, I mean, I can only imagine. I've bought balloons full of helium at the dollar store before, and it's probably a million times bigger, so I'm going to go with a million dollars. Try 40 million. Oh, 40 million for a balloon? As but comparison, it... <laughs> the cheapest Airbus, the A318, uh, an airplane, 75 million. So for only like 30 million more, you can have a full-size airplane. But like, you can't capture good footage like this with an airplane. <laughs> It's got to be a blimp. <laughs> hmm. Okay, we might have to... It, w- it might not be a petition to send to Jamil. It might be a GoFundMe for blimps. Let's get Air Vipa a blimp. The Dona 400 might be the most American thing ever. <laughs> there it is. I'm going to start my own race next week. And it's going to go from Black Canyon City to Flagstaff, and I'm going to call it the Dona 400. <laughs> we got to get NASCAR esque sponsors. So we're looking at like Big Newton. We're looking at Wonder Bread. Wonder Bread. Some what sort else? of one of the beers. One of the beers. Probably get Molson. No. Well, Isn't if we Molson could just Canadian? get Goodyear on board, we could probably use one of their blimps. Goodyear. Right? That's true. We could maybe rent a blimp. <laughs> I'm I'm really glad that we have a call to action right now. Can you please donate to this live stream if not for anything but the blimp? <laughs> Help us get closer to our blimp goal. We'll put up a little like, you know, one of the little meter things to see how close we are to the blimp goal except it'll never actually move. <laughs> It's like we are we're seven dollars of forty million towards an air viper blimp. <laughs> Man, that would be so good. <laughs> oh, Chris has already pitched the blimp. Dona, uh, Dona four hundred by Marlboro Red. Ooh, yeah, that's a good sponsor. Yeah, what are some like classic sponsors? <laughs> Like camel. Camel. I'll say this. If if we change the name of the race to the Dona 400, <laughs> we would have to get a DuPont sponsorship. And oh, yeah. We would have to have some sort of uh, <laughs> retro Rainbow Warrior uh, Jeff Gordon knockoff T-shirts at a bare minimum. 100%. Well, you start talking to these brands, and they're just convinced that you're already a NASCAR race. No explanation necessary. They just sponsor you just by default based on the name. <laughs> yeah, we got a new event in Arizona called the Dona 400. <laughs> you know. Well, you got to say it with, like, a little more southern twang to it, you know? like. I'm sure I'll have it down by the end of the week. We got a new race here in Arizona, the Dona 400. <laughs> Kicks off on May the 1st. <laughs> the praise, <laughs> praise Dale Earnhardt. Clinton Green, 199 for the blimp. For the blimp. For the Let's down, go. For the down of 400. Let's go. 
Dona Full Hondo, sponsored by Copper Town. <laughs> oh my gosh, here it comes. Versteeg's Shadow has contributed one ninety nine for the blimp. Oh my gosh. Kaylin has contributed fifteen dollars for the blimp. All right. I'm putting out a call to action on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I can I cannot believe we're actually going to get this blimp funded. I'm going to text Jamil right now and let him know we're crowdsourcing a blimp. And anyone who donates obviously is going to get rides in the blimp. Well, I mean, well, I mean the real question is is Finn going to go to prison for fraud? <laughs> 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 that's the real that's the hard-hitting question here. <laughs> The blimp. Float a blimp. Oh, ten more, Mike. Let's go. For the blimp fun. To see the immediate outpouring of support for such a pivotal investment in Air Viper running. Well, I mean, for something that I hope everyone knows is not going to come to fruition. <laughs> Just not so with that, that attitude. We're not liable. <laughs> you know, I'm not a... Uh, we got people you know, we're almost there. let's go blimp <laughs> Rachel's contributed 10 10 bones towards the blimp uh yeah this is down a full hunt it I love it I can't believe it can't believe it's actually happening we're only 39 million people are gonna remember where they are the day that we started fundraising for the blimp don't worry, I have t I've texted Jamil, so whenever he gets back into service <laughs> and sees this, he's probably going to fire us immediately. You have to stand up for what you believe in. Yeah, okay, so between now and the end of the race, maybe we'll at least get a graphic of a blimp. <laughs> like, just floating across the drone shot, like clearly a cartoon. We're like, guys, we did it. Um, do we have eyes? Is that Michael Versteeg? Uh, yes, I know that stride. That yeah, is that's a Versteeg that's stride. That's a Versteeg stride. Blimp shoes. Yeah, disclaimer. The, the blimp is for entertainment purposes only. We will not make any money. Never underestimate the, the optimism and the vision of this chat. There's some dreamers out there, and we appreciate you yeah. guys. Look at that. Oh, Ten bucks for the blimp again. For the blimp fund. Um, well, this actually kind of does go back to one of my uh, one of my prior ideas where I thought the live chat over the course of the race could help fund the uh, prize purse um, in terms like a like real time prize purse. Matt's got immediately something to say. <laughs> Can we just say that we didn't come up with this idea? <laughs> Huh? Sound running already did that. Well, last no, year. but be, they would do it. You could do it before the race. You could buy your ticket and then contribute to the prize. But I'm saying you could do it in real time. Like if one of your favorite runners all of a sudden moves into the lead, you could like, oh, I want to support that runner. Like I want to support Killian, uh, and I'm gonna now start pushing money into the prize purse. So then, like over the course of the race, you could be like, Michael Versteeg, it's at eight hundred dollars for the win. You know, 30 miles later, you're like, oh, my gosh, it's at $2,000 for the win. And, like, <laughs> I feel like we're, we're, we're growing the sport that way. It would, it's it's Love fun. Love the idea. Yeah. I was just trying to, you know, give credit to the to the rifle. Oh, no, that's that's where the idea stemmed from was sound running. But I was thinking, like, like Javelina or Black Canyon would be a fun time to, uh, to pilot it <laughs> just because we could talk about it during the thing. And we could have, like, a little, like, prize purse ticker going for, like, the top three. I love in it. Each one. I think it would be really fun. For it. all you viewers out there, if this live stream has meant anything to you, if you could find it in your heart of hearts to help us get one step closer to this blimp, it would you mean sound everything. Like Sarah McLaughlin in a Save the Dogs <laughs> commercial. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. 
Rebecca believes in a brighter future of media coverage in this sport. Yeah, that's actually a great question because now that we've like pretty much gone fully in on the blimp, we're like, so would the prize money be dropped from the blimp fund? Because Clinton, you know, it's like, whoa, okay, we got nine ninety nine for the prize person, then ten more for the blimp. So, Matt, I think the Coca Dona prize purse is up to nine dollars ninety nine cents actually right now. Fortunately, with a with a with an ending in ninety nine, we can split that into you know thirds pretty pretty well. Um, but yeah, it's a question like, would you rather fund the prize purse or rather fund the blimp? Um, <coughs> you know, that's that's the biggest question. Where were you when they got the blimp for Coca Dona? Just just make that up. It was just like a little. <laughs> little Thin jingle. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's resume to focusing on uh, body language <laughs> of uh, Michael Versteeg right now. We, previously, he was jogging actually pretty well, and now is in, in, in a hike. I mean, it looks like he's moving really well. Um, yeah, 100% agree with what Julian said. Birds aren't real. Blimps are. If anyone is naysayer on the birds, you just go to birdsaren'treal.com. Lots of documentation on why <laughs> all the birds are fake. <laughs> I get it. It makes sense to me. So, yeah, but blimps, 100% real. Yeah, Jamil, Jamil Curry is going to be signing the deed on a blimp pretty soon. Pretty soon. Um, I don't know if we have an official count on drops yet. I mean, there's a few from the... Um, from the race tracker, but I don't know if those are official and I would hate to like clarify someone a DNF when in fact their tracker had m missed something. So I'm not, maybe, maybe like, uh, maybe when we hop on tomorrow, we'll be able to do like a, a drop. Yeah. How many drops the names, you know, again, going back to the hunger games, the cannons. Yes. Um, you know, for, for each day as we <coughs> head into day two. What is happening on the screen right now, actually? Sorry, we got getting distracted. Is Versteeg just taking a sit in the shade? He's take yeah. Is that what it is? A little siesta. Is he taking a dirt nap? Is this is da -da -da, da -da -da, <laughs> is this the first dirt nap of the race? Is there a minimum donation to get a ride in the blimp? I think if you donate anything, you're pretty much guaranteed a ride in the blimp. All right. Here's the Everyone's thing. We're already it. on this ride. Yeah, it's true. We are. Wow. Thank you, Training for Ultra. Thank you, dads that run. What we're seeing here from Michael Versteeg is awesome yeah so i think this is like this is like at least the first um caught on camera dirt nap of of the race i mean it's strategically makes sense because it's you know it's a nice shaded spot getting my dona for hano blimp costume for the jackass run Oh, that's so good. Yeah. How many blimps are we going to see at Javelina this year? Finn, are you going to run Javelina as a blimp? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Thank you, Tamara. I'm being told the, from our drone pilot here, Versteeg taking a full-on break right now. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Looks like he's oh, standing he's up, up again. He's up. Yep. He's popped up. Just a couple he's minutes. That's all he needed. Yeah. I mean, he's experienced. I, if if I just happen to be in the race right next to him and he stops and lies down, you know, I'm lying down too. Yeah. Of course. Like. Yep. Thank you, Wyatt. Your blimp ticket has been secured. <laughs> da 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 da.
Well, I think you could re work remotely from a blimp. I mean, I assume we would have room for a Starlink um, in the blimp, so probably would get like good satellite internet. Uh, yes. Adam has donated two dollars <laughs> towards jars of mayo and pea cups, which. For those who are turning in, um, maybe about a half an hour ago, we were talking about if you were to do Coca Dona and you could only eat one food over the course of the entire race, what would it be? And if you could only drink one fluid over the course of the entire race, what would it be? And Adam was all for jars of mayo and pea cups. <laughs> Kevin asks, what are we naming this blimp? Blimp Adona 250. <laughs> The 401k blimp all the way. Actually, yeah, I, I'm i all for the 40. I feel like right now in real time, this is like a metaphor slash real for the 401k blimp. Like yes. Everyone is putting in for the 401k blimp, and that's like two things about one thing. <laughs> <laughs> we have an update from Chris. Yeah, so fun fact, actually, uh, the Goodyear blimp has flown directly over across the years at uh, multiple times, like really? right over the top. Wow. Granted, the national championship for college football was going on right across the highway. We're counting the, it. Yeah. We're counting it. Well, oh, we, we claimed it. <laughs> yeah. We claimed it. We, I was taking pictures saying, hey, look, the Goodyear blimp is overhead for across the years. They must be coming to film us or something. But, yeah, that's a fun little fact that some years, whenever the uh, – National championship is uh, played in Glendale at, uh, what is that, State Farm Stadium now? Yeah, the Goodyear blimp will go overhead during cross years. That's, That's awesome. awesome. That's so cool. So so there's, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> like, like one in a hundred? Mm, more like one in a million. So you're, <laughs> you're saying, saying there's, there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> another great dumb and dumber quote according to the map we've only gone four inches <laughs> the rock for the john denver is full of shit man <laughs> oh man i feel so bad for the person that walks a fifth of the country in the wrong direction at cocodona fortunately in the runner guide it does say that everyone has to have the gpx file <laughs> uploaded on a device that they will have on them the entire time there are um the runner guide to this race is incredible, and any race directors out there wondering like what they should do for their runner guide should just, you know, probably use a similar format to this Coca Dona 250 uh, runner guide because it answers pretty much every question that one might have about about this race and what they might come across, the details, the aid stations, the cutoffs. It's amazing. Um, what we were talking about earlier was the uh, the menu, so. Uh, as these uh, leaders are making their way to the Arastra Creek aid station, the special on the menu there was uh, turkey and cheese roll-ups, hummus and avocado roll-ups, potato soup, and spring rolls. The previous aid station had pulled pork and black bean burgers, Ooh, potato nice. salad, pasta salad, potato soup, and then spring energy smoothies. Yeah. So good. I, yeah, there's – yeah, looking at these aid stations, there's some – yeah, there's some amazing food that's getting cooked. I mean, how fun would it be for all the aid stations to essentially just get in a competition with one another to have the best food at the aid stations? Like, oh, that'd be good. That would like, it's just an another donation. From Thank you. Training for ultra. This is massive. Why are uh, you heading to the blimp? Flying somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I saw your air ticket and your luggage, <laughs> I put two and two together. <laughs> Oh my gosh! <clears throat> yeah, we have food truck aid stations. That would be incredible at some point. Um, we were saying if uh, this whole race just became like an Iron Chef competition between all the aid stations, and then it just became a 250 mile food tour, how amazing would that be? Oh, it'd be so good. Did you read off the uh, mile 100 aid station food list? The satisfy one. No, I that will, one's though. Wild. So at mile 100, 
Satisfy is the sponsor for Fane Ranch. They got grits, bacon, fries, eggs. They got tacos, spaghetti, and meatballs. Um, and I believe like that's all going to be like pretty professionally made. Uh, that's people are in for a treat at mile ninety seven point five. Look at Luke in the chat. <laughs> Blow over. <laughs> no, it's a cardigan. But thanks for <laughs> Blimp fun to track Killian. That's true. If we had a blimp, we would not run out of range. Because you could have a Starlink on the blimp. And then you wouldn't run out of range. Matt's giving me the craziest looks right now. But it's not wrong. I don't know that it's wrong, but I also don't. Wouldn't the Starlink then have to connect to multiple satellites as it moves? Well, I mean, the blimp's not going that fast. Yeah. So like, and it, there's like, it's open above. I mean, it, I so guess like if you can work. have Wi-Fi on domestic airlines, you can have Wi-Fi or like satellite connectivity on a blimp. Right? Yeah, absolutely, hundred you know? percent. While we have a little minute here as our drone lands, we're going to actually take a look at a commercial from one of our incredible sponsors, Gnarly Nutrition. Enjoy. We created Gnarly Fuel 2.0 for endurance athletes or people that spend long days out in the hills. It has both sucrose and dextrose, easy to digest carbohydrates in it. 25 grams or 100 calories per 12 ounces has a full range of electrolytes, 250 milligrams of sodium, and then also chloride, potassium, magnesium, calcium. One of the things that kind of distinguishes us from other fuel products is that we have HMB, the metabolite of the branch chain amino acid leucine, which helps you recover while you're running. So it's an all-in-one fuel, electrolytes to replenish, and HMB to recover. Looks like we've got Andrew Glaze here. Andrew Glaze is at the uh, Crown King Aid Station. Yep, Crown King. Rocking the classic jorts. I wonder if those are the exact same pair that he wore at Canyons. I hope you had time to wash them. Yeah, so we're looking at Andrew Glaze at the uh, Crown King aid station. He recently, and I mean very recently, we're talking last Friday, a few days ago, ran the Canyons 100 mile. That was over in Auburn, California, and then he hopped on a plane after he finished, barely made it to the start of the Coca Dona 250, and just like keeping it going washed washed the shorts in the hotel sink you know sometimes the best washing basins ever have been hotel sinks so I'm sure they're clean uh, question in the chat how late will the stream be going today uh, we are hoping to bring the runners into Whiskey Row in downtown Prescott, which we hope is around 11-ish p.m. So we'll try to go until then, um, give or take, just depending on where runners are at. And then we will kind of close down the stream, and we will start again in the morning at 6 a.m. Yep, and then we'll be here. Finn and I will be here uh, noon to 6 every day this week. It's a pleasure as always. Oh, this is so fun. So fun. I mean, yeah, had had no expectations going in, and I just can't believe that Airvibe is getting a blimp. <laughs> oh, I just can't believe it. 
Can you imagine if like Jamil used the blimp to like drop everyone's drop bags at aid stations? Like it just goes over Crown King and just like and just rains down drop bags. Amazing. Like, amazing. This is like and then just to go, you know, on top of all the coverage, um, I really yeah, I mean, I really feel I mean, I'm gonna pitch this to Jamil. I feel like the blimp could probably pay for itself in like six, seven decades <laughs> so would this be the leadville zeppelin the leadville zeppelin oh my gosh chris with potentially the best name i think as of right now it was the uh the 401k because people were like donating and contributing to it it was like a couple things about one thing but the leadville zeppelin's pretty good and you know someone brought up lazarus lake here in the chat and obviously barkley is popular in part because a lot of what they do in terms of setting up the race stands in such stark contrast to other races out there. And this is an excellent opportunity for uh, a uh, Aero Viper running to zig while the rest of the industry is zagging. Blimp thrills it starts hospital with the blimp. bills. Dude, that's, I think that's Jamil's, uh, the name of Jamil's next album. I think he's working on Blimp Thrills and Hospital Bills featuring Post Malone. Um, I know a lot of people were asking uh, for Chad Wright updates, and I just I, I, I'm going to give out like his his tracker has him having left the aid station, and he's at I think about 39 miles now, um, as per the last tracker. He's a tough guy, and I think we were, we we expected this of him. He's he might have dark moments early on, but he talked about his staying power, his resolve, and how he in, he welcomes these experiences in these ultra running endeavors and just as a quick heads up i'm going to be stepping out of the studio for the next couple of hours i will be back to uh continue producing and commentating and helping do all this stuff at about 6 30 so chris warden will be taking over the uh the production here so shout out to uh chris his very first time producing the show so uh Let's make sure we're we're extra nice to him in the chat. <laughs> yeah, Chris. Oh, it's that's the right. Doing it with, any, with nobody else on site that knows more than me. Yeah. I've done it while Matt's in like his office sleeping. Emmanuel in the chat, I think, actually has the answer for the blimp. It's called the Air of Ipa. Oh. That's. Hmm. See ya. That so far, I think the air of IPA, you know, really makes the most sense, um, especially because if you put the Coca Dona naming on it, you, then you you really can only use it for one race. Um, one thing that I'm noticing just watching this aid station cam, the winds are picking up. That uh, pop up tent's about to fly away, and. You know, I guess to an extent, as the temperatures are still somewhat warm, a little bit of breeze would be very nice, but there's definitely a certain temperature threshold where a little bit of breeze is no no more nice. It's not fun anymore. Crown King does get pretty cold at night. Yeah. I mean, uh, even if it's you know, How nice cold and warm. I mean, like, a probably month, go a month to the ago, 40s. It's getting down into the mid 20s wow. yeah. uh, at night. I mean, it'll probably be in the 40s tonight there. Yeah, it's going to be a, a chill. So hopefully the the runners that have not made their way yet uh, up to Crown King are, are geared enough that uh, that once the sun goes down, the temperature will drop precipitously. OK. Yeah, Blimp Biscuit's amazing. Matt blimp, seems anti-blimp, maybe, but Matt is such an open-minded guy. He's willing to see both sides of the coin, and I think if we just continue to lobby this issue over the course of the week, you may see changes of heart. Yeah, I mean, we we have an entire week to fund this blimp, so I'm not too worried about it. <laughs> we have lobbyists that are ready to go, too. Yeah, totally. Have you written or called your local congressman? <laughs> to get approval for the Air of Ipa blimp. <laughs> I'm not actually sure if that, how that works. I, that's just what I hear. But, you know, Finn, you have a little bit more actual experience in the <laughs> politics world than I do. Is that how you get a blimp? 
We need somebody on the appropriations committee at Aravipa. That's how we're going to get this thing through. And right, the ways and right. means. I feel like we should probably be reaching out to Eric Sensman. There's really only one person on the Aravipa appropriations committee. Let's uh... <laughs> Jamil. Jamil's going to get this blimp. <clears throat> and you know somebody's going to ask him about this on course. He's just going <laughs> to be like, yeah, it's good. Yeah, word, the blimp. Word, word is uh, gonna make its way to the course, and like people out there are gonna be talking like, "What is this that we're hearing about a blimp? How do we get a submarine into the mix?" Well, I don't. Kevin, Lara, Kevin, four twenty for the blimp. I always knew Kevin would be pro blimp. Yeah, he's for the cause. He wants that blimp to fly high. Does the leaderboard stay going after the live stream is down? That's it does, right? Yeah. 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 Let's see. Who do we have eyes on right now? We're not still following Versteeg, are we? Are we? I think we are, but we're Is that, losing the Selena pivot back. Yeah, we're going to pivot back to the Crown King aid station uh, static cam. See what's going on. You know, there's still definitely a lot of people that are going to be making their way through this aid station. There's a lot of drop eggs in line that haven't been touched yet. For those of you in the chat, does watching this race make you want to do Cocodona more? Does it make you want to do Cocodona less? And why? This race makes me wants to want, want to watch Cocodona more. Me too. Like, watching this live stream, I want to be a fan of the sport more. Me too. Um, like, it has me thinking about, like, running it a little bit, but I have enjoyed... I mean, I, I'm enjoying this community so much. I feel like there's like two different families right now. There's the family that's helping all the runners out on course. And then there's this other family that's helping the entirety of the sport. And I know that now that sounds like biased, like I'm favoring this family, but um, I am a little bit. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And um, like we need both. We need both. There used to only always ever be the family out on the race course of all the volunteers, the runners, the crew. But now we have this whole other group of trail running fans that are going to help grow the sport. Yep. And so much of it is happening because of because of this live stream. Like this is incredible. I know we've been talking a lot about Chad Wright. Are there any other runners in this race that you're like now truly bought into their storyline and their journey and you're you know excited to check in on tomorrow? I I'm so curious. Like I want to know how Sarah Ostazewski is doing cuz this is her third Cocodona and is in the lead, looked incredible through the Crown King aid station. Um they've switched things up a like, she had so much going on year one, simplified it more in year two. Yep. Why well, I, I just want to know how year three is different uh, for her and her crew and pacers uh, from the previous years. So I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm definitely in, invested in Sarah Osuzuki's uh, journey now after having listened to, you know, a couple of her pre-race interviews. Uh, yeah, Chad Wright was definitely the other one just because his approach to this race was... Uh, a little bit unorthodox. Uh, you know, he said he just always is in shape, but trained for this race for the last eight weeks. Yeah. Just eight weeks of like a 100% all-in training block. Um, whereas a lot of people have been, you know, training for this race, like more or less for years. Yes. What is the right answer? We have no idea. We have no idea. A couple that stick out for me. K money. I want to know how long he's going to be on the McDonald's hamburger 
nutrition strategy. Um, I love Don Greenwald. I have always have a soft spot for these older athletes that are still crushing it. Don is 45 and she's really close behind um, Sarah yeah. at the front of the race. And then Michael Greer. I think Michael Greer is a really cool athlete too. His, his approach to training this race has been yeah. fascinating. Just 24 years old. Well, Dawn did finish ahead of Sarah two yeah. years ago. Oh, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. she's, and, and she's kept it up. Uh, she's been a regular at uh, a lot of local ultras and placed very well. So uh, one of the things when we were doing the bib setups was that uh, I was – I lobbied to make sure that she had the lowest number bib amongst all the women, even though I didn't pick her to win. I felt like that was kind of a, a testament to what she had accomplished here at this race. That's cool. Yeah, a couple of people into like, tell us more about K Money. And we've called him K Money for so long now. I've actually I've forgotten his actual name, so I can't look him up. So I'm going to crowdsource that because it doesn't say K Money on his ultra sign up. But, um, he just came into the Crown King aid station, phenomenal energy, uh, was downing a, a Bud Light, a tall boy, and um, his crew, his crew had so much stuff spread out across the picnic, they had an entire tackle box just full of different types of tapes and various, I don't know, like ointments and stuff, but there was a, a hairbrush, he had five mcdonald's hamburgers that he just stuffed into his pack and i think in his bio he said for the race he was planning to fuel most of the race off of mcdonald's hamburgers yeah so kevin metz kevin metz kevin Kevin metz Metz is k money and that's k it's actually uh yet to correct who who we had pinned the comment earlier uh it's it's k m-o-n-e-y not k dollar sign right not K dollar sign, K M. No, it's not like Ty dollar sign. And he's had it since middle school. Yeah, it's K money, like K M O N E Y. I it, don't know where to capitalize the letters there. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you have to spell out money for K money. And just to add on to what Brett was saying about K money, found the sport 10 years ago through an I run far Twitter feed about the Hovelina 100. So shout out to all the media and the sport raising awareness. And he just. Since that day, according to the message he put here in the questionnaire, he's just been manifesting the chance to get involved in the sport, to move out west. And he's here at Cocodona in celebration of all that, which I think is just so cool. And I mentioned this earlier. He's done a double, a Black Canyon double in 2022, which involves running the 100K on Saturday and the 60K on Sunday, which, again, just adds to the lore of all these runners that are doing these wild, impressive things in training and in racing so different from your standard athlete in the sport. Um, and Brett, he, he was a, he was cast to be a minute to win it with Guy Fieri. Yeah. That's the best thing. That's that yeah. <laughs> I want to know so much more about that. Uh, cause like, I mean, does anyone recall if Guy Fieri was the host of minute to win it or was he like the guest with K money on the show minute to win it? Yeah. So more any questions? I mean, the theme of this uh, whole broadcast for me was I had a feeling that I would end this broadcast with more questions than answers. And so far, I've, I've added a few more questions. So this is interesting. I just pulled up K Money's questionnaire. He says, need more content? Question mark. Talk to my amazing crew and pacers during the run. They're all incredible people. Happy to chat. So maybe okay. later in the week we can. Yeah, we'll try our best to get a call in link for uh, K Money's crew then. Oh, yeah, about the, the blimp yeah, I texted him. I texted Jamil, let him know that uh, we were crowdfunding a blimp for Air Vipa. Oh, was that Jamil? Yeah, that was Jamil right there. We have a Jamil siding at Crown King. I wonder if he ran all the way up here from the start. Uh, I'll throw a link to the live tracking in the chat right now. The link to the live tracking is actually right below the 
the video itself uh, in oh, the description. Right. So. Uh, if you're looking for uh, specific runners, um, and for those that are asking, you know, we do our best to cover as many people as possible. But uh, right now, uh, we've got literally one or two cameras on course, and uh, runners are spread out over what uh, about a 22 to 24 mile spread between the start to fit or the yep. t front to back. So, yeah, and that that distance is only going to grow from here. So oh yeah, there we'll be we'll be all over the place. Um, we'll be getting loopy in the next few days. Yeah, and we'll, and we'll do our best, and and uh, we we try and do our makeup for that the last day or so of the the race where it's dedicated to those who are still on the course. Yes, I thought you were talking about actual makeup, like for your face. Well, no amount of makeup is going to make me look good for the camera. So <laughs> by day six, oof. so Rebecca is asking for a Jeff Garmeyer update, and uh, we're going to give it to you. It, on the cocodona.com live page, you can just type in his name. He appears to be at mile 31.6. He is bib number five. So he is about six miles away, maybe six, five and a half miles away from that, this Crown King aid. That feels wrong. It does. Like that, do, that doesn't feel accurate, like my gut. Um, but it, Ingrid is saying it looks like he is in Crown King, but no costume. Interesting. Yeah, we'll have to. Uh, so the tracker is not totally reliable at this point. I did hear some rumblings earlier at some point that maybe there was an issue with Jeff Jeff's tracker initially. Um, there was a rumor that he had been issued the wrong one, um, but we shall see. Are people are people seeing Jeff in the Crown King aid station right now? Huh. Yep, the tracker does now say 37.1, so he is in Crown King. There we go, there's our Jeff update. Just to give a quick rundown of the top five or six athletes in this race right now, Killian Korth is in first, about 53 miles into the race. Versteeg about a mile behind him. Sarah, about two miles behind Versteeg, 50.6 miles in. Mike Gronwagen, 49.6 miles in. Micah Thews, 48.8 miles in, so about two miles behind Sarah. And Don Greenwald is right there with Micah. Hey, we got some movement on the Crown King mobile cam uh, for the aid station. That's a Jeff sighting, I think. That has to be Jeff. That's right Jeff. <laughs> Even without seeing his head. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Just in time, our uh, Crown King aid station mobile camera. Oh, we got some tiger pants. That's yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, we're moving. We're moving through the aid station now. This is fun. This is this has been one of my favorite parts of the day is uh, this mobile cam through the aid station, just seeing what every person is doing. Uh, slightly different approach. Um, we were definitely starting to spot some trends. The biggest one that I don't know. I guess we just thought was surprising. Maybe it was just our, us being naive was the amount of time that you know even those at the very front of the race were spending in the aid station, like really making sure that they got in all the proper food, the proper liquids, packing the pack with all the right gear, food, hydration. Um, no no guesswork, really. They no took guesswork. all the guesswork out of it. Very much akin to a supported long trail through hike where you'll see at road crossings, runners like Jen Farr Davis, like Carl Meltzer, like Scott Jurek, stopping, maybe spending time with their crew for 15 to 20 minutes and moving onward and just being more efficient that way with the rest of their run or hike. Yep. Yep, definitely. Um, yeah, I guess like, you know, one thing we are, we're start, we're start, we're seeing a few more, you know, people getting their lights and stuff ready as, as we start counting or start counting down towards the first night of the yes. race. It'll be very interesting to see what, what shakes down in the evening i think there's a lot of a lot of chatter about the dark mcknight making his moves 
when when the sun goes down. Who I think we missed eyes on when he came through a while back. I still have not yet to see a camera on him yet. I may yeah, have but him. he's he's past the aid station. He's, past. He's, he's gone. According to the tracker, he's 46 miles in. Yeah. Okay. So Killian Korth <laughs> is at mile 51, according to the tracker. Andrew Glaze, according to, you know, No Name is Asking, I think Andrew Glaze must have just left the aid station because the tracker has him about a half mile past Crown King. I I don't know if anyone has DNF'd yet. I haven't been able to say officially. I mean, the live tracking shows a few DNFs if you scroll all the way to the bottom, but um, I don't have any way of like officially differentiating whether it's an official DNF or something wrong with the tracker, and I would hate to incorrectly publicly state someone dropped out uh, before they actually did. But there's 213 runners that started the race. Might have been West. There was a West. <coughs> West. Uh, what was the bib number? 43? 43. I can tell you a sec. We're looking at bib number 24 right now. Bib 43 would have been Kevin Coughlin. What about 42? 42. It looks like a, well, according to the tracker, 42 is a DNF, John Thompson. Oh, okay, well, then I've, I've totally have no idea what bib number I was looking at. That's, uh... Still getting some blimp love. That's great. Dude, yes. 24 is Matt Moore from Tulsa, Oklahoma. So we were just looking at Matt Moore from Tulsa, Oklahoma. We got eyes on uh, Jeff Garmeyer right now. Who's rocking a Coca Dona long sleeve, I believe? By the way, random, but I think I used to work with Ziomara. Ziomara, thank you so much for the donation. That's awesome. Thank you for getting the blimp off the ground. So exciting. I've never been in a blimp before. I didn't I didn't realize it was on my bucket list until today. So So Jeff Garmeyer's in the aid station right now. Um Jeff Garmeyer and I have a bet that I'll get his name tattooed on my lower back if he wins. Wow. Okay. But what if he doesn't win? Does he have to get your name tattooed on his lower back? Because that would be the ultimate show of confidence right there. So that's awesome. Dylan Harris, by the way, made that film. Yeah. Dylan Harris is the, is the maker of that Eric Sensman film from last year that we're calling – we're putting on our Mount Rushmore Volt running films. I yeah, it's really moved up. Yeah. Um Oh, that's it. Okay. What what's on your Mount Rushmore of ultra running film? Oh my gosh. Like, this is a great Well, first of all, let's let's ask this to the group. Like, yeah. So, Brett had a great question. What is on your Mount Rushmore of best ultra running films of all time? So, your top 3 to 4. Yeah. Mine. Yeah, it's like, how many are on? Like, is there, you have to put four on your Mount Rushmore? Can it just be three? I mean, I don't know. I think I think the Billy Yang Shamani video from 2015 has to belong on there for me. That's one of my favorites. The U, U, UTMB by Billy Yang is one of my absolute favorites. Um, Unbreakable is one of my favorites. Unbreakable for sure. Ginger Runner's Barkley film with Gary Robbins yep. was incredible. Yep. But the other one that I feel like does not get enough love that is uh, is one of my favorites is uh, The Long Haul, which is uh, Hal Kerner's uh, FKT on the John Muir Trail with uh, Mike Foote. <laughs> Yes, and actually, J.B. Benna made that film. Yeah, it's the same same as um, Unbreakable. Um, but if if anyone wants to see, essentially, what I think could be created every year at Cocodona, go watch the Long Haul because 
it was a three day FKT documentary between, you know, Hal and Mike. Yep. Just absolutely trashing themselves trying to get this FKT and yep. is insane. And I feel like that same story exists every year at Cocodona. Yes. Brett, I think that long haul one's a good deep cut reference. Long haul's great. Although got 136,000 views, so I guess it did get some love. But I mean, it hasn't even but been Unbreakable up that long. got one, yeah, only three years. Yeah, Unbreakable has two million. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, no, Un- Unbreakable's got some views. I will actually, I'll give a shout out to another one. It's not quite on my Mount Rushmore, but there is a film by Pilot Field called Racing Arizona, which documents Joe McConaughey's FKT, supported FKT on the on the Arizona Trail, I believe last year or the year before. And the cinematography in it's really great. Pilot has done a lot of great stuff around uh, Joe's other FKTs, like the PCT and a little bit on the AT as well. It's good. So, yeah. Yeah, you know what's going to go in everyone's Mount Rushmore's of ultra-running films is our our what is it a documentary of our of our trip to up to flag oh yeah stay tuned brett's making a good one yep i'm i'm making a movie and it's just going to be of all the behind the scenes of all this coverage and just our trip over the course of the whole week Oh, found on forty nine. Founding on forty nine is a so great. Good. One. We're gonna need a second rush more. Yeah, you're right. We gotta we gotta blast out a second rush more. The <laughs> other one, like we're getting like really short, but just Jamil's footage that he got of Hayden Hawks and Zach Miller duking it out at the North Face fifty mile that one year. Yeah. That's one of my favorite running films, even though it's like five minutes long. Yep. Oh uh, yeah, found on forty nine is a really good one too. Who are we looking Ooh, at on here? The edge. Also, I think some of the best camera work of all time is Jamil following Jim Walmsley into the Grand Canyon. That one's really fun. On that descent, well, that's an insane. Some of the best camera work of all time is most things Jamil has done um, because he followed Jim on one of the Western States training camp runs Yep. a while, and that was incredible. There was a year at Western States where I think Jamil logged like 50 miles yep. of running. Yep. Yeah, someone earlier in the chat said uh, the Scott Jurek success failure AT thing. I believe Ryan Dozer made that from his channel. He's a great videographer. Ooh, TJ's favorite, uh, To Build a Blimp, the Cocodona story. <laughs> you got to highlight that one. That's that so good. That one was incredible. Um, yeah, the, the greatest part about building a blimp, the Cocodona story, is that it's happening in real time right now and we're technically filming it all because of the live stream <laughs> oh, <it's> so good <laughs> coming to blu-ray near you <laughs> coming to a blockbuster near you yeah, yeah the gathering is good too billy has so many good ones one thing that we're learning is that there's actually a good amount of uh ultra running films out there that we can go watch Forrest Gump. That's actually 100% agree with that as well. That's one of my favorite running films of all time. And t- probably an ultra running film. Yeah. I mean, Forrest Gump w- originally held the FKT on uh, Transamerica. <laughs> That's and right. Back. And That's back. right. He was the triple yo yo of Transamerica, I believe. <laughs> what's your, if you had to pick a number one, like gun to your head, what's your number one? For me, it's unbreakable. I'm going Unbreakable number one. It's it's that or Billy's Chamonix video, and I have to go Unbreakable. Yeah, yeah I gosh. You, mm. no, I'm, I'm thinking like way too hard about this now. <laughs> um, UTM, the U, Billy's UTMB video is one of the first ones that got me like supremely jacked to try and run ultras and like train hard for them. Yep. So I guess a lot of it comes down to like, where were you in your uh, running story when you saw some of these films? So like that answer is going to be different for yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I mean, it helped that like David and I were living together for a while when he was training for UTMB that year. So that was kind of cool to That's see. That's awesome. 
one hand on like one hand this and then on the other hand that movie you know a lot of the characters in these in these movies well did you feel like they got hal kerner pretty correct for in terms of character development and unbreakable yes yeah like it's one of those films where you finish it and you have more questions than answers yeah um yeah and that's that's how i would describe hal but i guess the whole reason why we started this conversation was that uh the Cocodona film with Eric Sensman last year so good. like is incredible. So and every good. I mean, I assume everyone in the chat here has already watched it, but if you haven't, you absolutely should. Because it's inc- it's such a fun one. Chris, what's your top three? Um, I I think that my top three are uh well Life in a Day is is amazing. Um uh, Found on Forty Nine is another one that I you know, I, I think that there's a mystique to Western states that makes me, you know, so much a fan of that race. Uh, and uh, I actually in- enjoyed Inaugural Year, the first Cocodona film that we did, seeing and following, you know, Gar Meyer, uh, Pete Mortimer, and, uh, you know, uh, and Versteeg. I mean, and Versteeg's uh, sound bites in that film are just absolutely hilarious. You know, I mean, he... He throws a little bit of unnecessary shade and side swipes, and he also just is is so genuine. Yep. And uh, one of the quotes in that movie is that Jamil says is that he lives his life so authentically. So, you know that uh, that really resonates with me. And I, I you know, seeing those uh, those runners, Maggie and everybody along the way in that film, really takes me back to covering that race. And uh, you know, with that being the first Coco Dona, it was really. Uh, it hit me emotionally when we watched it because we watched it as a group at Aravipa headquarters. Mm. Like all the staff, like came into the common area and and we had a great time. So that w- those would probably be my three. But then again, you know, ask me again in six hours, and I might have two more that bump something else off the list. That's the great thing about being in this space is that um, uh, you know we get to see so much great quality material. Uh, heck, the the Billy Yang proposal video this year was oh, so... that one destroyed me. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's 10 minutes of just pure love and you know, you can't beat that. So there's a little bit of everything that, uh, you know, that these great filmmakers in this space provide us with. So I um, totally forgot about, uh, Ricky Gates's trans Americana or trans Americana. That one was so good. Uh, as well as his every single street, in San Francisco. Yeah, um, that that movie that he made, his his project was incredible. I mean, I'm going to go ahead and say, because Brett, you and I were talking earlier today about how some of our favorite content on YouTube is the most informal stuff. There have been a few Jamil Curry vlogs that I've gotten super inspired by, and that helped me go deeper down the rabbit hole of our sport as well. Yeah, we were talking about this uh, kind of last time we were here during the uh, Black Canyon live stream about how Jamil and Skyler we're doing these kind of like funny video challenges Yeah. years before yeah. it like was actually cool. And I feel like if mountain outhouse was going right now, it would have a thousand times the viewers that it oh, yeah. currently has. Cause they were doing like the race finished up. We're going to go for a long run. And, um, you know, we have all these abandoned drop bags. The drop let's, bag just, challenge. let's just open up a drop bag and you have to, fuel with all of that stuff from the abandoned drop bag like the drop bag challenge that's incredible like they, that's one of the funniest things you can't even mention that around skyler without him starting to get queasy i right. know yeah that and then when uh um, skyler did the like unicorn frappuccino uh lo- like long run or whatever we went to like four different starbucks and had to <laughs> down a unicorn <laughs> frap at each one like yeah those things so funny yeah, Alyssa has a good point. I really see an opportunity to get more female visibility in the ultra film space. I agree. I think there's so many amazing stories to be told still. And what was the Western States film that came out? Life with in it? a Day. Life in a Day with Devin and Casey and Anna Anime May. Flynn. Yeah. yeah, that one was really, really good. I think that was, uh, to date, that was Billy's longest uh, movie that he made. And it was incredible yep let's who do we have here for uh, uh that's a beautiful overhead drone shot right now wow that's really cool stunning that's nat geo level good 
Yeah, they're definitely uh, changing. Like they're they're up in the green part now. <laughs> uh, someone in the chat said that they lived just a few miles out of um, oh what was the, the, the Camp Kippa, and it was pretty windy up there. They said, which you know that that breeze is going to be nice for the for the temps. Um, but you know that oftentimes that leads to like sometimes getting kind of cold, a little bit chilly. Uh, once the sun goes down, so uh, a lot of that will, you know, I think a, lo a, a huge amount of strategy in the, in the night is properly layering up, so that way you don't have to expend a ton of energy to stay warm. Yep. Because, you know, if, if you don't bring the right clothes and then you you have to try harder to generate more body heat, that's taking away from your performance later on in the race. Um, that's one thing, uh, Francois Dane, I is in my opinion, like one of the most dialed uh, kind of mountain racers in regards to his kit and his layers. If you look at like the first or second time he ran UTMB, you know, 10 plus years ago and now, yep. his kit hasn't changed. His layers and what he wears amazing. for the weather, it is, unchanged like it is perfectly dialed he knows everything like it's the back of his hand uh and in races like this where every ounce of energy that you have matters you have you have to be that like the more dialed you can be in that area you know the better the stronger you're going to be on that last day i think matt mousel has a really interesting point here the fact that unbreakable is so good and it's over 10 years old says a lot. Think about the advancements in video footage, yet Unbreakable is still at the top. And kind of Why? like what we were saying, like it, sometimes it's not so much the advancements in video footage that yeah. makes for the great story. It's, you know, J.B. Benna picking the right people leading up to the race, creating the storyline, and then capturing all of the footage on the race day, and then putting it together into a complete story i mean amazing i mean that's i mean that's what so much of it is about and th that's i mean that's so hard to predict in these races i mean every year we i mean we see it i mean shoot we see it in fantasy free trail every week we pick who we think's gonna win the race and we're always wrong yep um and for jb to have picked you know the people that he did and it came out so incredible like amazing yeah you could yeah, you don't need you don't need advanced cameras for that that's a great where are they now question like can we get jb benna out of retirement if he's in retirement to make another film oh man yeah i was like where are they now i mean i like i saw a uh, jen benna his wife jb and jen yeah jen raced at canyons that's awesome uh, yeah, just last weekend. That's awesome. This is a yeah, TJ. That's a good question from TJ. They absolutely has. I mean, Sage Canada the year he ran Western States. Yep. He had a terrible day. Yep. Um, you know, there was a big film crew around Tim Tollison last year at Western States. Going into Western. Yeah, he had a pretty terrible day. Yeah. Uh, there was... I don't know if anything's ever come of it, but there was a huge film crew around Zach Miller one of the years he ran UTMB and did not have a good day. So it definitely happens, and that's tough. That's just a tough thing to wrestle with in this sport. Uh, they uh, did a film on the 2022 Black Canyon 100K fine line, yes. and I believe that one of the the main female stars of that film had an absolutely terrible day. Um, I wish I could remember who it was. I don't. I think it was a, a foreign athlete. I wish I could remember, though. Um, gotcha. But uh, but that's one. And and sometimes those are the more interesting stories. It's not... I mean, we always want to see and celebrate triumph, but sometimes the stories where things go sideways... Yeah, life and, in a day is a good example yeah, of that. Absolutely. Where people learn. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, uh, that's one of those things. I think it might have been Lottie Brinks, actually, that was the focus of oh, okay. uh, Fine Line. But I... Don't I'm not a hundred percent sure. Yeah, so we're just looking at some amazing drone footage of this 
what was this one called? This was the highway. Senator Highway. Senator Highway. Beautiful. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Looks like a Jurassic Park scene. Like would, when it's when it's still positive early on in the movie. I can totally see myself. Uh, I can see myself riding this road on a bicycle. Oh yeah, that would be sick. Chris, is there yeah. any chance we could go back to the Crown King mm -hmm. to maybe see if some of these runners are coming through? Who we got here? Bib, Bib one twenty four. So Bib one twenty four would be. It's Jason Cannon coming into aid. A little bit of uh, background on Jason, if we have some. So this is from our questionnaire. Jason bills himself as a 35-year-old burrito addict. And this is a cool job. He's a rigger and rope access technician for concerts and events. That's a, some of these people just have the coolest jobs. Those people are crazy. I have I've, I had a friend who uh, who was involved in rigging and did event uh, did events around the country. I mean, they're they're pretty well compensated and they have a uh, an exciting slash hectic job. Oh my gosh, it's so cool. A um, couple other things here. So Jason's mom, he notes, was diagnosed with ALS in 2020. And part of his inspiration for running this race is to celebrate movement and pursue these big efforts that his mom isn't able to match anymore. So that's what a great cause. And he loves pizza. So if you see him eating pizza at aid stations, you know why. Oh, yeah. Uh, Steve Joseph mentioned it, it was uh, uh, Lottie Brinks that was the subject of fine line. Um, and, yeah, she had a knee injury. But uh, it was still a, a pretty good film. And uh, and also, I think that part of the reason I, I can enjoy it more is knowing that Lottie has uh, had some pretty good race results in recovering uh, from that in the past, uh, you know, 12 to 14 yep. months. It helps to know that there's a happy postscript sometimes with some of the films where it doesn't show the the greatest day for an athlete shout out to rabbit by the way they that sun shirt that this runner is wearing i have in my stock it's a great shirt to run in i'm not sure if they still make it but it's a great sun shirt definitely still a little bit of chatter about funding the blimp um <laughs> just an update i actually did get a reply from jamel because i said omg we're crowdfunding a blimp for you and he just said, LOL, what? <laughs> <laughs> so then I told him in a little bit more detail, and he didn't, um, he didn't reply back. But I, I imagine he's probably just still processing. He has a lot going on today. Um, but, I mean, yeah, thanks to the, the Ultra Running Fan community for at least helping like plant that seed. Uh, inception, as they say, I guess, maybe. <laughs> Are those the Zagamas as well? Yeah, that's a Zag that's a Nike Zagama. See a lot of Nike Zagamas here. I I love that Zagama. So in terms of broadcasting schedule, I believe Brett and I will be with you all for the next forty-five to fifty minutes, and then Chris, are we transitioning to you and? So I'm gonna ride solo for about an hour, Kay. and then uh, I'll be joined by uh, the Trail Gangster Roy Monahan. Right on. All right. We're gonna rip. So uh, love it. We'll see if we can get Rory to do a little bit of freestyling, and uh, we'll play. Actually, he he made a fun little uh, Cocodona video last year. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw it, but uh, he likes to make fun little raps for a lot of the big local Arizona races. Oh, and sick! And there's a video of him uh, basically rapping in uh, Heritage Square as uh, a certain uh, female race leader is sitting in a chair. Uh, watching all of this unfold. It's a lot of fun. That's so cool. Creative. We've been talking about our favorite films to date. What are some films that need to be made and why? If you were the director of a future ultra running film, 
what would the storyline be? What would the plot be? What would the setting be? Um, Chris might have an idea here. So you remember how, uh, like, Apocalypse Now was an award-winning film, but the film about Apocalypse Now was the, like, the really award-winning film? Mm. We should have a film about the filming of a race. Uh, this is like like, like uh, this is like disaster artist type vibes. Absolutely, like you know, you guys were still asleep this morning, but when uh, you know, there's sometimes when we're getting ready to do live streams where we're like, oh crap, why is everything not working, or why are these these lights blinking, or why do Finn and Brett sound like they're across the room or in another? Yeah, <laughs> it was just one plug. Hall. It was just one plug, and we're like basically going back and forth and texting and yeah, and, and you know, I'm making suggestions, and Matt's like, I know what's going. On. It, it's there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, and I think that that would be kind of fun. But uh, that's a that that's a movie great. that could definitely be made. Cool, I like that. How about like the uh, the Cole Watson journey on the way to the 2023 Western States? I like that. I mean, he his post race interview after Canyons, like I think he like tripled his fan base just with his authenticity and his answers to, you know, just how he approached the race and, uh, you know, just kind of being the hometown hero as well. Um, I think that would be, that would be a good one. I like that. Totally unbiased, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, we could just make a bunch of movies about running shoes. <laughs> Hashtag conversational pace. Shameless plug for the conversational pace shoe channel. It's a great channel. Growing quickly. Bringing the goods it that is. trail runners need. Yep. We do. Yeah, we talk about kind of the footwear equivalent of blimps. <laughs> By the way, huge, huge grateful shout out to the chat room today. This has made the last five hours such a joy on top of what was already going to be a joy. But y'all are so fun to engage with back and forth. And we're going to be... Brett and I are going to be here from 12 to 6 Pacific every day for the next five days. And Absolutely. Can't wait to dig in with you guys and be a part of this ride together. We've got a, we got a Theragun, Theragun sighting. I love this highlight here. Yeah, absolutely. And I, not even a hot take, but I expect this number to be bigger beyond like day four. Um, oh yeah, I bet the I bet day six, you know, the final hours of the race, watching the final finish coming. I bet I bet we're hitting five thousand. Yes, I believe it. I could totally see that. So we're, I think we're there was that moment of time, maybe an hour ago, where there was like forty people coming through this Crown King Aid station. We're seeing a little bit more real estate around these picnic tables now. A little bit less pandemonium, a little bit less chaos. Yep, it's spreading out, it's spreading out a little the bit race more. Race is spreading out. Yeah. Um, gosh, I think race leader Killian Korth, he's got to be like coming in to the Asastra aid station, like wow, imminent, as as the UTMB tracking would say, because <laughs> his his tracker is showing that he's right on top of the aid station there. I'm still thinking back to Michael Versteeg's quick siesta there. Under yes, the yeah, like, it was how impressive. Can we do that? Yeah, I mean, you just you do it when the time is right. When is the time right? It's when the time is right. <laughs> of course. <laughs> There's a whole gallon of super high carb mix. That's awesome. Chris, I think, um, do you have any context for just like our current uh stable of cameras and and what we're able to broadcast and what we're able to have in the future by comparison i think there was a question here about like just the focus on crown king well uh, we try and have at least one static cam available at all times now there uh, there are times where it's not feasible or we lose signal or something um, we try and have a static cam and we try and have like a roving cam at aid stations uh, later on in the race when people get more and more separated like for instance at Sedona in particular in the last couple of years we would actually have uh, a, a guy Rob was his name 
Um, and I know he'll be out there filming this year, but he would actually catch runners coming into the aid station from about, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred meters out and then follow them back out if they were there mm. for a short time. But he would basically just try and follow the stories that were happening at the aid stations. Um, you know, and I know that uh, some people were, you know, wondering about, you know, can we get eyes on certain runners? It's, it's really, we're at the mercy of, of as many hands as we have. You know, and, uh, you know, we've got multiple drone pilots, but, uh, you know, drones go up, drones go down. And then, you know, come nightfall, drones don't go back up until the morning. Um, but we'll do our best to bring as, as much of, of the the scenery across multiple aid stations. I actually don't have the broadcast plan pulled up and gotcha. to know if we have anybody at uh, um, at uh, Kippa or any of the or not Kippa, but uh, what's the next aid station? Um, Arastra. 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 Yeah, I don't think we have anybody at Arastra, but I will take a look and check the plan. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, here's an update. I just refreshed the trackers, and uh, Killian North and Michael Versteeg are actually both past uh, the Arastra aid station. And I think Sarah's there now. Yep, Sarah is there now or, you know, approaching at any minute now. Um, it looks like Killian Korth has extended his lead on Michael Versteeg. It's now up to about a mile and a half. And for reference, back at the Crown King aid station, they left that aid station maybe two minutes apart from each other. So we will actually have, uh, we're, we're expecting to have um, at least a static camp for sure at Camp Kippa. Okay. Um, I don't know further than that. Actually, the first year, it was a great shot because we were actually about to sign off. And then uh, into our camera view strolls Jamil. Oh, so huh. we got a message to him to call us. And uh, so we did a quick little video interview with him, you know, at, as it approached midnight the first day that uh, of the first time that the race had been run. So we had uh, a great conversation with him. And <laughs> then again, as soon as we were ready to sign off, we, we have eyes on Versteeg hitting Whiskey Row. Oh, so yeah. It was a... Uh, you know, sometimes we, you know, we have like soft outs. We don't have any like yes. hard outs at the end of the, at the end of a shift. And, you know, like for instance, if, if you guys were on the air and, you know, somebody is like, you know, three blocks from the finish, I'm not going to jump in and like, well, this, no, I'm going to just let you guys roll with that. And, and that's one of the beauties of this live stream is that it has that flexibility. We don't have, uh, like time constraints on a cable network no it can just <laughs> it can just go it can just go however long it needs to, like the only thing is you know like the 12 hour youtube live stream before we just switch to a new stream exactly and but that's really it though and we prepared for that yeah so we have exactly. like multiple live streams set up for each day and everything we don't even have to get our i mean we do have sponsors uh and agreements and everything but if we happen to run long in a segment and not get a commercial in or an ad read you know, they, they're going to understand because we're only going to push that back if we've got a reason and that reason is going to keep eyes on the show. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Fun. A uh, well, couple of fun facts here. So race leader Killian Korth is currently averaging four and a half mile per hour pace, 56 miles and 12 hours and change into the race. That would put him on a trajectory for a 55 and a half hour finish. So having that baseline there about halfway into the first day of this race. So th that would be like, I mean, yeah, we're, I mean, extrapolating a lot of data, but that would, I mean, 55 hour finish would not only be just an all, all courses course record, but it would be, you know, a course record over the, I guess, quote unquote, original course that this one is most closely related to by like almost 20 hours. Like we're looking like 17 hours. Has Versteeg taken the inaugural nap for this year yet? I'm counting it. Yes, I'm <laughs> counting that, yeah. We had a drone footage of him in the shade of someone's like camper van uh, on the road at maybe mile 45-ish. Yep. And he took a lie down, and he was there for a couple minutes. No one knows if he fell asleep or not. You know, for a fact, we assume he did. So... I think Michael Versteeg took the first trail nap of 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 the donor four hundred. Of <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yep. Cooler temps uh, today definitely can help contribute. Uh, yeah, we were talking about a little bit earlier. You know, the cooler temps helped a um, couple additional water aid stations helped hugely as well. Just a little bit less that you have to carry from the get-go. There's also the added, you know, two years of course knowledge and experience that people have gathered. You know, it's so hard to just like totally nail something the very first year in its existence. And the last year the course was altered heavily. So, you know, this year there's a lot, a lot of, a lot more knowledge is being taken into this year's race. You know, I'm one, uh, Kyle says, gotta be, gotta be a reward for the first nap. We could start talking about betting. What if we could bet on who takes the first nap and when? Oh yeah, that'd be so amazing. Yeah, that I mean, th those sorts of things absolutely can happen, you know, once we have like 100% <laughs> coverage of the entire race, because then we, you know, we'd be making bets on like what people are grabbing at aid stations and all sorts of things like, what color is uh, Versteeg's Powerade going to be when his crew pulls it out? We're like, it's purple. <laughs> uh, yep. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, then I'm sure that like the. the <laughs> the, the chat's making bets on like what ridiculous things are we thinking of crowdsourcing and you know i mean how many people out there honestly thought that you know air vipe is going to be buying a blimp at the end of this race i mean <laughs> i didn't i didn't even see that coming even when i said it <laughs> yeah over under on big max consumed that's so good did anyone keep track of how many times matt said carnage today have my drinks lined up <laughs> oh that's something that probably should have existed maybe i guess there's still time we could work on it is a uh, a cocodona bingo card for the yes. live chat yes um i bet we could make a couple different ones and then people can that. choose Ooh. yeah we can still do that well, let's make a co we'll make a cocodona bingo card and people can choose a couple different ones um or at least we'll do the orders and see where people see where people bingo sleep number it would be a great sponsor Oh, so good. First nap gets a bed. <laughs> we are Leo, we, we are, are at the uh, ground Crown King aid station right now. It's just our static cam. Our mobile cam is uh, being recharged at the moment. Oh, we've actually got we've got some mobile cam. Refresh rate is not great on it. Oh yeah, we were just it was a little bit choppy. Uh, one thing uh, that was different about this race this year was uh, Ken Rubley being out on course with the frozen grape tree. Oh yes, at the at the beginning in the amazing getup, and his his salesmanship was just off the charts. Yeah, I mean, how many people did he send out with like a cup of frozen grapes that probably had no intention of taking any grapes? Yeah, and and he that's just the way he is. I mean, if if you haven't met Ken Rubley. Uh, He's been a valued member of the trail running community here in Arizona for many years. And, uh, and he decided to offer his services to Jamil and to Aravipa and Stephen Adderholt to basically man a water station out in the middle of nowhere. That's incredible. We have a Rubik's Cube getting solved right now on the aid station cam. Um, so, I, think I, saw, I think it was Jason. I think his name was Jason. Got to acknowledge the It's lead. done. We got to acknowledge the Leah comment here. Leah, unfortunately, it's already began. In fact, this is a great call to action. I am missing a charger for my Apple iPhone. So if anyone <coughs> out there is in the Flagstaff area and uh, wants to hook me up with a iPhone charger. I wish you would have said something last night because I literally have some, an Amazon bringing me a C-Core charger tomorrow. <laughs> I would have just thrown it in the order. <laughs> um, where's Jamil? Last Thank Jamil you, Travis. Sp Thank last you. Jamil spotting. Last Jamil spotting that we had, he was at the uh, at the Crown King aid station, but we do not know where he is currently. So if you're doing a 250 mile race, yeah, obviously some people have certain ways to uh, engage their mind, such as doing a Rubik's cube at mile 37. <laughs> Um, is there anything that you would do, uh, either of you, to to kind of get your mind in the right space uh, for the next 211, 212 miles? I mean, I when I did the Appalachian Trail back in 2014, the cell phone coverage was so bad on the trail, and I didn't bring like any like iPhone device or anything like that, and so there was limited ways to 
entertained. Your mind goes to pretty wild places if you're not like talking with people on trail. And I don't know, it's kind of fun. Two words, exogenous ketones. <laughs> <laughs> My mind will be sharp as a tack the entire time. 60% of the time I take ketones every time. If there's one thing that I want the world to uh, to think about critically today, it's investing in this blimp and getting on the ketones train. Yeah, but I vote blimp over ketones oh, if I had to choose one. 100%. Um, the, the collective versus the individual. Yeah, absolutely. Because, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm investing in this blimp. I want to ride the blimp. I can't wait next year to be in the blimp during the live coverage. Like, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be incredible. It's going to be amazing. The best blimp ever. The air revipa. That's what it's called. Blimp biscuit. The blimp biscuit air revipa. The blimp biscuit. Blimp 182. (laughs) I think Sleep Number could sponsor the blimp. Sleep Number, huh? That would, yeah, that'd be great. I just figured, I mean, if Air Viper just buys the blimp outright, like, then they don't have to worry about sponsors. They can put whatever they want on it. You could also do uh, use the blimp to drop, like, care packages to people <laughs> along the course. Again, going back to Hunger Games style. <laughs> just like, oh, I got stung by this... Big ass wasp. Jamil just flies in with a blimp. Is like, oh, here's some little medicine to make you feel better. <laughs> like, dude, I'm so thankful. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, yes, the amount of the amount of directions we can take is probably a good thing. I'm not the RD. That's runner 202. Let's see if we can find some. Yeah, let's learn a little bit about runner 202. Give me one second. That is Catherine Ginsburg. And what do we know about Catherine? Uh, Running Water asks, how much is the blimp? And we looked it up, and most... Well, they don't really make that many blimps anymore. There's only 24 blimps in, like, existence at the moment. It turns out it's because they're pretty expensive. Um, so the blimp that we're trying to fund is costing roughly $40 million. I actually went online to see how much it would cost to rent a blimp. Is that a thing? I started reading this website that had blimp rentals, and I'm, like, looking to see what their price quotes are. And then halfway through, all of a sudden, this pop-up comes up and it says hey just so you know this was an april fool's website oh you got got and they got contacted by like the u.s military asking them like do you have licensing for these airships that you're renting out <laughs> like it was like this explanation so yeah not only uh do blimps cost a whole heck of a lot of money they're impossible to rent either yeah so that's why then that's why we are just crowdfunding it for jamil uh so that way aravipa can have a blimp i mean yeah it's as simple as that it's been great so Catherine has some really good notes here in the questionnaire she says her mental mantra for this race is don't think just do that's what i tell myself when i'm doing a lot of thinking and not enough doing to spur me to get my rear in gear as i leave the aid stations that's awesome that is a great mantra you like yeah the less thinking you can do at times you know the better like thinking takes energy She is coached by Michael McKnight. Oh, okay. A Michael McKnight athlete. And this is her first race over 100 miles. And she said she found out about Cocodona five miles into her first 100 miler and thought she just wanted to do it. Wow. Already thinking about a 250 five miles into 100? Yeah. (laughs) That's a bold move, Cotton. I feel like Versteeg is not that old. I feel like he's in like his like mid to late thirties. Yeah, he's only like thirty eight, thirty nine, maybe. Oh yeah, he's he's a young gun as well. In ultra terms. Yeah, he's thirty seven. That's the beard. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and we were debating that too, uh, Jonathan in the chat's like, how about just a fleet of drones instead of a blimp? And they already have a fleet of drones, and we were thinking about, like, what can be bigger? Not many things bigger than a blimp. Julie Ford has a plan for us, it looks like. Oops. 
Well, that that uh, that blimp has also gone over the across the years race that Air Viper puts on um, during the college football championship. So, uh, yeah, we just got to know somebody who knows somebody <laughs> that owns a blimp or is a blimp pilot. So, yeah, what is getting your blimp like? pilot's license look like and according to a quick google search it costs like four grand just to get it i mean in relation to a 40 million dollar <laughs> blimp like that's a very cheap license like that's suspiciously cheap Screaming deal interesting um the average age of these runners i don't know i i, I tried popping on to ultra sign up to see what the age range was but they've taken it off as the event is live. A couple people in the chat looking at a couple trackers and that one actually looks maybe pretty legit. It looks like Bib eighty four and ninety five may have gone off course. Um because they there's a junction that you have to turn left on. Uh, to get off of the South Towers Mountain Road, and they might still be on it. Is there some people checking in the stream? Like that? That doesn't look like an error. No, no. Going back to the age question, this is just quick review of 2022. There were five runners in 2022 that were 39 or older. Most of them in their mid to late 40s. At we're in the top 10, and two of the top 10 overall were female, which is super cool. Women's leader Sarah Ostazowski was 13th overall last year and third female. She did it in 84 hours. I think she's on a much faster pace this year currently. The Midwest mi Misfit says, somebody Billy Yang knows has to know Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon knows someone who knows someone that has a blimp. Oh, for I sure. I assume that Billy Yang knows Kevin Bacon. <laughs> I mean, he, he's, he's uh, you know, in those uh, characters. He's, he's Hollywood famous now, right? Yes. Yeah. Where's Dollar Store Anton? <laughs> Where's maybe maybe like when maybe you'll hop in Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah, I could totally see that, you know, that that missed turn that people are looking at in the uh live tracking. That looks like a very realistic turn to potentially miss. One can only hope though that they don't go too far and they realize oh, I'm not seeing three numbers on this spot. Uh, I'm seeing 154, 84, and 95 on this turn. Um, yeah, I'll contact race command if they don't course correct here, like with a, within a few moments. Yeah, we'll, we, will, we will contact race command, just let them know. Um, it's definitely a turn that potentially could be easy to miss, but one of the things that you have to remember when you're racing is like you have to know exactly how far apart or how many – markers course markers per mile you were told that you would see on course and if you stop seeing markers you turn around and go back to the last spot you saw a marker that's usually the, the general guideline <laughs> rule for not getting lost uh we will not be streaming all through the night we're not sure exactly what time we're gonna go to um what Chris, do you remember what mileage the stream was looking to take runners through tonight, roughly? We wanted to see if we could uh catch the first runners hitting Whiskey Row. Whiskey um, Row, so it's mile seventy eight. Yeah, and we're hoping that things move a little bit faster than they did in twenty twenty one because that would have been about one AM. Okay. And uh I don't think I've got the strength to go the quite that late tonight. Um but everybody seemed to be moving much faster uh, than in 2021. The conditions were much more favorable. So my yeah. hope is that 
whether it be you know Killian or uh, Versteeg or somebody else hitting uh, Whiskey Row tonight and catching our filmers there, that uh, it happens somewhere in the uh, 10 to 11 p.m. range local time. But uh, you know we'll we'll stick around as long as we can uh, until it looks like we're just hitting a, a a dark spot. So Andre in the chat says, "Me and Henry Ward almost missed that turn in 2021. It's very easy to miss." Uh, I see. Yeah, it really does look like it's easy to miss because you go from like main road to slightly less <clears throat> main road, and it's just like a very slight left deviation. Um, every single one of the runners in this race is supposed to have the GPX file loaded onto a device where they can see exactly if they're on course or not. So according to the rules, all three of these runners should be able to pop open their device and know whether they're on course or not. This looks to be Catherine Ginsburg readying to exit the aid again Catherine coached by Michael McKnight her first 200 was inspired five miles into running her first hundred that's incredible okay folks just so you know uh, race command has been notified of the the people who might have potentially missed uh, the turn um, if you look at Andrew Garber, who was number 36, one of the people who actually uh, did show us missing their turn, it, it did self-correct. But yeah, we, uh, we are keeping an eye on those runners that look like they might potentially be off course. So just to let you know. Looks like everyone else is doing great. There's a lot of people. Oh, I'm heavily zoomed into the Crown King aid station. It looks like we've got like Looks like Patrick Atkinson, James, is about two and a half miles out from Crown King Aid Station, according to the tracker. Looks like we have about 13 people in this Crown King Aid Station right now. And we're seeing a lot of these Ultimate Direction FKT packs today. It's a great pack. Um, you know, it's, it's a large pack, but you can cinch it down in a way where it's actually very comfortable to run yep. with. And one, one thing that I like personally like is on that pack, the soft bottles on the front sit higher than a lot of other packs. Oh, cool. And I love the high sitting bottles. Yeah, that's awesome. 173 is on their way out. So we just saw Caitlin Johnson a moment ago on the uh, screen. Caitlin is 32 years old. She just ran the Havelina 100 last October. Brett, you're very familiar with that race. I mean, as are you. <laughs> yeah. I almost got dropped by you on your lap four. If only you had to run a lap five with me. <sighs> thank, thank God for Eric Gelfi. Yeah, Eric Gelfi saved the day. So we got we got the Jason Cam. <laughs> Chris, do you know what the location of this drone is about? I do not. Um, like this could be a. Um, it's definitely Senator Highway north of Crown King, but that's about all I know. Yeah. My, this drone could be around mile, like in the 40s. Yeah. DC, I love the Great White North reference. That's a deep cut. Yeah, that one's going over my head. High bottle sitting like orange mud high. No, I'm not trying to look like a blastoise out there. <laughs> Glaze didn't miss it. He probably just went out to put a small fire or save somebody or something like that. <laughs> I wonder how Chad Wright is doing. Yeah, let's update the people with a Chad. Chad Wright. 
update. Chad Wright is plodding along just fine. He is 44.7 miles into the race, so he's about 7.5 miles north of the Crown King aid. We saw him just you know looking a little phased in aid, and so I think this is just the testament to his toughness. All could be part of his plan, too. Yeah. In terms of updates on the overall men's and women's leaders, we still have Killian Korth uh, leading the race on the men's side. Trackers showing roughly 57 miles into the race. So his next aid station would be Camp Kippa at mile 62.9. On the ladies' side, uh, Sarah Osuzuki is leading the ladies race she's roughly around mile 54 um having just left the arastra creek aid station is now making their way towards camp kippa as well here we go we got some runners on gotta know who they are this is that fabled senator highway here just beyond the crown king aid station this is beautiful double track beautiful jeep road this was where we saw Michael Versteeg take a quick siesta near a car. I wonder how far away, or even if they're, these two runners are beyond. Cool to see them working together, too. I saw the, the person in the red look back to the person in the white and blue and kind of communicate in some form, so it's cool to see them together. Yeah, folks, I just want to give you a heads up that uh, we literally do have a race command who is following like every single runner uh, constantly. So, yeah, I, we do see runners off course. Um, and uh, when I reached out to our race command, they were already on top of it. So uh, don't worry. We will collect everybody and uh, get them uh, back on the path. We did have, I want to say, maybe between two and five people go off course uh, of some significance last year, but they, they all made their way back to the course and actually uh, somebody who actually ended up two plus miles off course did end up finishing as well. So, you know, we've got uh, some experienced uh, people that are, that are handling that. So don't worry if you see somebody's uh, radar pinging off on it, we are, we are on the case. Yep. Do appreciate the mentions though and the concerns in the chat, but you know, I mean, 250 mile raised, you had two miles, Masermenos, that's okay. He'll get back on. It'll be all steady Eddie from here. And that's also just, you know, the one of the unfortunate parts of, you know, trail racing is that, you know, navigation is sometimes uh, a challenge. <laughs> fasted last man standing <laughs> i'm out i'm out i'm literally the worst at that like i need to eat a goo like 30 minutes into every run i am 100 percent carbohydrate so we're seeing sally at about mile 43 right now and we're seeing garmeyer at just under mile 40 Brett, we got about 15 minutes left for our first day here. What do we want to talk about? I mean, the biggest thing is I've just been blown away with how many people have, I mean, the entire time we've been on, this number has not dipped below 1,000 people watching the chat. The chat's been so active. It's been just so funny. Um, I mean, yeah, the things things we think of and like we're not thinking of those without everyone in the chat as well so it it's just yeah it's been a blast i can't wait to do this for the rest of the week it's gonna be super fun i think i'm with you this day has made me want to watch 200 mile races even more mm -hmm. yep yeah i won't i won't even be able to sleep tonight because i'll just be refreshing the tracker on my phone yeah we we actually started today's well our our segment of the broadcast talking about just all of the theories out there around sleeping in this race brett and i were really impressed when michael versteeg took a really quick nap for five minutes you know just coming out of crown king 
there you know, is, seemingly I, very early into the race. There is biologically, right, going to be that period at like 3 or 4 a.m. where they're really fighting their central nervous system to stay awake. And I wonder if that's where we're going to start seeing people do that en masse. Or if some people are going to fight through and wait for the sunlight, get re-energized, and pick what they think is a more strategic time. But I'll be curious. Yeah, and everyone's strategy is pretty different right now. And that's what makes this part of the race so fascinating is that I don't believe the sleep element has been totally figured out yet. And, um, yeah, it'll be really exciting to see, you know, later on around day three, day four, what, who, who's running well, and then asking them later, like, what was your sleep strategy? What were you doing? Um, it's just going to be really fascinating to learn more. And, you know, it's just going to take more years of the race to figure this out. Because, I mean, this whole sleep deprivation, like, sleep strategy, is really hard to, like, this would be really hard to recreate in, like, a closed, you know, environment. Yes. Shy of just, like, doing it and then tweaking things for next time. Yep. What are we eating for dinner tonight? Where are we going? I don't Any know. Any recommendations, Flagstaff people? Where should Brett and I get our dinner tonight? I still have leftover breakfast burrito in the fridge, but that might just be like a, a nighttime snack. Dude, I'm ready to go eat a pizza clutter every single day this week. <laughs> this is uh, Enzo, one of our uh, drone filmers, flying just outside of Crown King near Tower Mountain. Beautiful. Amazing shots. Amazing that these shots exist on the internet. Just live stream, YouTube, Air Viper, Coca Dona 250, Dona Fohano. Sorry? Go to Mother Road tonight. Mother Road. Oh, okay. They got good burgers and stuff. Or? Yeah, barbecue, it's all right. Barbecue. Oh, as, as good as, uh, oh, we could go to Blimpy's, get some subs. Ooh. There's another good place. McDonald's. Salsa Bravo, okay. The, we went, where did we go this morning for breakfast? That was amazing. What? A, a Mexican it was restaurant a Mexican that restaurant. just had, uh, it was just the biggest where we stopped running. Was, they literally gave us catering platters. It was incredible. Yeah, Joe, we actually went to Pizza Clara last night, um, uh, supporting uh, basically the restaurant that supports the trail and ultra running community here in Flagstaff. And, uh, I think you guys like that, right? You guys. Oh, well, the amazing. pizza was incredible. Oh, the Good. bee's knees. Yeah, the bee's knees. We went to the downtown Dark Sky Brewing location. So, we've got uh, we've got a recommendation from Mike McMonigal. Ooh, a ramen to, to place. go to single speed for coffee in the morning. Single speed is apparently the best. Yeah. There are so many great coffee shops in this town. Per, like per capita, it's got to have like the most coffee shops. Of a of a small city I've ever seen, my personal preference is Lucy's, but I mean not Lucy, but Macy's. But you can't go wrong with okay. darn near anything here. Sweet. Yeah, Flagstaff breakfast. We learned this morning that y- you would have to try really hard to get a bad breakfast in Flagstaff, because <laughs> we just picked one spot and we were just like, "Yep, we're going there," and it was incredible. We got. I think our drone is landing. It's a great shot. Super cool. View. Diablo Burger. Ooh. I got a message from uh, Ryan Raff on Instagram. He asked if we want to go running. I got the same one. Because he's like, you guys are in flag. Let's go run. NAU alum. Yep. Uh, crushing the trails now. Yep. He'll be running the uh, uh, Elden Crest 36 yes. later this nice. week. Yes, I saw he was signed up for that. Fun to see young, uber-talented runners getting into the trail world so early. Midwest Misfit saying the T-Mobile founder started getting into trail running a few years ago. Maybe he could help get Wi-Fi at all national trails for safety purposes. Coverage for it. Yes, for safety purposes, of course. <laughs> Um, you think, I mean, I'm sure the T-Mobile founder probably knows someone who's in the blimp industry. (laughs) I mean, sure. Yeah. Maybe we could have Wi-Fi on all the national trails, but maybe they could help us get that blimp. I love it. (laughs) 
Lily, there are roughly 213 people in this race, which is I think that's is that more than last year? A little bit Does more this race year. sell out? Is there a cap? It's uh. I think the cap's like 350 or something like that. Okay, so this race did not sell out for everyone in the chat, <laughs> wondering how how early they have to sign up before doing it next year. You know, it's growing in popularity, but. We had a couple of last minute entries I know this week. I know one of them was Ed Eddinghausen, the jester. He was not on our, any of our lists oh, entering wow. this race. And then I happened to uh, catch word that he was uh, um, at packet pickup yesterday or on uh, Saturday. So cool. The Muffin Man. <laughs> Oh, I wonder, are we approaching the spot where Michael Versteeg took his dirt nap? That was it. Yeah, that truck right there. Yeah, okay. That was where the first and official recorded dirt nap of oh, the Coca Donut 250. I wish we could get happened. a zoom in on these runners. Who is who? Great shots, though. Great, excellent shots. Running water, you should absolutely run next year, especially if it speaks to you. Yep. There's like four Michaels, Mikes, and Micah in the top ten. <laughs> yeah, again, I mean, just shout out to our drone pilots and all the volunteers at the aid stations and those, you know, man in the cameras delivering us these amazing pictures that we get to talk about because, I mean, this live stream would not be that exciting if it was just a camera on our faces and we were talking according to what happened in the live tracker. I know. I mean, like, we need these pictures live to be able to talk about this race. Has there been any updates on the uh, missed turns? Oh, they appear to be... Uh, Most of them back? Course correcting. Yeah. I assume that if some of them passed, like, the others... Yeah. Course, then those just need to ping again. Andrew Glaze, at least his tracker, is the one that's farthest out. Probably going to come back at some point, hopefully. Yeah, this, is, this isn't their first rodeo. Yeah, I'm I am getting very hungry. <laughs> I'm very I'm getting pretty excited <laughs> to eat some dinner. Brett, I'll do it uh next time. <laughs> yeah, I was actually wondering about that today. <laughs> yeah, that'll be perfect for tomorrow. TJ with an excellent point. Uh if anyone in the chat can get to the finish on Saturday, get there. It's magic. Uh I don't know if uh, anybody out there saw the cover of Ultra Running Magazine, I believe it was the July issue where the finish line, the final finisher was uh, the cover photo taken by the incomparable Howie Stern. And uh, the energy at the finish line is is unmatched. And uh, frankly, it's not till Saturday, so pretty much no, no matter where you're watching from, you have the time to get here. People got time. <laughs> got time. Got nothing but time. Looks like our drone drone pilot has landed. Snake cycle. That's our only shot right now. Huh. Some good some some midnight's references in the chat. RBD, first of all, salute to you for being on a twenty four hour shift. That is that is uh, approaching the level of 
what I imagine is sleep deprivation at Cocodona. So you are ready. Huge sleep. You are ready for this race. You are ready for Cocodona. <laughs> So is this the Kevin Goldberg in the chat, or is it somebody that just happened to name themselves Kevin Goldberg? <laughs> I'm skeptical, <laughs> although I know that some runners in the past have jumped into the the chat while they were running the race. That's incredible. That's it's not unheard of. Yeah. That's amazing. This is an increase in uh, Taylor Swift chatter in the chat <laughs> going on right now. Uh, Rob says listening to Taylor Swift works miracles during ultras. I agree with that. <laughs> I bet, I bet Killian Korth is listening to Taylor's newest album right now. <laughs> yeah, TJ, I think the best way to uh, to combat the uh, we can't pause the race, but what you can do is you can just turn your volume up really loud, so that way you can hear everything still. Big Goldberg energy. Kevin Goldberg has entered the chat. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure the Fernando Alonso rumors got shot down pretty quickly. It'd be cool, though. Hey, Brendan, I have actually raced that Seven Sisters race in Central Western Mass. It's it's amazing. That was actually the first trail race I think I ever did. I know, Kyle, that is such a great point. I'm hoping we get chances over the course of the next few days to get the mic on some of these athletes and engage once once things get down to the nitty-gritty and we're following runners uh, as they're heading down beaver street to the finish line we will actually occasionally have the opportunity to have some conversations with some of these runners as their uh, as their journey to flagstaff draws to a close it's it's pretty cool to be able to interact with them and uh, yeah you know, whether we're doing it directly or if Jamil happens to have uh, uh, an earpiece in and is is relaying things, it's it's a lot of fun. Well, we're coming up on time here for myself and Brett Horning. It's been an honor, and we'll, we're going to be passing over to our friend here, Chris Warden, and I think Matt Fildock will be back at some point tonight. I think back. he's coming back at 6.30. Yeah, Matt will be back shortly. I'm going to – I can uh, – keep the car on the road here for a little bit while uh, Matt gets back. Uh, he is uh, out uh, attending to, uh, I believe, uh, soccer, He's a soccer practice. Game, soccer practice, yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, uh, not him, his kids. Yeah, yeah, his kids. So he was telling telling us about that uh, last night. It, it, I guess it's an adventure to be a coach for a soccer team full of four-year-olds. <laughs> I can't even fathom. Yeah, that sounds like it's an adventure every single practice. But. That's one thing I never got into. I never got into coaching my kids' uh, team sports. Um, thankfully, my kid really only briefly did team sports for a little time, and now he just enjoys doing hikes and a little bit of trail running every now and again. So, right on. He, what we're gonna do uh, in Silverton? We're gonna do uh, a through hike. He's he'll be sixteen at that point, but uh, we're planning tentatively to start in Uray and hike to Telluride. Oh, cool! And then. Uh, stay in Telluride overnight, and then hike from Telluride back to Silverton. So, that's the plan. Anyway, that'll be so awesome. I hope so. I think it'll be. Yeah, a great time. I think that'll be that'll be a lot of fun for sure. Hey, one last update, at least for me, before I go. There, there's four women in the top ten right now, which is awesome. You've got Sarah Ostazuski in the lead, Micah Thews, Don Greenwalt, and Eliza Lapierre. That is so cool. Certified heavy hitters, right there. Let's definitely keep track of this storyline over the next few days and see if that's maintained or if, if the number even grows. That'd be wild if we can get a majority of women in the top ten. That would be really cool. <laughs> awesome. All right, folks. Peace. We will see you guys.
tomorrow right. at noon. Thank you very much, everybody. That was uh, Finn Melanson and Brett Hornig. They will be joining us tomorrow at noon. Now they're going to go and uh, exp- continue their exploration of Flagstaff. I'm, uh, Mother Road, maybe. Maybe Mother Road. Mother, I think Mother Road is an excellent choice. I don't know if you're familiar with their, their, uh, their brews, but uh, uh, they're a very popular uh, destination here in Flagstaff for uh, trail and ultra runners. Otherwise, you, you really can't go wrong with a lot of the places down there, like Diablo Burger. I've heard great things about, never been myself, but uh, yeah. as I also mentioned, Salsa Brava, Beaver Street Brewery is right down there as well. I mean, it's you've got plenty of places to choose from, and uh, you guys will have a good time. Let me know how it goes. All right. Thank you so much. All right, folks, I am hanging out in the producer's studio, so I am just going to kind of wing it from here. Once Matt gets back, uh, he will jump onto the production side of the studio, and uh, I will be joined uh, by my special guest for the evening, local runner uh, and Air Viper Racing Team member Rory Monahan, the trail gangsta himself. And uh, we're going to riff uh, into the night here on Air Viper After Dark. It's about that time. Yes, Sarah Newberry, it is absolutely time for Air Viper After Dark. If if you've never experienced Air Viper After Dark, well, now's your chance. People have tried to describe it. People have tried to explain what it's all about. You just can't do it. Frankly, I can't do it. But as you can see right now, we're actually in Crown King. And uh, that right there in the middle of your screen is the legendary Andy Jones Wilkins, AJW himself. Now, uh, AJW uh, had volunteered for a shift up in Crown King because he wanted to be a part of the race. And he was scheduled to join us in the studio later this week, but unfortunately, uh, obligations elsewhere will prevent him from doing so. However, we are happy to see him out there. That's the kind of guy he is. He's out there uh, doing his best to help runners because he's actually got a beat feet across country, basically directly from Crown King. So uh, AJW out there, as you see, uh, truly a one-of-a-kind runner and a one-of-a-kind human being uh, helping runners as they get their drop bags as they hit the Crown King aid station at mile 37. Uh, The sun is starting to set, which means it's going to be getting kind of cold out there uh, in Crown King. I don't have a temperature for it, but I can pull it up on my own computer. Right now, I've got a temperature of 65, but I guarantee it feels probably 10 degrees cooler out there right now. Yeah, thank you to uh, Finn and Brett for a great time here today at the Cocodona 250 2023 presented by Air Viper Running. I'm going to take a few moments to thank some of our sponsors, uh, Satisfy Running, uh, Catula, Spring Energy, Discover Flagstaff, Gnarly Sports Nutrition, Tanry, Ultra Aspire, Squirrels Nut Butter, Rob Carr Coaching, Uptown Pub House, Latinos Run, and our nonprofit partners, Wilderness Volunteers and Rising Hearts. We have had a heck of a day so far here at the Cocodona 250. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Jan, it is definitely not snowing up in Crown King. For those of us that ran the Crown King Scramble earlier this year and were up in town, it was snowing. But uh, back to the race, um, we had a beautiful start uh, down in Black Canyon City. Hope uh, that everybody was able to tune in and check it out. Um, And uh, we've had a blast following these amazing athletes and from what I can tell pretty much everybody is still on course. I cannot confirm any of the dropouts yet. I know that we have had a couple whose trackers are showing as dropouts, but I usually do my best to uh, hesitate to declare somebody uh, out of the race. Uh, Let me uh, pull up my version of the leaderboard really quick and see if I can give you a heads up. It looks like on the women's side, let me see if I can pull that up. On the women's side, Sarah Ostazewski uh, has been leading pretty much from jump and uh, is still maintaining that. Uh, according to my tracker, she's at mile 55.2. Uh, Mika Tuz is at uh, 53.7 miles. And uh, 2021 runner-up Don Greenwald is at 53.2 miles. And uh, that rounds out your top three women. On the men's side, it 
appears that Killian Korth is in first, Michael Versteeg in second, and Mike Gronenwagen is in third. Michael McKnight is uh, giving pursuit, uh, is in, uh, as far as we can tell, in fourth place right now. Uh, some other notable names uh, further down. It looks like uh, Eliza LaPierre is in fourth on the women's side. Uh, Kevin Goldberg is in sixth, I believe, on the men's side. So uh, we'll be following these runners. And once again, this is a 250-mile race, and we are barely a fifth into it. So we're going to see... Uh, how things unfold. And uh, I'm going to pop around uh, to different coverages here. Uh, we have a drone. We have drone coverage of a runner right there. I can't be sure who it is, but right now I believe our drone is positioned somewhere between um, between Crown King and the following aid station, which is uh, Roster Creek. At least that's what I believe, which would be uh, there's about a 16 mile stretch right there. And uh, this is being piloted by Jason. Uh, Jason is new to the Cocodona 250 coverage team. And uh, for those of you who have been following along, he's been doing a, a masterful job of uh, drone coverage. So uh, while I'm here by myself, I am open to anything you folks want to talk about. Um, I have got two hands, and I've got a microphone, a mouse, and about three different computers that I'm pivoting between, but uh, I'll do my best to keep up with uh, keeping you folks informed. Um, we'll see if we can uh, – we'll, we'll keep things over here at uh, Crown King Aid for now. I do believe we've got some action over at Camp Kippa. Uh, I believe that that's Brent's cam. Uh, Brent, if you're able to pivot to horizontal uh, mode, that would be great. Uh, we'll see if we can get you uh, set up in that regard. But uh, we're going to head back to, uh, to Crown King. And uh, you can see... Uh, the traffic jam has kind of subsided a little bit, but we've still got a lot of runners that are, are making their way up to Crown King at this point. Uh, and Crown King is mile 37 of the race. This is 13 plus hours uh, into the Cocodona 250. Um, the runners that aren't here yet aren't in any danger. They're still doing fine. This is a, it's a five day race. They've got 125 hours to go 250 miles. So uh, even the back of the Packers who maybe were conserving energy through the heat of the day are going to be just fine as long as they keep moving. Yeah, Lacey, uh, <laughs> the jester has been, uh, out at Hevelina many times and at jackpot, uh, He's actually out on the course right now, and uh, last I saw, he looked like it was he was doing fine. Uh, although he, he never sells it if he's not, anyways. Uh, I've run with him uh, several times, but uh, but uh, he uh, he is out here. And as I mentioned earlier on the the broadcast, one of the things that surprised me about that is that this is not uh, at Eddinghausen's wheelhouse. It's more of the the flatter, faster courses that favor his strength. So uh, Cocodona and uh, one of our other races, the Mogian Monster, uh, are not ones that play to his strengths, but I'm hoping that he has a good, well, I was going to say good day, but uh, a good week would be more accurate. Kevin Lara is a hot dog a sandwich. I believe that that is a uh, debate that I will let all of you uh, try and figure out. Yeah, Seatown fan, don't use the 3D live results. Use the the link that's right below the uh the runner tracking the cocodona or the right below the screen cocodona.com slash live just use that runner tracker uh you can zoom in on it and that seems to be the most accurate form of following the the runners in the race at this point so just a heads up oh no this is the first and last statement i'm going to make about this liam talking about the new wwe belt no 
um, uh, aid station fireball, Liam, uh, uh, Obviously, for those that follow on Instagram, an excellent follow. Some of the best running memes you'll find anywhere. Uh, but uh, when uh, Liam came out to visit here in February, we found out we had a commonality in the fact that we were both uh, uh, wrestling fans. And so uh, we had uh, some discussions about uh, our thoughts on the wrestling industry and the entertainment industry in that regard while he was out here. So. Sharon, don't feel guilty or strangely guilty watching this. Um, enjoy it, you know, appreciate, you know, do what we do. We appreciate the runners that are, uh, that are out there, you know, getting it done and, and just know that you could be out there next year if you wanted. You have roughly a year to prepare. Welcome to the chat, Carson. Uh, completely new to running, and the thought of a 250-mile race is unbelievable. Yeah, um, people will seriously be running until Saturday. Um, the, la the final finishers will probably uh, finish between, between 8 and 10 a.m. Uh, the cutoff for all races, all three distances, is indeed uh, 10 a.m. And uh, uh, two years ago... Andre Lee was the final finisher, and I believe Andre finished with about an hour and a half to spare. But last year, Stephen Park was our final finisher, and he finished with, I believe, four minutes to spare before the cutoff. And it was a very emotional, um, the kind of fill your cup moment that you can only get at the end of, of an extremely long race. I mean, I've been the DFL at a hundred miler before um, I've witnessed uh, multiple races and seeing people get in under the gun in that golden hour. It's very emotional. Uh, it's very inspiring. And uh, to see the finish of Cocodona on Saturday morning, if you can be here in Flagstaff, I encourage you to be here. If you can't be here, I encourage you to follow us online because we will do our best to give that moment the justice it deserves. If you're interested, again, once again, if you're interested in uh, seeing the leaderboard, uh, you can click the link right below the live feed, um, right below the uh, Era Viper running uh, label. And uh, we've got three links there for you. We've got the Cocodona 250 runner tracking, the Cocodona 250 website. So you can check out information such as the runner's guide and uh, some uh, different uh, information, maps of the course. And also, oh, the uh, 200, <clears throat> excuse me, the Cocodona 250 merch uh, is available as well. So, uh, and uh, you know, I, thank you everybody, everybody for tuning in. My name is Chris Warden. I am host of Era Vipa After Dark. It's basically uh, where we keep following the race after the sun goes down. And uh, I wouldn't say anything goes, but a lot goes. Of course, uh, we do have two other distances that will be taking place later this week. It is not just about the Cocodona 250. Uh, the Sedona Canyons 125 and the Eldon Crest 36 are both going to be taking place as well later this week. And uh, I can give you some information on that or on those as well. Uh, the Sedona Canyons race will start on May 3rd. So on Wednesday morning at 7 a.m., runners will be lining up just on the other side of Jerome, uh, Arizona. Um, Jerome is an excellent uh, day trip slash overnighter uh, here in central Arizona. And the runners will make their way along the Cocodona 250 course from Jerome all the way up to Heritage Square in downtown Flagstaff. Now, on Friday, we've got the Eldon Crest 36, which is which starts at Fort Tudhill Park, which is uh, the final major uh, crew accessible aid station for the Cocodona 250. 
But runners that are undertaking the Elden Crest 36 will start there on Friday morning at 7 a.m. And they will head through Walnut Canyon, up and over Mount Eldon, down through Buffalo Park, and finally down Beaver Street on Fla- in Flagstaff, where they will make their way down to the iconic left-hand turn on Birch Street and walk down Birch Street or run down Birch Street if they're so inclined and head down to Cocodona Alley. And then... They will be right at the finish line. And a lot of one of the cool things about this race is that these 36 mile runners, these 125 mile runners, these 250 mile runners, a lot of them are going to be intermingling. Uh, I know actually I see one person, Aaron Berger, in the chat. Aaron is running the Sedona 125. Looking forward to seeing my friend run that, uh, even if he is a uh, Wisconsin based sports fan. Uh, Kevin and Lisa asking if the 125 hour cutoff is the only cutoff of, or if there are more mid race, there are more, I don't have those in front of me at the moment. I'll see if I can pull those up, but, uh, I, there are, uh, cutoffs at the major aid stations. Um, I just don't remember the, let's see the, oh, here we go. I can do my best to try and provide that information. Okay, um, the cutoff. Okay, the first cutoff is actually here at the Crown King aid station. At Crown King, the cutoff for tonight is 11.55 p.m. So runners need to make it to, actually, they need to leave the Crown King saloon uh, by 11.55 p.m. tonight. That is the first cutoff on the course. And uh, the next cutoff after that will be at Friendly Pines Camp, which is at mile 71.2. And that won't be till 5 p.m. tomorrow. So right now, the runners on course are really only concerned with that first major cutoff. What headlamp would I recommend? I know people like their Kogalas. I, I have a, a, just a simple uh, a, a Tika or Tikina. I can't even remember which one it is. It, it was like a 40 or $50 headlamp. Um, although then again, I don't spend extensive times out uh, running at night. But when I do, it's in the desert. And I generally don't feel like I need to have a, a super powerful headlamp. Ben, uh, Aravipa After Dark is pretty much started. Um, it is uh, starting to get dark here in the desert. Um, the The sun has uh, started its descent, and so we are descending into Aravipa After Dark. Uh, Jason, our drone pilot out on the Senator Highway, um, basically, I think that he is somewhere between a roster at Creek and Camp Kippa possibly at this point, but uh, uh, getting some excellent shots of runners on the Senator Highway. And one of the things that uh, has been noted by several people watching is how lush and green the desert looks. Um, now this is, I guess, uh, not entirely desert, but it's uh, there are sections of the Senator Highway which are still uh, you know, in between pine forest but it's been a very heavy snow and heavy rain uh, year for us so far so uh, the the environment here is pretty green and lush right now so yeah Sharon that's an excellent way to put it the last call at the saloon tonight is 1155 p.m. Now I can speak from experience that the Crown King Saloon doesn't typically stay open till 11.55 p.m. I've been heading up to Crown King for the last several years as a participant in the Crown King Scramble, and uh, we will 
every year without fail as a group, uh, the Aravipa running community will close down the Crown King Saloon. We'll be there until they basically tell us that we've got to go. But it doesn't typically go quite as late as 1155. Some beautiful shots here. I wish uh, I wish my eyes were better at this point, but then again, it's it's hard to uh, to see some of these runners from a distance, even with twenty twenty vision. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna pivot back to the Crown King static cam as well. You can see that uh, uh, that's basically right where the runners enter the aid station, uh, and then their drop bag pickup is right there. Um, I see uh, in the blue to the left of the screen is Andy Jones Wilkins uh, helping to uh, assist runners in collecting their drop bags so they don't have to try and find them themselves. So uh, he's up there volunteering, and uh, we're glad to have him out on the course. Uh, AGW, of course, moved back to the Valley uh, a couple, about a year and a half ago and uh, has... Uh, uh, been an invaluable member of the trail and ultra running community here in uh, Arizona. Real footloose energy of the Crown King Saloon after 8.30 p.m., yeah. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what mile this drone shot is, but that's where, right there, right next to that vehicle was where uh, Verstig literally laid down in the road and took a nap. Um, so I think that that's about mile four, between 40 and 45 at, at, or thereabouts. So that is actually not between Arasta Creek and Camp Kippa, rather between the Crown King and Arasta Creek aid stations. So that's my guess is around mile 42 to 45. Yeah, uh, C-Town, um, Michael Versteeg, when he won the race in 2021, did most of his napping during the day, during the heat of the day, um, while other runners perhaps would have followed a, a somewhat more typical sleep cycle or maybe started at, uh, you know, during the, the morning of, as everybody else did and run into the night and then maybe take their sleep then. I know for a fact that Michael Versteeg, uh, instead took his naps when the sun started to get pretty intense and then ran through the night for the most part. Uh, last year, last year's winner, Joe string mean McConaughey was a little bit different in his approach. Uh, I was uh, in uh, contact with uh, some of his crew and coach uh, Connor Holt was advising him on uh, last year's race. And uh, he was kept to very strict regimented naps. It might be eight minutes here, 15 minutes there. But uh, String Bean really uh, pushed the edges, I believe, when it came to his uh, sleep and nap schedule uh, during the Cocodona 250 last year. Any fun starting line stories this year? Um, I don't really think so. Although uh, I can uh, elaborate on the 
stories that you mentioning from last year, Kate, uh, Versteeg did barely make the start, although I kind of wonder if that was by design. I mean, the race start for last year's Cocodona was actually in Prescott because of uh, wildfires that caused issues uh, further down on the course. And the gentleman who started in jeans and cowboy boots and a, a denim jacket was uh, Tony Tadieski, who is running the race this year. Uh, the He was coined uh, the denim cowboy. Uh, yeah, he's, he's a friend of mine here in Arizona. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he started out the race in full-blown cowboy gear. So uh, we don't, I don't think we had anything uh, unique like that this year. I think that it was a pretty normal start for the most part. Yeah, Jason, I don't know how much sleep string bean got last year, but it wasn't very much at all. He was, he was not down for very long. As you can see, these are some great shots of uh, the higher country of Arizona, north of Crown King, as the runners, basically, they are making their way uh, through a couple of aid station setups. Uh, the next, after Crown King Saloon, the next aid station is Arasta Creek at mile 53. And then from there, the next several aid stations, the next three aid stations, rather, Camp Kippa, Friendly Pines, and Whiskey Row, all have sleep stations, and uh, Camp Kippa is at mile 62.9, Friendly Pines is at mile 71, and Whiskey Row, the iconic Whiskey Row in downtown Prescott, is at mile 78. Now, the hope is that we see our lead runner or runners get to Whiskey Row by midnight, or actually, I ideally by 11 so I can get to bed at a reasonable hour. Um, but we'll see what happens. We'll follow as long as we can and as long as makes sense. So uh, hope uh, we hope to see some of these runners uh, push forward and actually get to Whiskey Row because it is cool to see them hit that aid station, um, you know, right in the middle of uh, you know, the historic downtown Prescott area. Gonna head back to Crown King, and this is the yard right next to the saloon where the aid station is set up for all of the runners. It's a drop bag and crew aid station. The first uh, opportunity for uh, the runners to have uh, access to drop bags and crews. And uh, in terms of that, it's actually the last opportunity for runners to get. Uh, crew access or a drop bag until Friendly Pines at mile 71. And that's something that was important to note earlier. I believe there were a couple of people that were noting that several of these lead pack runners, when they got there at, at 1 p.m. or so, were actually uh, grabbing headlamps. And they were grabbing headlamps because they knew that by the time they actually got to an aid station where they had a drop bag or they had crew that they needed to uh, that, that they would have needed their headlamps probably hours prior um, because uh, you don't want to be stuck on the Coconut course without a headlamp at night. Uh, <laughs> you're going to uh, have a hard way or a hard time of making it uh, if that's the case. Well, it looks like uh, Matt Feldick is back, and he is going to take the reins of the production studio, and I am going to slide over to the desk, and uh, we will and uh, we'll be having our special guest uh, coming in in probably about 30 minutes, but we're going to take a quick break here, and uh, I will be back on in just a few moments.
And uh, I'm back, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that everyone is as excited for me to be back as I am to be back. While we have just a little bit of a break in the action, I'm going to uh, let you guys watch a couple ads from our sponsors here. As we uh, are looking at the Crown King aid station, we will take a look at the commercial provided to us from our partners at Spring. They are on site making spring smoothies for the runners. So huge shout out to our friends over at Spring. This is your machine. It is strong and fast, tough beyond measure, brave beyond belief. It will take you high in the mountains, deep into the woods, over rivers and deserts, and further within yourself than you have ever dared to go. But it is only as good as the fuel you put into it. Feed it real food. Feed it real power. Feed it spring. And a huge shout out to Spring Energy there for their support. We're gonna t we're gonna take a look at a couple more commercials here as we just get things ironed out in the studio. The next one from our good friends at Gnarly. We created Gnarly Fuel 2.0 for endurance athletes or people that spend long days out in the hills. It has both sucrose and dextrose, easy to digest carbohydrates in it. 25 grams or 100 calories per 12 ounces has a full range of electrolytes, 250 milligrams of sodium, and then also chloride, potassium, magnesium, calcium. One of the things that kind of distinguishes us from other fuel products is that we have HMB, the metabolite of the branched chain amino acid leucine, which helps you recover while you're running. So it's an all-in-one fuel, electrolytes to replenish, and HMB to recover. And then, you know, if I'm making everyone in the chat endure these ad reads, I got to cap it off with everyone's favorite. So it, it, if, you, if you're uh, just tuning in, we're going to send it to our good friends at Satisfy Running with the Flota commercial. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the infamous Flota commercial. People need to understand that's a thing. That's a real thing. Well, it's about to be. Yeah. And As so of the Satisfy Ranch, uh, the Satisfy Fain Ranch aid station at mile 100, our runners will be the first to taste the delicious nectar that is Flota. All the energy of soda, none of the fizz. <laughs> uh, it's just so good, isn't it? Flat soda. Flota <laughs> makes perfect sense. <laughs> Is that well, That's where it comes from. I, I, I assume. May, it makes sense. I hadn't even really put it together yet. Chris, since I'm just uh, just getting back here. Yeah. What, uh, what have I missed? Fill me in. Um, you have missed... Uh, how much did we raise more blimp money? That's the big question. Um, I did not pay any attention to uh, the amount of blimp, blimp money raised. Uh, I believe that Finn and Brett ha were definitely on to something at that point, but I don't. Did the I don't know die. how much more blimp money was raised? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and and I don't know if I like the odds of us getting to that forty million dollar mark, but. Uh, you know, we're grateful for all of the Super Chat no, uh, donations. But, uh, but folks, everybody, thanks for joining us here on the Cocodona 250 live stream. Here we now, go. Cocodona is... After Dark reaching Super Bowl levels of commercial break. Well, they haven't seen the other fan favorite, which is the uh, Tanry or Tanri 
sunscreen commercial. Yeah, we haven't that, aired that one in a while. Yeah, we haven't aired that one in a while. <laughs> we'll add, that was a uh, crowd favorite. We'll have to wait for Rory to uh, to be here so that he can get a, a taste of the sunscreen, the infamous sunscreen commercial. Yeah, I believe that uh, Rory is uh, grabbing himself a bite to eat, and then when he is here... Uh, he will be joining us here on Airvipe After Dark. For those not familiar with Rory, uh, he is uh, known colloquially, colloquially as the Trail Gangsta. He is a uh, um, an, an, a musical artiste and uh, a, a damn fast runner as well. So uh, a member of the Airviper racing team, a teacher, a leader of men and children. And, you know uh, what I was just thinking, Chris? What? You know the collab we need that no one knew they needed? What would that be? You need a Rory Moynihan, Rob Ricardo collab. Like a rap rock thing? Yeah. I mean, Jay-Z did it with, uh, who was it? Lincoln Link Park. or Lincoln Park. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, I'm totally like, down with that. I'm just saying. Uh, did you ever, have you ever heard of the, uh, the soundtrack from the movie Judgment Night? No. Okay. So it's a movie that came out in 1993 that nobody saw. <laughs> but the, but the soundtrack is absolutely killer. It's like Ice-T and Slayer doing a collaboration, Pearl Jam and Cypress Hill doing a collaboration, um, uh, Sir Mix-a-Lot and Mud Honey doing a collaboration together, and it's just a very fun album. I could see Rob Ricardo and Rory Monahan doing something along those lines that uh, is, uh, is absolutely fantastic. Of course, Rory also hosts his own uh, um, YouTube series, Runners Rate the Bars. Yep. and uh, he's, he's done an episode with Rob Ricardo. Oh, he has. Yeah, he's done an episode with darn near everybody. Studio. He he did an episode. Uh, yeah, he's he's had pretty much every runner of note on that. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, he he had an Olympic bronze medalist on there. I mean, he had Molly Seidel on there. So uh, you know, he 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 knows people, and he knows people who knows people. Yeah, and. Uh... Huge shout out to to Rob Ricardo, the legend. During our uh, audio mishaps earlier today, I had to give old <laughs> Rob a call while he is at work, uh, and he walked me through how to fix uh, fix the audio problems we were having. So huge shout out to Rob. Gone but never forgotten, as they say. He's going to have to rejoin us uh, for the occasional uh, visit. You know, once in a while here, he can't just leave us all behind as he becomes a, uh, a successful uh, and highly sought after musician. Yeah. And for anyone who's just tuning in his song, the title or the, yeah, the title song off of last year's Cocodona 250 film uh, titled the long way home. Rob just released the kind of feature song on Spotify. His single the same name, the single dropped uh, the long way home. So, Go and check that out, again, on all streaming platforms and all that great stuff. He actually re-recorded the entire thing just so that we wouldn't get hit with any sort of uh, YouTube monetization stuff. Interesting. So, huge shout out to Rob, always going above and beyond. Uh, the man behind the inaugural Cocodona 250 live stream. Yeah. Um, so, shout out to him, still fixing our audio issues here. Legend. Yeah, Rob Ricardo has uh, been. Uh, I I think that we really have to look at him as extremely vital to the growth of live streaming in American ultra running. It's funny to think about that, but that's absolutely true. He joined, uh, you know, the organization. He joined Air Viper Running, you know, and literally was dropped into a, a live stream his first week on the job, and uh, for over a year was a part of several huge. Uh, live streaming events the inaugural heaven 100 i believe he was part of that uh of course uh, the inaugural cocodona and black canyon live streams he he has contributions that uh you know when you sit back and think about it are pretty darn huge yeah i mean he he was vital in the planning and execution of the first cocodona live stream um, he, you know, Jamil ran the race, which mean, oh. <laughs> meant Jamil also needed to train for the race. Um, and while Jamil obviously had his hand uh, in, you know, all of the things that we did, 
um, Rob was really uh, fundamental in that live stream, like even happening, uh, especially on race day. I mean, it was basically me, Rob, and Chris who commentated. And it was the mostly of uh, of that. Well, I think we only did what three and a half days at that point, uh, and then we. Yeah, I think that's all we did. It was mostly the two of you, and that's when we were still kind of learning things and uh, uh, also realizing that there comes a limit in terms of your capabilities to broadcast. It might sound like it's not that difficult to sit and talk about a, a trail race uh, for 8, 10, 12 hours, but uh, it does creep up on you over time, and uh, you can definitely tell when we're fresh, when we're in like the first hour or two of a shift, Versus hour nine, hour eleven, we get a little bit loopy. We we talk in circles, but uh, at that time we really didn't have anybody else to work with. That's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this live stream. You know, Matt. I mean, we've got uh, you know we've got you, myself, and uh, Finn and Brett kind of holding down the fort in terms of the uh, the studio. But I've got guests lined up for us uh, in uh, several option or opportunities this week. I can go through some of these guests. Tonight we've got Rory Monahan. Tomorrow morning uh, we're going to be waking up and uh, one of our special guests is going to be Allison Mercer from fastestknowndime.com. Shout out to Allison. Always greater a huge Atlanta, contributor. Greater Atlanta resident. I've known Allison since my time uh, in Atlanta, so shout out to her. Yeah, I wanted to bring Allison on because I wanted to talk to her about the link between the Cocodona 250 and FKTs because, uh, of course, the first two winners for the Cocodona 250 on the men's side were Michael Versteeg and uh, Joe Stringbean McConaughey and how they had both had FKTs on the Arizona Trail as well as other, other events or other trails. But just to see what kind of correlation there was. And, of course, Josh Perry entering the race this year as his literally his first trail race, but somebody with Pacific Crest and Arizona Trail FKTs. Well, and in the inaugural year, Jeff Garmeyer. Yeah. I think he had done a 50K maybe before yeah. doing it. And so you do see it's one of the really interesting things about the Cocodona 250, right, is you get both ends of the spectrum. You get uh, your Eric Sensemans, who have won golden tickets at prestigious races like Black Canyon. Mm -hmm. But you also then get your through hikers like Jeff Garmeyer, Josh Perry, um, and then you get a blend of the middle. You know, people like Mike Versteeg and Mike McKnight who have kind of a combination of the two, or Joe McConaughey. Yeah. Right? And so you see, like, all of these different people can have success at uh, – Cocodona, and that's one of the things that really makes it makes it interesting. It's hard to really prognosticate much, right? Because the race is so long, uh, you don't really know, um, you know what can what can happen. A lot of things can go wrong. So, yeah, I, I'm really excited to talk to her about that because of her um, knowledge in the FKT realm. I have a very minimal. Like, I can navigate their website, and I occasionally will check names that I know to see if they've got any FKTs. That's about it. Whereas, you know, as part of her role in uh, the coverage of, of racing and in the community in general, she is an expert at all things FKT. So I'm really looking forward to having her on. Uh, she's going to be calling in from uh, uh, from Atlanta to, to join us tomorrow morning, and that'll be uh, our first guest of the day. I'll have plenty of questions all I'll have plenty of questions. Absolutely. For and I think, Chris, we're actually we're trying to work out. We might be able to, um, in just a few minutes, we're going to test our guest link. Uh, so we'll be able to work out any kinks tonight. We're going to be joined by the great man himself, Ken Rubley. Oh. He's going to come on. And uh, this conversation, Ken is known as a jokester, but uh, he's just going to talk about a little bit more about his experience uh, at the aid station and then, you know, the things he has going on um, both personally and professionally there. So figured it was the least we could do. He made everyone's day. Uh, it'll be great to have Ken on for a few minutes uh, to, uh, yeah, to just chat a little bit. Yeah. Because he I, puts on a number of really incredible races too. So, And he's just a really incredible guy in general. Like I, I met him – uh, a few years ago, he was actually he hosted a post race party for Havlin 100, I believe it was 2016, and invited 
basically all the local runners who were involved with that event over to his house. And uh, he had several of the Tarahumara runners from uh, the Copper Canyons hanging out and, you know, was basically just welcoming everybody into his home. And uh, there were a couple of ceremonial events, uh, such as uh, some sage burning. Uh, and uh, Ken is really an amazing person. He gives so much to this community in terms of his energy uh, and uh, his expertise and and he just cares so much i he and his wife stephanie are amazing people i was glad to uh, uh meet him and uh you know when he was the uh race director for um for jackpot ultras uh, you know you could see his his energy and his care there and and also he still does beyond limits uh in california as well which is another uh very uh highly respected race so So yeah, we'll keep our eye peeled for the Ken Cam, and see if we can uh, see if we can pull him on. Other members of our broadcast team that will be joining us later this week. Uh, as far as the main cast, I guess to kind of differentiate, uh, Kelly uh, Tieslink will be joining us. Yep, Kelly with Girls on the Run will be joining tomorrow from nine to noon. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll be uh, getting to chat with. Kelly, um, you know, we had her on last year. Tomorrow during our first stream, we will have a direct donation link for Girls on the Run Northern Arizona. So anyone who wants to donate, you'll be able to donate directly to them in the chat. Um, you know, as someone who has two young daughters, like Girls on the Run is uh, something that's obviously super important to me. And so, um, yeah, super excited. Kelly's a super incredible runner as well and has a lot of experience out on the course. She, I think, crewed and paced Carrie Henderson last year and will be doing uh, some crewing or pacing duties uh, later on in the week as well. Awesome. So, Yeah, we, I mean, and so another uh, member of our broadcast team this week is going to be somebody who we haven't worked with before. I'm looking forward to uh, working with uh, Pedro Gomez, uh, is a local member of the Air Viper Racing Team, and uh, – uh, he's also uh, an accomplished triathlete as well. He'll be joining us. Uh, Bryce Brooks will be spending some time in the production studio, so that means we'll be dragging him onto the actual live stream over the course of the week without a doubt. Uh, rumor has it that we might have a spot for Jamil Curry himself as well as Eric Sensiman uh, to join us here. And each of them, having run this race, they can share their experiences, their expertise, and thoughts on what's happening with the 2023 iteration of Cocodona. As far as special guests, uh, I've got uh, you know a couple lined up. As I mentioned, Rory Monahan is joining me tonight. Um, and then on uh, tomorrow night, I've got uh, a friend of mine as well, uh, Pete Mortimer, uh, second place finisher in the 2021 Cocodona 250, and uh, who is going to be up atop Eldon later this week, uh, chilling and grilling for uh, the runners as they hit the high point of the course. And we are going to try to bring you footage from Camp Kippa here. We, you're you're kind of just off the Senator Highway, but it's service in this area is going to be really spotty. So we'll try to bring you uh, kind of any coverage from this area that we can. Otherwise, we're going to be hanging out at Crown King, and then we will have uh, camera feeds up and moving at um, at Whiskey Row. Uh, here in a little bit, as well as runner cams, including the fan favorite Shad Cam. Oh, the Shad Could Cam. Could you actually? We've got a pretty solid pairing in Prescott. We've got the Shad Cam, and we've got Spider Pena. Spider Pena is fantastic. He's done that shift. This is his third year. He does that shift every year. So shout out to Dan Pena. Uh, for for, a, us for an Arizona Wildcat, Spider Pena is all right. <laughs> Forks up. Um, uh, as far as other guests, uh, Karen Brown is going to be joining me on Wednesday night. Karen has run this race. She finished it last year. Uh, and she also is involved with the healthy kids running series here in Flagstaff. And we're going to talk about, uh, how they're going to be participating in the celebration of, uh, Cocodona 250 this year. You, let's just say that you might have a, uh, bunch of healthy kids, uh, lining the streets of, uh, of Flagstaff uh, on Saturday morning as the final runners approach. 
I love it. We couldn't get the beer and cheer station done at the liquor store this year, so at least we'll have kids yelling. Well, you know, it's, it's a good thing good. we. It's a good thing we probably. It's probably a good thing we only got one of those because yeah. if we start mixing <laughs> the uh, the beer and cheer with the uh, healthy kids running series, we might get into into a little bit of trouble. Uh, later on this week, I also expect to have a friend of mine, Lisa Kravitz, uh, in the studio with me. Lisa is a 2022 finisher of this race as well. And then on Friday night, uh, another person that will be joining us is Colleen Lingley. Colleen is a local runner here in Flagstaff. Uh, basically, I guess you'd call her the captain of the Air Viper Racing Team. Yeah, and yes. Uh, yeah. Man, uh, captain like slash assist- manager? Assistant manager, yeah. Okay. She... She's not uh, like an active runner or, uh-huh. yeah, an active runner on the team, but she helps Bryce, who is the team manager, uh, coordinate a lot of uh, a lot of the stuff with the team. And she's kind of an integral leader uh, of the team just because she's, she's been around on the team for a while. She's competed at a high level, both uh, collegially at Arizona State and um, on the trails. So she's got a lot of experience. She's also a registered dietitian here at um, Flagstaff Medical Center in Northern Arizona Healthcare. Um, so she's got just so many great insights, um, both from personal experience and professional experience that can translate, especially to races like this. Yeah, we had her on a couple years ago during a 100, and it was wonderful because you want to talk about somebody who not only knows how to run, but knows how to prepare on a different level than the rest of us because of her experience and expertise as a dietitian. She was able to uh, kind of walk and talk her way through uh, to us as an audience about how to best prepare for these these races when uh, nutrition is vital. When you're running, you know, ultras, especially, you know, 100 milers and 250 milers. So Colleen Lingley is somebody I'm really looking forward to having here in studio uh, due to her uh, wealth of expertise and knowledge in this realm. I know that actually during this this week, she's going to be helping out, uh, I believe, crewing. I don't know if she's pacing, but uh, with a couple of our competitors, uh, Dawn Greenwald and uh, Desiree Clark. I know that she's been involved with their preparation for this race. So, yeah, we've got uh, a lot of runners or a lot of uh, guests lined up and, uh, you know, a, a team of people that we're going to be uh, – hanging out with here during the week uh, for the Cocodona 250. So, you know, stick around. We've got uh, five days worth of coverage. We're expecting, we've kind of eyeballing it because as I mentioned earlier, we're not tied to any specific in or out time, but we expect to be on the air for give or take 90 hours this week. Yeah. And, uh, and that's going to give us a lot of time to, uh, to hang out with uh, some of our local friends and local runners, and uh, and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna share their their memories and their experiences of the Cocodona 250 and the Arizona Trail System that uh, uh, that it involves. So, uh, thanks for sticking with us here. Of course, we are just getting started. Really, we're on night one of the Cocodona 250. Gosh, don't say it, <laughs> don't say it like that, Chris. We've got. This is Monday, we've got Tuesday, then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So uh, we're going to be hanging out here all week long. Um, For those just tuning in uh, who might not be familiar, this is the Crown King aid station at mile 37, the first major portion of the course. Uh, We're going to pivot, are we going to pivot over to Kippa or? Yeah, I Lost the feed there. Okay. Just waiting on it to come back. Yeah, folks, one of so the we things... we should have our race leaders coming up to Camp Kippa here uh, in just a little bit, so... Okay. One of the things that uh, that you're going to see over the course of this race as a viewer is that <laughs> our signals are going to be in and out, and uh, we're going to do what we can in order to, uh, you know, bring as much of the race as possible to you, but... We're really at the uh, at the mercy of whatever kind of signals we can get. Is it that bright up at Camp Kippa? That seems quite bright. Well, it's moving. Interesting. So it must be. I mean, Crown King is going to be a little bit darker because it's on a static cam, so. 
True. Um, you've got to adjust the the lens and things like that, and it's tucked away in the pines a little bit more. This yeah. looks like it's pretty exposed. Yeah, Cam Kippa is a little bit more uh, prominent, whereas Crown King is literally like you're coming out of uh, in this race coming down from Lane Mountain. You're in the shadow of Lane Mountain, which is two thousand feet higher, but only about a mile and a half, two miles away. So. Of course, Dr. Stephen Crawford reminding us that cameras are smart now, and they adjust for darkness. Well, the the iPhone cameras definitely do. I don't know that our sta our static cams. I know that we still have to change lenses uh, um, to reduce the glare during the day. So um, Camp Kippa was where we had uh, mm -hmm. the first night that we were ready to sign off, and all of a sudden, as we were ready to sign off, Jamil Curry comes into our view you know having hit the 100k mark in the first iteration of the coconut 250 his creation along with anthony culpepper and uh we decided oh we're gonna stick around for a little bit longer and we talked yeah. with jamil he did that twice two nights in a row actually <laughs> um the second night was dead horse ranch and he came through there looking like he wanted nothing to do with us and it was wonderful <laughs> Gonna, I'm going to take a quick peek at the leaderboard here and uh, give you a heads up on what we know. Um, right now, as far as I can tell, Killian Korth is our men's leader. It looks like he is just shy of the 61-mile mark. Uh, 2021 winner Michael Versteeg is currently in second place at 59.8 miles. And Mike Grunwogen is in third place at mile 58 on the women's side, Sarah Ostazewski, the 2021 fifth place finisher and 2022 third place finisher, is currently running in the lead at mile 58.8. Uh, Colorado resident Mika Thews is in second at mile 56.6. But that might not be, sh it might be neck and neck with Don Greenwald as they're both showing at the same uh, same distance completed at 56.6 miles. So they could literally be right wonder, next to one another. Yeah, I wonder who pinged more recently. Hey? Dawn pinged one minute ago, and uh, Mika pinged two minutes ago. So they're... Uh, yeah, they're pretty close. Yeah, I, I'm assuming they've got eyes on one another at this point. Uh, and uh, fourth place woman, Eliza LaPierre, uh, has been moving up and is really is only about a half mile back from them as well in fourth place so obviously it is still so so early they're less than a quarter of the way done with this race the lead oh, runners are less than a quarter of the way done with this race we do have i'm going to take that off real quick we do have ken rubley ready to go as you just saw momentarily on your screen there all right so we are going to yeah i'm actually going to i'll stay here and talk so I'll pull you on here, Chris. Okay. Then let's pull Ken in here. And let me just check some audio here. And we lost that, so we'll go here. Um, yeah, Ken, you'll have to bear with me for one minute here. Well, they don't need to see me. They can see Ken. That should be fine. <laughs> as long as they can hear me, that's okay. And thank you very much for uh, those who have been sticking around. Uh, I have to say, uh, I have been absolutely blown away by the size of our audience today. Uh, we've had a, a very... Uh, large following, larger than uh, larger than we've had in the past, uh, and uh, y'all have been sticking around. I'm grateful for it. Uh, the night gets a little bit tricky when we're covering this race because we're a little bit limited in terms of what shots we can bring. Drones are not something that we can do uh, when it comes to uh, the coverage at night here uh, for the Cocodona 250. So we just kind of have to wing it with. Uh, 
follow cams if we've got some on the ground, otherwise static cams at various aid stations. And uh, the one thing that is nice, though, is that uh, here at the Crown King aid station, as seen here, uh, the cutoff is not for another four hours and 54 minutes. So uh, at 11.55, all runners that wish to continue in the Cocodona 250 have to have left uh, left Crown King by this point. Um, I'm going to zoom out on my tracker and see if it looks like there are a lot of people in danger of missing that cutoff. Um, let's see, that is... If it happens at mile 33. Yeah, so there, I mean, there's a few runners that still haven't yet hit Crown King. A, a, a decent number. Um... There are a lot of them that are in and around the Crown King area, but uh, maybe about 35 or 40 runners have yet to reach Crown King at this point, according to my runner tracking. I hope to see all of them make it there. It looks like the back of the pack right now is around mile 27, give or take maybe mile 26. So we'll see uh, the sweepers are at mile 25. That gives these back runners about four hours to go just under, I'm sorry, uh, just under five hours to go about 11 miles. So if they keep moving, they should get there. Um, it is a, a climb to get to Crown King, or actually to get to Lane Mountain, and then there's a descent into Crown King. Uh, but uh, as long as they keep moving, they'll make it. All right, and we are going to see if we can bring in Ken Rubley here. Ken, are you able to talk into your microphone here in just one second? Uh, Ken, are you yeah, there? You I think we have audio on Ken. Can you I hear me? I personally have audio on Ken. Oh, man, I haven't been able to talk to Chris all day. I didn't even know he was on before. Let us know in the chat if you can hear Ken. But I'm can seeing I can, audio I, levels here. I so can. should be okay. Can, you can't hear him still, I right? cannot hear Ken. I can hear you. I can hear you. Ken, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Awesome, Ken. Well, we are unable to hear you, but I believe the live chat can. Once I confirm that, we will uh, we'll let you talk, and then I uh, I'll ask you any questions that I might have for you. And as you know, um, I will definitely ask the hard hitting questions. I know you can't see me, Ken. I'm kind of off to the side here, but um, yeah. So, Ken. Well, first off, before I let you before I let you start talking and and going into things, thank you so much for you know being out at this super remote aid station today, um, driving your jeep, hauling all that stuff out there, and then making everyone's day absolutely uh, better with the the frozen grapes, all the entertainment, um, all of that stuff. So maybe we'll kick things off. Uh, you know, what did you kind of see out there? Uh, at that mile 11 aid station and um, yeah, what kind of takeaways do you have from uh, being out there? Yeah, sure. Well, first watching the current aid station, I have zero desire to ever run that station. That gives me like PTSD of running, run, directing one of our races. But uh, so, yeah, so, you know, er everyone saw, you know, the humor that was going on out there, but um there is real seriousness behind what the character I guess I was playing, you know, growing up out here in Arizona and until I broke my tape, seven and a half year taper um, two weeks ago, you know, I used to run a lot in heat and heat scares me. Um, matter of fact, um, jackpot, um, right after the pandemic, we were late April, it was going to be like mid nineties and I didn't think anyone was going to come. And then, you know, Zach Bitter, Pat Reed and all these people are coming. And it's a little loop and we can see everyone, you know, you, and not even just the pros, but, you know, all the East Coast runners who love to come to Vegas and President's Weekend, you know, old casino guy, that's the most popular weekend. 
So I was so concerned about heat at that race. I had showers, ice towels, swamp coolers, and I could see the runners the whole time. So I knew exactly how hard the section was following them seeing, seeing me and Bill and I at mile 11. And uh, I was deathly afraid of people blowing me off and, and continuing to go. Cause let's face it, you're running 250 miles. You're, you're feeling, you should be feeling pretty decent still at mile 11, you know, at eight in the morning. And uh, you know, it was, it was it, the pros were no problem in the beginning, you know, two would come in at a time and they patiently went through their routine of what they needed to do. Um, and of course I tried pushing grapes on them cause why not? It's extra. But the challenge was when like six or eight people would come in, um, you could tell people would get a little antsy waiting to get to the water jugs, right? And then every now and then you'd see someone hesitate and, and start to leave. And I'm like, no, 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 stay, stay, stay. And the goal was to not let a single person leave without topping off their water. As a matter of fact, when everyone went to fill up their bottle, I'd be like, hey, chug that whole thing right now. We actually have two liters for you. And um, I think we ended up with only four or five runners that didn't stop. And what you didn't see on camera was I stepped aside and I'd say, Hey buddy, come back. I want to top off your water and it kind of blowing me off. I, you know, it only happened once. No, I'm good. And you know, in a serious voice, I'm like, buddy, I don't want to be up there, you know, driving my Jeep for two hours, 15 miles up the road to pick you up and bring you back to the start. So, um, our goal was one, we wanted people to smile when they left because I think I called it character building miles. And then under my breath to certain people, I'd be like, seriously, this is the hardest 20 miles you're probably going to ever run in the desert. So please go slow and take it seriously. So, you know, you probably addition to making people smile. There was an absolute effort to really, really, really convince people to take more water because uh, I, I was definitely afraid, you know, and a couple people, we really took them aside and had you know, I'm a 53 year old dad, like, come on, man, don't let me be the dad here and like not let you go anywhere. But, uh, you know, I just wanted people to know that, you know, the, the humor is fun and all, but there was real deliberate things we were trying to do. And, and that was to get people to really, really respect how hard the course was going to be. Um, and not, you don't want to scare them, but to an extent, you kind of want to scare them. Like, come on, this is it, you know, have fun later. Like, don't, don't go now. And, and it's a re you could tell with the really, you know, not maybe not the top, you know, 12 runners, but, you know, those those middle of the pack, really in shape runners were so tempted just to get giddy and keep going. And so that was a big goal of ours was to uh, to really keep people from going too hard. So, you know, I haven't seen what happened. I know there's a little carnage after us, but, you know, I don't know. Hopefully it wasn't too bad. Yeah. Awesome. Ken. Um, and l like you said, just to reiterate, you know, you, you were doing such an excellent job of, uh, you know, being out there and keeping it fun and entertaining, but also, you know, making sure that, you know, like the, the first role of anyone working in aid station is runner safety, right? And you want to keep people moving forward, um, as happy and healthily as they can. And so, you know, we love that you were out there and that you were, you know, really able to, um, to kind of blend the two things. And, you know, one thing that, that I'll say just having been, you know, around some of your races now from the outside looking in is that's kind of the experience you get at a lot of Ken's races are you get a lot of fun and you get a lot of games, but you also, you know, get, um, really great race experiences for, for people of all levels. So, um, yeah, like I said, I, I appreciate you Ken. And if you have any more, uh, anything else you want to, you want to say, well, uh, about, you know, beyond limits and some of the things you're working on there, some of your personal stuff, we'll let yeah. you, uh, kind of get that off, especially as we try to get these camera feeds back up at, uh, camp Kippa here. Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm going to selfishly say what beyond limits is about. I, I know a lot of people know, but you know, my wife, Stephanie, who's, you know, co-founder and owner and does a whole lot more than I do. You know, I do the fun stuff. She does the hard stuff. But, you know, 12 years ago, got a kidney pancreas transplant right smack in the middle of an ultra race I was running. And uh, we started our little company to give back and, and, and teach people that you can teach your mind and body to really go beyond your perceived limits. For her, it was to stay alive. 
Um, and obviously you don't want to push yourself to where, you know, you're, you're going to do harm. But, uh, you know, the, the funny story is, uh, you know, I'd never run a mile in my life when I was 39 and, and she was my girlfriend. And when she started dialysis, I said, Hey, look, I'm going to learn to, I'll suffer with you. I'm going to run while you do dialysis. And, you know, as you guys probably know, I know now dialysis is four hours. So before you know it, you know, I was getting through those grueling, you know, when you start running, it sucks. But before I knew it, you know, I was running okay. And so she was on dialysis two years and, you know, like a lot of people, I'm type A, I was like all in to ultra running once I kind of got over that hump of, you know, what it's like to run back to back 20 miles and stuff. And so it was our life for a few years. And then, you know, she was two years on dialysis. And at that point, grimly so like, okay, I might die. Like the transplants might not come and she needed a kidney and a pancreas. And she just had a big surgery four days before my labor of love, hundred miler. And sure enough, she's working the aid station mile 50. My buddy drives up. I'm at mile 49 and says kidney pancreas waiting in Arizona. We rush to the airport, best DNF ever. You know, she got her transplant. And so, you know, her second chance at life, she's like, Hey, you know what? Let's start a little, you know, let's put on an ultra race for my anniversary of my transplant to one, celebrate second chances at life, but get back to the ultra world because it played a big difference in our life. You know, so fast forward the last, you know, almost 12 years, you know, thousands of people have benefited from her inspiration. As a matter of fact, at Jackpot three years ago, she goes into the hospital the night before Jackpot, which was terrifying. You know, it's 32 hours to the race. I'm staring at a U-Haul that's not unpacked. You know, 400 people are showing up from all around the world. I got a 16 page shopping list and I, you know, I'm a New Yorker. I buy pop tarts. And so, you know, it was terrifying and like anything else, you know, the race came together, the community rallied around us, perfect strangers. I was handing fistfuls of cash so they could go buy stuff. And, uh, you know, it was one of those things. I don't think any runner really dropped that race because everyone knew they were running for Steph because Steph couldn't quit. You know, I mean, she, she was potentially going to die. And uh, not that we were pushing that on people, but, you know, my buddy had bad chafe. You know, I'm like, you know what? You call Steph in the hospital and you tell her you're dropping. And he's like, I'm going to keep going. Um, and the cool part is the very last day of the race, she came out and we got her to the finish line. She insisted on sitting there and giving out a few buckles. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, she's that kind of inspiring. And unfortunately, her kidney's failing now, um, which is not uncommon. It's been 12 years. Um, it should have failed almost a year ago. So we've been on kind of borrowed time and, you know, selfishly, um, we're going to lean on the ultra community to kind of help find her, you know, a living donor. Um, she, she could not live long enough to wait for a deceased donor. And, you know, our thing is, gosh, look what she did with her second chance at life. What, what's she going to do on her third chance? So, um, you know, so it's that what we bring into the race and she wanted to be there today. And uh, you tried telling your wife, no, it was really difficult. But, you know, I bought a sat phone just in case, to, you know, going out there with her. And at the end of the day, we just didn't feel comfortable. But um, I only bring that up because, um, the, the, you know, your body and mind can do so much more than you think as long as you put in the work. Right. And uh, so we try to push people to do everything they can is if they put in the work. Right. So. By the way, my challenge today was, how do I inspire people at mile 11? I'm trying to put out inspirational signs. I'm like, no one's really hurting at 11 miles. But, you know, we put out signs like, um, you know, running is a gift that some people can never do. Run for them, you know. So, um, you know, that's one of the, you know, selfish reasons, you know, why I wanted to be out there today was to, you know, um, keep us around the little ultra world. You know, we sold jackpot to the Curry family, which we can't wait. And so that goes to, so I'm breaking, I broke my seven and a half year taper at our blue race beyond limits ultra two weeks ago. I ran two miles. It was horrific. I was running, walking, running, walking. I waited until the third day so I could pass everybody. So I, I, you know, I'd go past, you know, the gesture and tap my rear and go get used to seeing this buddy. And, um, the reality is, um, you know, I haven't run because running for me is what I'm going to do when she's on dialysis, which is going to come. And um, it's kind of like my morphine for pain. Like I do it when I know life's going to get really hard. So I'm kind of getting a jump on it. So I am registered for the jackpot 100 miler, the regular course, because I like running on the gravel. Um, 
and there's zero chance I'm going to embarrass myself at a, at a race that, you know, the two of us created. And the whole goal of that is because at our blue race, which is on the anniversary of our transplant, you know, I want to buckle and I want to buckle to the best of my ability. So selfishly, I wanted to let people know, you know, there's some seriousness behind us. We have a lot of fun, but when we're pushing people, um, you know, we're, we say in life, you know, don't think about the totality of how hard life is, how hard 250 miles is. Just get to the next aid station. And that's how she goes about life. You don't think about the totality of trying to stay alive and get a kidney. It's like let, the next aid station is getting our marketing campaign ready and stuff like that. So, you know, we try to tell people, take what you learn from ultra running. And again, I can't imagine the totality of running 250 miles, um, although it's intriguing. Um, but, uh, you know, just get to the next aid station in life. So that's, you know, we want to encourage people to keep pushing what they're doing and keep it simple. Just get to the next aid station. And then before you know it, you're going to hit your goals. So thank you for letting me, you know, talk on behalf of my wife. She's probably going to kill me when she knows I did this. But, uh, you know, I appreciate you letting me share her story and, uh, you know, and uh, how special it's going to be when she gets her transplant. And, uh, you know, she, she ran her first ultra 50 K 90 days after her, her kidney yeah. pancreas 12 years ago. So it'll be fun when she gets a transplant and then her and I can run together. So thanks for letting me share that. Well, again, Ken, like I said, we, you know, we appreciate you being out there so much Yeah, and uh, we appreciate everything you've done. Uh, you know, for the community for such a long time. And we're not going to let you off the hook. You're going to have to come back next year. We might need you to come for like a Monday. And then we may need you to come back on like Friday <laughs> later in the race uh, or something like that so that we can, you know, really, uh, really get the runners going. So we'll have to see yeah, what we can do. You know, the only problem with that is the way I'm wired, assuming that I don't embarrass myself at jackpot in blue, I'm going to be kind of toned up coming into Cocodona. So <laughs> um, it, it's a different Ken when the bib goes on, but uh, no, we, we can't wait to, to help again. And uh, you know, our, our life's slowing down a little bit, fortunate to be entrepreneurial investors, but I uh, can't wait to do a little more with Air Vipa. Um, I kind of enjoyed doing the uh, very easy aid station. I want nothing to do with the current aid station, uh, but it was a lot of fun. And we look forward to getting out to a lot more uh, of Vera Vipa's races and uh, hanging out with you guys. And uh, hey, Chris, sorry I didn't talk to you today. I, could, I didn't know you were there. I'm going to have my headphones next time. So I love it. Well, thank you so thank much, you, Ken. Ken. We appreciate your time. Always and, a pleasure. Uh, we'll stay in touch, buddy. All right, fellas. Thank you. Have fun the rest of the week and get some sleep. Thanks. Ken is truly one of a kind. He's such an amazing guy. Like, like I said, I had met him several years ago, but I didn't realize I met him. And then I got to spend a lot more time with him at, at uh, jackpot in, uh, uh, 2022 and boy, oh boy, uh, he can throw a party and he, he's just such a positive bringer of energy, uh, at jackpot last year. You know, the, the thing that sticks to me, out to me the most is him riding around in his uh, uh, most Vegas suit ever on a bicycle. Um, and he's handing out ice cream bars and ice cream and popsicles <laughs> to people on course. Classic, classic. And we are, we do have our feeds back up at Camp Kippa. This feed from Courtney is pretty good. We did have our race leader come through. Uh, while our feeds were frozen. So we did have a shot of him still uh, in the aid station, um, but it was Mr. Korth. So he did come through literally just about two minutes ago as we were trying to uh, troubleshoot those links while we, uh, while we chatted with Ken. So uh, Killian Korth has come through this aid station. Versteeg what didn't look like on the tracker like he was too far behind no yeah we would expect to see michael versteeg here fairly quickly um yeah. and if courtney can hear us if she can hang out in this spot her feet is really good here so uh this will give us again a good shot as runners come kind of down towards the camp kippa is, aid station here. Is that snow? 
Uh, how high is Camp, Camp Kip? Is pretty high in elevation. It's not. So not yeah, surprised. but I was a top Eldon, and it wasn't that. Sn- like it depends on what side, right? That's I true. I guess it could be the in the shade side. right there. Like it might not get much direct sunlight, but that looks like snow. I don't know. If Courtney can hear us, if that's snow, if she can give her camera like a thumbs up, that would be awesome. If it's not, you can give us a thumbs down. Uh, it's snow. We got a thumbs up. Oh baby. my! This is great. That that actually is very. I'm not surprised that run. I mean, obviously that's not on the trail. It's just yeah. over on the side there. But I'm not that surprised because some of the high country we got such a such a big snow. That's a good point. Here that um. And if it's if it's shaded enough and it only gets a, you know a short time of of direct sunlight each day then yeah i guess you could see that and uh you know i'm grateful that we're getting any sort of uh images from camp kippa because if you look at camp kippa on a map it is in the middle of nowhere it is really it's you know miles away from everything um and uh you know at least crown king has infrastructure i mean camp kippa is just it's pretty out there it's uh it's pretty uh um, pretty isolated. I guess technically, uh, according to the Postal Service, it's technically Prescott. It's about 14 miles south of uh, of Whiskey Row, uh, if you're going in a straight line on the road. But, of course, our runners are not following straight lines on the road. They are following the trail system <laughs> and uh, Forest Service roads as they uh, run the Coconut 2023 Yeah, Camp Kippa, for those that are not familiar, is uh, basically just a shade past 100K into the race and also houses the first sleep station uh, in uh, the Cocodona 250. Uh, there are sleep stations at Camp Kippa at mile 63, mile 62.9, uh, at Friendly Pines at mile 71, and at Whiskey Row at mile 78. Uh, from there... Um, I would assume that runners are going to be uh, using leveraging one of those sleep stations because uh, the next uh, sleep station is at Mingus Mountain at mile 110, and uh, that's a, a significant haul from uh, from Whiskey Row. Although some runners, I remember uh, last year, some of the runners who have full uh, you know van setups and everything. You know, don't actually leverage the sleep stations themselves, but they do take it as a moment where, okay, it's time to go to sleep. We are uh, keeping an eye out for our next runner to come into Camp and Kippa at Miles. I believe we're going to see him soon. I've got another camera feed that's a little bit up trail. Okay. But it is, uh, it's freezing um, just because it is pretty remote up there. But that, that does look Versteeg. like Michael Versteeg. Um, and so we'll. Make sure that we get our uh, our feed from Courtney as he uh, as he comes closer here. Who's our follow cam on uh, Versteeg this is right Brent, now? Brent uh, out at Camp Kippa. So he and Courtney are uh, our tag team in the Camp Kippa aid station. They've been uh, working with me to troubleshoot some of these camera feeds, and they're doing an so awesome job. This like this is out there, and they don't have Starlink or anything like that. So yeah. they're just out there. On uh, cell phones, we were hoping, and we may still have a drone going out there. Uh, had a little tire problem, uh, mm-hmm. as you uh, as you could expect on some of these roads. So he was a bit delayed. But if he's still able to get out there and fly, there we on can, the here light, he comes. It's be about a half here he hour, comes. But he's right there. There is uh, Mr. Floda himself. 2021 winner and current second place male Michael Versteeg hitting uh, Camp Kippa at uh, just under, uh, I guess at about 14 hours, 25 minutes, uh, give or take. Uh, Camp Kippa at just past the 100K mark. And we're going to keep Courtney right here, uh, kind of stationary at this spot, just so, just so that we know this feed uh, stays good. If Brent wants to go into the aid station, we can see if his feed cleans up at all. Uh, but we'll keep Courtney kind of on the steps here so that we have at least one 
a pretty decent feed from Camp Kippa. That's magic right there, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, I want to ans- answer a gonna... question that uh, Connor in the chat brought up, asking uh, what the winning time or winning Camp Kippa split was last year. And uh, there's an interesting, interesting answer to that for those not familiar with the race. We didn't have a Camp Kippa last year. Yep, that's uh, correct. Uh, we had a course that was altered due to wildfires uh, in the uh, – uh, Prescott National Forest and south of uh, Prescott. So uh, the course was altered s- significantly. The racers actually started in Prescott, basically did a modified version of the circle trail that surrounds the city of, the, of Prescott and uh, started from there and continued upward. That's one of the reasons why a lot of people consider the 2022 version of Cocodona to not quite have the same uh, punch in the face that the uh, the original course does because you don't start out with a 10,000 foot climb in uh, the desert heat. Well, it was, it was different, right? The, the counter to that would be that you had to try and run most of the 250 miles. Well, you didn't have to, Yeah. but like most of the 250 miles was then runnable. Yeah. Um, and so that presents maybe its own unique challenges. Um, I think we had, what was it? A noon, a 10 AM or a noon start. It was noon. Um, you know, so, Starting a little bit later, you didn't have the extreme heat, but I do think it. No, it was ten a.m. You're right. I think it presented its own kind of unique set of unique set of challenges, but in many respects, this course this course is slower. I would say that, you know, more difficult in certain ways probably, but um, slower I think is a is a fair assessment. I wouldn't expect to see. You can see our friend Andy Jones Wilkins holding court in the uh, center of the Crown King Saloon uh, yard. Uh, it's so great to have him up there as a resource for these runners, not only helping them with uh, uh, getting ready to uh, you know, uh, grab their drop bags and uh, head out onto the course again, but uh, talking about a guy with a wealth, wealth of experience. I don't care if AJW has never run a 200 himself. That man knows running. He does. Also, <laughs> just... Of all the places AJW could have uh, could have volunteered, he vol- he's a big Crown King fan, isn't he? Yeah. Well, so he didn't act during the Crown King scramble. He volunteered out on the course, but he never made his way up to Crown ah. King because uh, I think that he didn't realize that the road was basically washed out to any sort of motor vehicles, uh, and uh, only people who were heading up to Crown King on foot could make it there. Yeah. And but we do uh, yeah, have Courtney's feed back up. So we've got a shot, the aid station just inside there. This reminds me of the shot from... Is that uh, different than the inaugural year? Yeah. Right? Because the inaugural year, everything was more was outside. sitting outside a campfire. A campfire, yeah. right? So this reminds me a little bit of the uh, Fort Tuttle shot that we had of Dax Hawk when he went into the, uh, the, the, the quiet room to go and grab a little bit of a nap where we were kind of like waiting outside the door to see... Uh, when he would emerge and uh, what condition he was in. Of course, uh, Dax came out of the uh, uh, out of that uh, small room after getting a short rest and uh, being the uh, the ballroom dancer, he has offered a little shimmy on on camera for us. I don't think we're going to get a little shimmy on camera from Verstig as he emerges from this door. No, but I think no, probably not from this door. But if Verstig has a big finish, I'm just hoping we can get. You know, a Flota chug out of a beer bong at the finish line. That's all I want in my life out of Michael Versteeg. <laughs> uh, Flota is definitely making an impact uh, here at the Cocodona 2250 uh, here in 2023. Like, that commercial is just excellent. Absolutely. What it's have we got? Excellent commercial that, uh, as I said before, you didn't have to know who Michael Versteeg was to enjoy that that spot but the fact that you knew who he was made it even funnier here he comes and camera feed is getting just a little choppy there and again camp kippa is uh very remote it, it's very it's very remote so the fact that we're able to get anything out here again without uh starlink being being out there is is great so and actually, it's, what's funny to mention this, Cindy, uh, since this year is more difficult than last year, they have a longer cutoff time this year. They actually get less. No, well, right? that's because they had longer, they had the normal cutoffs last year on a typically quicker course. Yeah. You know, so I think they had, 
I think maybe in, I don't remember if it was 125 hours. I want to say that it might have been 120. They had 122 last year. 122, I think. right? Yeah, because yeah, it was a noon finish, uh, right? Wait, no. And this year, no. This actually, they do get three more hours this year. Yes. Yeah, uh, my yeah. number, the the whole on air math thing is not a good idea. And yeah, I'm an I think accountant. Last year they got less, but <laughs> this year it's back to like what the normal was everything got kind of thrown out of whack last year because the um start time was different right? yeah because i think the finish cutoff was noon on saturday versus 10 today but it started five hours later so that would make sense so it's a three hour difference right i think i don't know let's see Love this feed with Brent as Versteeg is hiking out again. It's going to be a little bit choppy and laggy here, but we do have Versteeg kind of hiking back out of the Cocodona 250 aid station, and it just goes it just goes to really show you that you know Michael Versteeg has won a lot of really big races. He's won. He's finished high at a number of really big races. He's won the Cocodona 250. And even someone as talented as Michael Versteeg is, you know, hiking a little bit here. So yeah. I think it just goes to show how important, uh, you know, having a good power hike is and implementing that into your routine. This this terrain is rugged. Uh, it's slow moving. It's unrelenting. And, you know, you're going to see even some of the some of the best runners um, out there are going to have their rough patches and are going to be. Um, taking it easy. So I think that's just a really awesome showcase. You know, even last year, there were times where we saw string bean hiking, you know, because that's part of a 250 mile race. Yeah. I, and I think that part of what I'm curious to see about this year is uh, whether or not Versteeg approaches uh, things a little bit differently because last year's race was not a banner year for him. Of course, uh, he had to withdraw at uh, Whiskey Row. Uh, due to uh, some back concerns. And uh, I wonder if he's uh, approaching things a little bit differently this time around. But uh... hey, do you have the yeah, ability to got... pull up the iPad? This is one of my favorite shots of Michael Versteeg. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Have you ever seen this? <laughs> I have. <laughs> so this is – can you can you just uh, give us – this is a Suns pregame show. Yeah. Right? Live. And Versteeg is standing in the background of uh of the Suns pregame show and uh <laughs> and just uh being uh You know what my favorite part <laughs> being is Michael though? Versteeg. My favorite part is him looking at some monitor, trying to figure out which <laughs> way <laughs> to tilt the finger. He's Look at me right here. He's oh, trying to figure oh. out the right angle. <laughs> Uh, but I love that. I thought that was fantastic for those that hadn't seen it. That it's was uh, great. That is Michael Versteeg in a nutshell, right there. Uh, oh, that was that was excellent. How old is Versteeg? He's thirty-seven. I think everybody thinks because he's got this big beard that he's older than he is. It's he's not an old guy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean he's uh, yeah he's not old. And we got someone asking about a Starling sponsorship. We actually have plenty of or not plenty we can always use more starlinks if anyone wants to lend this one for a live stream ever uh, yeah we have starlinks on the course we're leveraging the technology we were meant to have a starlink here with our drone pilot um and he just hasn't gotten to the aid station yet because he uh suffered a little bit of a tire issue Uh. on the way there so he got delayed uh a little bit trying to get there so but yes starlink sponsorship all for it why not yeah yeah, somebody. Why not? If somebody wants to, I mean, you know, uh, whenever we've done coverage, ever since that technology was a was available to us, we've leveraged it. Yeah, so I think one thing that's super interesting that like even I forget about because <laughs> when you do just a number of live streams every year, like things tend to feel longer apart than they are. Yeah, we got Starlink after Cocodona last year. Mm-hmm. You know, we got our Starlink, I believe, uh, the week before Western States uh, happened. So, you know, Starlink is less than a year old 
uh, at this point, and uh, you know it's steadily improving the um, the uh, you know capabilities that we have for bringing coverage, and hopefully the satellite technology continues to improve. Hopefully, Starlink phone becomes a thing still. It sounds like that's getting close to the finish line as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of the biggest limitations in U.S. ultra running in a lot of ways is permit issues with, uh, like, filming or drone restraints, but also just, like, connectivity. It's, yeah. it's a lot more of a challenge here than it is in a lot of European towns where they have... The infrastructure you know, is much the better. The infrastructure is quite a bit better in these mountain towns. So hopefully, you know, the technology continues to improve and we keep innovating and finding ways to to make it work. Because, like, that's the most important thing is, like, uh, just because it's hard doesn't mean you shouldn't figure out a way to do it necessarily, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's not uh, – it might not be worth it, but – um, the early days of our live streams uh, consisted of Jamil pointing a camera at a computer to to broadcast it out to YouTube. So I mean, I, I, I know what you're pointing at, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we we've we've grown along with the technology that's been afforded to us. And we've got the man, the myth, the legend in the chat, the guy who saved everyone's viewing experience for the day. Yeah, Rob Ricardo. Popping into the chat. I think everyone should drop whatever your favorite. Uh, can we drop like guitar emojis in the chat for Rob? Yes. Uh, if if you weren't tuned in earlier, we were having audio issues that I couldn't figure out on my own. And Jamil was in the middle of the desert trying to make his way back to civilization and didn't have cell service. So I called Mr. Reliable, old Rob Ricardo, while he was while he's at work. And thankfully, he uh, he helped me solve the issue. And so now we have great audio, uh, courtesy of Rob Ricardo. And again, his new single, The Long Way Home, which is titled after uh, last year's Cocodona 250 film featuring Eric Sensman, is out on Spotify and uh, I believe your other streaming platforms, but um, definitely go and check it out. It's one that I've had on repeat nonstop uh, it's just like a, it, it reminds me that song as I listen to it makes me think of like climbing Mount Eldon and descending Eldon lookout road in the dark, like by headlamp and under the canopy of stars. Absolutely. Like, that's and that's the vibe what, I get. So shout out to Robbo. That's the beautiful thing about have, uh, being fortunate enough to have Rob score multiple, uh, films that have been produced, uh, by, uh, Air Vipa and filmmakers such as Dylan Harris is that, uh, you get whenever you hear his songs. If you've watched it, the movies, like you, you start to feel like. For me, that moment is the the shot of Mingus Mountain in the Cocodona inaugural year, where you just hear Rob's, you know, voice and you know his guitar and uh, and you hear the bell ringing in the background, and it's just such a, a wonderful uh, merging of music and uh and visuals so uh yeah if you've not heard uh rob ricardo's stuff you definitely need to check it out uh his uh, his music is available on uh, spotify youtube uh basically wherever you would listen to streaming music chris after dark an iconic uh uh live chat name saying shout out to rob and matt for the first annual coca 255 live stream 250 Chris was uh, was pretty vital in that as well. Coming in after work, <laughs> typically bringing pizza, um, but that was that was an experience. You know, we again we only did about three, a little over three days, three maybe three and a half days, but it was like there 18, were only three 19, of us. 19, 20 days, twenty hour days. Rob and I were going from you know the crack of dawn uh, until Chris showed up to to relieve us. So uh, yeah, don't leave a. Uh, don't leave Chris out of that, but that was definitely an experience. And again, Rob was uh, integral in uh, helping bring that coverage uh, to life. And so now Rob's probably going to like exit the live chat and, and hope that no one knows he's still there, but hopefully he's still <laughs> tuning in. Yeah, Rob is, uh, like I said before, Rob has been uh, instrumental and integral to the growth of live streaming uh, trail and ultra running in America, uh, whether it be the Era Viper races that he was uh working with or you know the year that you guys did six days of the dome you know i mean that was so important 
Dude, six days in the dome. No, we've really gotten into the Era Vibe After Dark segment here when we start uh, going into six days in the dome. <laughs> what a what an event to live stream. Jamil flew out with all the camera equipment by himself <laughs> because Nick was running and set up all the cameras. And Rob and I commentated from the studio here. And at one point, I think we were commentating just as much of the youth hockey game that was going on on the infield because that like an ice uh, like complex um, as we were the uh, the actual race. But yeah, shout out again. Shout out to Rob. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, uh, this shot right here is of uh, the Crown King Saloon. As you can see, it's getting a little bit dark, which means it is Era Vipa after dark. Uh, my name is Chris Warden. Uh, Matt Feldake is uh, here with me now. Uh, he is basically the man of pulling the levers and pushing the buttons, making sure that uh, everything sounds at least acceptable. Yeah, and I didn't hear any complaints when I came back on, So, and I didn't get any text messages. So that means Chris, while producing the show, must have done a pretty good job. So we'll have to, we'll have to show Chris some love uh, in the chat for taking over for the first time on his own. Having- he took the training wheels <laughs> off, and he pedaled that bike right down the road. Having been a radio producer in the past, the one thing that you know is that the less people that know your name, the better. <laughs> if they know your name, then there's a possibility that what you're doing is probably not uh, endearing yourself to everybody. Yeah, so uh, you can see uh, um, they've turned the lights on in the yard. I kind of like that visual, that that color palette right there. It's uh, Hopefully it's not too hard for you to see uh, at home. We've got a couple of monitors. On our smaller monitor, it, it comes through crystal clear. On our larger one, it's uh, it's still visible. Um, I, I just, uh, as I mentioned before, the runners have between now and uh, 11.55 p.m. local time tonight, so just over four hours and 12 minutes uh, to make their way uh, not only into the Crown King aid station, they but they've got to leave, leave the aid station by then. That's correct. And uh, and at that point, uh, they'll be able to continue their journey. And from the looks of things, I took a peek at the running tr- runner tracker uh, to see if we had anybody who might be in danger of potentially not making that cutoff. But by and large, from what I can tell, anybody who's on the course uh, has at least a solid shot. I believe that our, uh, our, our final runner is actually Brett Barker right now of Gilbert, Arizona. I actually met Brett yesterday uh, as he was uh, packing his stuff on the shuttle uh, uh, here in Flagstaff. Um, and this is his first uh, Coca Dona and first, uh, I believe it's his first race longer than 100K. And uh, he is at currently at mile 26.8. So he's got about 10 miles to go and just over four hours to do it. And this section, like once you've actually gotten up to Lane Mountain, it is it's runnable. Like you can run down from Lane Mountain to Crown King at even if you're not a fast runner at a at a 12 you know, 11 minute mile pace to, to get you in and, and, and make sure that you fade the cutoff, uh, getting up to lane mountain is the hard part, but, uh, I'd like to think that, uh, uh, that, uh, Brett, uh, Brett Barker, Stephanie Mitchell, and, uh, uh, there's a couple other runners who haven't quite hit the mile 30 mark, uh, Shiona Creer, uh, Jamila Abdul, Rahim Muhajid, uh, Natalie Bickers, Victoria Allen, and Jim Logan. Uh, those are the runners that are currently uh, going to be chasing the cutoff at this point uh, as we approach uh, the um, the first cutoff. Now, the nice thing for the runners, Matt, is that after this, they don't fade another cutoff for another 17 hours. The next cutoff that they have to catch is at Friendly Pines at 5 p.m. tomorrow at mile 71. Yep. They can recompose themselves uh, after they can get in and out of Crown King. Now, now the trick with that is that once you leave Crown King, you've got a 16-mile stretch that you're having to undertake starting at midnight. (laughs) Well, Andrew, like, again, you're higher up than the Sonoran Desert. You're not necessarily super high altitude, but it's going to be cooler. Yeah, Crown King is itself is about 6,200 feet, I believe, give or take. 
Um, yeah, that sounds about right around 6,000, give yeah. or take a couple hundred feet sounds about right. Well, and it's a pretty hilly town, so yeah. it could be, a, you know, depending on what you're standing there. But, um, but yeah, it, it it's possible for a runner to continue if they cut it close here. It's just going to be a tall order for them to uh, get themselves together. They have, uh, after they leave Crown King, another you know, 16 uh, miles to Arasta Creek, and then Camp Kippa is another uh, 10 after that. Dude, I just noticed this. We've got people uh, in the chat quoting Rob Ricardo lyrics. Interesting. Classic. Uh, did you see, see I, I, I haven't seen this name in a while. Browning and Mortimer's Cow <laughs> has entered the chat. <laughs> uh, did uh, they change that's their name? That's actually one of the best things about um, <laughs> Cocodona is you get some of the greatest chat names. Yes. You know? Browning and Mortimer's Cow, for those uh, unfamiliar, uh, this, what was the story? It was that Pete Mortimer and Jeff Browning literally bought a cow yeah, they to share. share. A cow. And they both live in, like, Browning lives in Flagstaff. And they're both very uh, high protein diet guys. Yep. And so they decided to buy and split a cow, and apparently the cow got lost somewhere <laughs> in the, grazing the fields. <laughs> That was my understanding of it, anyway. So uh, it's glad to see. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see Browning and Mortimer's cow has uh, well, and reemerged. Will be on the live stream tomorrow night, right? So oh. maybe, maybe if he has to stand up and leave in the middle of the show because he sees that uh, Browning and Mortimer's cow is well, no, I think that that's where we can get you know the real pressing questions from. Did you uh, ever Browning get and the Mort- cow? Did you ever get like? Did you ever find me, Dad? Like that's what <laughs> Browning and Mortimer's cow would ask. You know why didn't you come get me? <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, our next guest will be coming in probably in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, we'll keep an eye out for him. I think we left the door unlocked uh, here at the uh, Cocodona Studios here in beautiful Flagstaff, Arizona. Tomorrow, I'm going to open that window. I'm going to have the sunshine in front of me as I... Uh, I'm waking up tomorrow morning and speaking with you and Allison Mercer. You know, I th- that's good, Chris, because we keep our, uh, you know, our faces that only our mothers would be proud of off the live stream. So, yeah, we we don't need to see me. That's why I said <laughs> when you had Ken on, I said, and you were trying to to split screen us, uh, you know, myself, Ken, and the background. I was like, oh, you can do without me. I mean, we can, you know, have. I did uh, build it to to where uh, where we can do it. Ken so. had some cool artwork too. Ken did it. I for, that was the question I forgot to ask. So, just so you know, a, a little Mozart? inside baseball here. The only way I could hear Ken was to watch the live stream on my phone with headphones here. Uh, so I was kind of a little bit delayed uh, on hearing what Ken was saying. So, you know, I was flustered. I, I caved to the pressure. I should have asked him. You know who the who the artwork was from. It was neat. It was neat. It was neat. Uh, he's in. The, he's been in the chat, so maybe if he's still in the chat, he can uh, he can let us know. Rory, Rory is in the, in the Culver's, Culver's drive through, so he's so going to we'll come see here. Rory in about an hour and a half. It sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I saw uh, Kids Meals. I wonder if Kids Meals is who Trail Gangsters is going to see in the Culver's drive through. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, asking who or how to see the top ten at the moment, uh, that is easy. Uh, number one, there are two ways to do it. Number one, we can pull it up for you. Maybe. Maybe. See if it's working. We can potentially pull it up for you. No, All right. We're, uh, uh, we're having, having some overlay uh, issues. But I can tell you how to find it. Right below the video of... Uh, of the Cocodona 250 live stream, uh, you can see the um, Cocodona runner tracking website and merch links down at the bottom, as well as uh, the Patreon for Steep Life Media. Um, yeah, you can look, at, you can click on the Cocodona runner tracking, and from there you'll actually get linked to the same GPS sourcing that we're using in terms of trying to follow the runners ourselves. We don't have any insider information. Uh, in terms of GPS. Now, we might have a person or two on the course that feeds us intel, but uh, it, beyond that, like for instance, when I look in and zoom 
at the uh, the runner tracker, I'm seeing that Killian Korth is at mile 65.2, the same way you are, and seeing that Michael Versteeg is at mile 63.3, and Sarah Ostazewski is currently at mile 61.8. And again, we are expecting to see Sarah coming to Camp Kippa in the not too distant future. And we will have eyes on the ground soon in Prescott at Whiskey Row. We our good uh, our good friend Dr. Stephen Crawford is there. He got there early. The aid station wasn't even set up yet, <laughs> so he's uh, he's going to give it a little bit. And once uh, once the aid station's up, he's going to be able to give us a little bit of the ambiance that uh, that is um, Whiskey Row and Whiskey Row. Aid station is such a cool setup. For those that aren't familiar with the Whiskey Row setup, it's here. You can put me on for just a moment here. It goes historic saloon slash bar, historic saloon slash bar, historic saloon slash bar, aid station, historic saloon slash bar, historic saloon slash. I mean, it's right in the middle of this uh, um, this historic. Uh, area you know part of the history of arizona okay nobody wants to look at me anymore we can take me off (laughs) but uh yeah it's it's right in the middle uh it actually um is in the place of a former um saloon that burned down it burned down in 2012 i remember because i ran the whiskey row marathon in 2012 it was the first week of may i believe it was like may 5th or 6th or so and like less than a week later, uh, there there was that fire on Whiskey Row. Um, I can't remember the name of the uh, the the place that uh, that was burned down, but uh, but yeah, the Whiskey Row. Um, it was right next to the Birdcage Saloon. That I do know. Uh, the Birdcage Saloon is a is a historic place. Um, but yeah, it, it was uh, it was unfortunate. Uh, but uh, they cleaned up the area, and now it's uh, it's uh, kind of an open space that they use for um, events. And uh, this is most certainly an event, and uh, and we definitely appreciate the ability to uh, be at Whiskey Row here for the Coconut 250. That's right, Branch. The original capital of Arizona was Prescott. Back when it was the Arizona Territory, I believe. Back when I was a kid. Yep. Yeah. It was the territorial capital, I believe. Yeah. Sipping whiskey and monitoring this live stream is hard to beat in the evening. Uh, we might have somebody who's sipping whiskey while being on the live stream here uh, uh, tomorrow night uh, if, uh, if he's so inclined. Last year, that was one of the fun things, hanging out with uh, Pete Mortimer as uh, – he was uh, just uh, hanging out and reminiscing about his time on the Whiskey Row cor- or the Coconut course uh, the prior year. And we are going to be able to take a look in at Whiskey Row here in just a second. Let's uh, keep my eye. I don't want. I obviously don't want to miss our women's leader Sarah Ostazewski as For she sure. comes into Camp Kippa. But let's go ahead. I'll keep my eye on that feed still. But let's go ahead. And this is kind of where that aid station is going to be set up. Spider Pena will be uh, heading out uh, to follow runners in. Hey, Dr. Um, Stephen Crawford, can you get Spider Pena a new shirt? (laughs) That that U of A Wildcat stuff has just got to go. And then uh, we'll have our first of many Shad cams. (laughs) Oh, Shad is great. Uh, Shad logged, uh, eight, what he said, 87 miles? I'm never going to remember. I think it was 83. Okay. I, oh, that's right. It was 83. Because I think we said 80. And he said and 83. it was 83. Yeah. yeah. Shad was one of our follow filmers last year, and he logged 83 miles uh, during the waning days of the Cocodona 250 last year. He As registered for like a, a six-hour shift, <laughs> and he stayed for like two days. Well, you got to figure, at that point, if you're following runners... And he are, did all of this, Chris, in like a one-mile stretch of yeah. road from he, the hospital here in Flagstaff to the finish line. That means he probably did 30 hours, give or take. I mean, going just back and forth down uh, 
um, Birch and Beaver Streets yeah. in, in Flagstaff. So, yeah, this is Whiskey Row right here. Uh, it's, a, it's right across from the uh, Yavapai County Courthouse in downtown uh, Prescott. I believe that... Uh, well, it looks like we may have... I know that these feeds are going to be a little choppy, but I believe we have... That's Sarah. Oh, right yeah, there. It looks, yeah, it's going to be a little laggy, but there is Sarah Ostazewski, which means we will switch to uh, the Courtney Cam out at Camp Kippa. That's a, that's a little tongue twister. <laughs> Courtney Cam at Camp Kippa. Um, Thank you to Courtney for getting uh, the shot of Sarah right there. And so um, this is this is Courtney here. So she, Brent was just there uh, capturing Sarah. He's a little bit further up the trail, oh, which is okay. why he doesn't have. Um, he's so, he's just trying to find. We got Courtney a good spot, and so now Brent's got a going to try to find a good spot. Do you think um, we'd be able to get audio on Sarah as she comes by? On um, this one. Possibly. I don't think there would be a loud music issue at uh, Camp Kippa. No, we, again, w probably won't be able to hear, but maybe I can. Yeah, Sarah Ostazewski, uh, my pick to win the Cocodona 250 this year. Uh, in 2021, she finished in fifth. Last year, she finished third. And this year, I think she makes the jump. I heard something. I don't know. We don't. We don't need to. There's a light coming down the hill now. From uh, from Camp Kippa, yeah, you can Here see a headlamp in the upper center of the screen. No. Um, and that's that's going to be. Our I hear something now. That is going to be our. Women's leader Sarah Ostazewski of, Press, or of uh, Flagstaff, Arizona. Sarah hitting Ooh, uh, Camp nice Kippa work. at the uh, just yep, short yep of 15 hour mark. Uh, Sarah heading down into the aid station. Uh, we'll see if we can uh, uh, see what is going on. That's, an, I believe, that's another one of our follow cams right there. But uh, Sarah currently the uh, leader of the Cocodona 250 race on the women's side. Yeah, and she's got a pretty sizable lead on uh, the second and third women um, at this point. Uh, about, I mean, two and a half, three miles. It's not, it's not something that's impossible to overcome, but uh, it is, uh, it is a notable lead at this point. Yeah, and we're going to keep Courtney right here so that we can catch Sarah when she comes back out. As soon as she, as soon as any of our filmers go into that building, they're losing service. Oh, okay. Uh, straight away. So I'd rather, I'd rather stay here. I know that, you know, it just adds a little bit to the, uh, to the intrigue, right? You yes. Got to keep everybody in suspense. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron Berger in the chat. Forks up. Bear down is stupid for a cats team. Yes, I've heard the story. <laughs> yes, uh Aaron uh Berger's a a fellow uh Sun Devil. And uh unfortunately he grew up on the wrong side of the border in uh in the Midwest as he is from southern Wisconsin. Oh, poor guy. Yeah, so his uh, family and uh, I were actually business rivals when I used, used to work in radio back in Beloit, Wisconsin. At my first uh, time having a full-time radio job, uh, his family uh, was involved with uh, uh, the local press in Janesville, which was like the the sister city to Beloit. It's like, did you ever watch Parks and Rec? Just look at how deep these stories run. Bro, I got five days to tell you all about the crazy <laughs> stories that uh, have been involved. I mean, I, I my first pacer at a at a trail running ultra ever was my prom date sister. Oh man! Yeah, I mean, I've got, I've got deep stories here. So, um, and but there was uh, a and we got in the chat. How days. do you pronounce Sarah's last name? It is Ostazewski. Yes, Ostazewski. Rory will uh will be in in a little bit after he he downs his culvers that he he waited for so patiently uh so that he can <laughs> he can he can uh 
maybe he can tell us all the different words that can rhyme with Ostazuski. I bet I'm you. I'm sure they're can. in his mind. He's done a number of, uh, yep. of raps <laughs> uh, with Sarah Ostazuski or the Ostazuskis in uh, in the rhyme. So I'm sure I'm sure Rory is uh, very well versed on all the different words that can uh, that they can, can rhyme, rhyme with, with Ostazuski. Ostazuski. I can definitely see that. And one of the we'll, we'll get to know Rory for those that aren't familiar. Uh, he's been a part of the Arizona running scene for years. Um, obviously a very successful runner on the Air Viper racing team. Holds uh, several uh, course records at Arizona events. Um, he is currently working on uh, trying to qualify for the Olympic trials and the marathon. Uh, extremely talented in that regard. And uh, when he's not running or he's not working... He's rapping. Yep. And uh, we'll uh, we'll have some fun with that. We'll uh, we'll share some of his stuff. Uh, I I have a couple of favorites of his tunes that uh, I can't wait to uh, to unleash on uh, on our viewers and listeners. Yeah, <laughs> looks like there's some shade being thrown in the chat from uh, a fellow Air Viper Racing Team member talking about Rory's uh, uh, fueling methods here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia Bach wants Janesville and Beloit stories. No, no, nobody wants <laughs> stories about Janesville and Beloit, Wisconsin. Maybe, uh, maybe Aaron Berger in the chat has some, but I only worked in Beloit for about a year uh, back in uh, two thousand. <laughs> but uh, that's where I got my start, and uh, that was my first full time radio job. So. <laughs> Gerald Gangster's fuels on talkies and hoes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the poor guy just wants to eat his dinner in peace, yeah. and he and, uh, wants to, and he wants to eat his culvers. And Pete's just stepping on him right there. <laughs> I know. That's all right. Rory will get it tonight. Pete will get it tomorrow when we're talking about uh, Mortimer and Browning's cow. Uh, you know, and, true. and telling stories about that. So. Maybe he'll rap about that. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of ways you can go with that one. Let's go. We got, let's see, we got Courtney back up at Camp Kippa here. And so, Chris, I will say our lead men, Killian Korth, came through um, the Camp Kippa aid station in 14 hours, 23 minutes, mm-hmm. uh, which would be 7.23 p.m. Uh, Michael Versteeg came through 14 hours, 31 minutes, so really close. Then Sarah Ostazewski, third overall, and 14 hours, 58 minutes. So she's only 35 minutes behind uh, the overall leader, Killian Korth. And both the men's leaders are um, kind of right where... I had kind of projected they would be at this point, maybe even a little bit faster. So I think I'm hoping that we will see the um, the men's race leaders come through Whiskey Row uh, between 10:30 and 10:45 tonight. I am not surprised that Sarah Ostasewski is third overall. However, I am surprised that she looks so smooth right now in third overall. Like she looks, she looks so incredible. Yeah, I. I I'm like so really strong. impressed at how strong she looks right now. So and, if, if she's uh, – but then again, this is – it shouldn't be a surprise because she's done this race twice before and had success twice before. I think that even though I picked her to win this race, I might even still be underselling her at this point, which is saying something. Yeah, I mean, she's just really – like the last 18 to 24 months for Sarah has been – Probably the last 18 months has been spectacular, right? Like, not that she wasn't performing well before that, but to absolutely dominate the Muggy and Monster in the way that she did, to come and have such a strong run at Cogadona last year, to have done, you know, a variety of other races that she's had a lot of success at, um, and then to now be out here um, having this kind of run again. We're still really early in the race, but... Uh, her last 18 months is really shaping up to be uh, something special. Yeah, she, uh, you know, she's 
really – I mean, she was always been a talented runner, but she's definitely picked up another level here over the last uh, – like you said, the last 12 to 18 months. We're just waiting to see her emerge. Um, I'm assuming that uh, she is basically just uh, getting ready to uh, you know, embark on the next section. Uh, there was a good question in the chat asking about when runners can pick up pacers. I believe... A, is it Whiskey Row? I've, I, thought it w I thought it was Whiskey Row, but somebody was saying that it might be earlier. So let me... Uh, here we go. Pacers. The first pacer access is at Friendly Pines, so just oh, before wow. Whiskey Row at 71.2. That's interesting. Yeah, that was not what I was that what I thought it was. I thought it was actually at mile seventy eight at Whiskey Row. Thanks to Courtney for being out there and uh, keeping a cam on uh, on Camp Kippa because Camp Kippa is a bit of a remote place to get to. So uh, we're grateful to have you out there. Things are starting to get set up over in Whiskey Row. Again, we don't expect our lead runners to be there probably for another two and a half-ish hours. I do think that they're going to come in uh, before that 11 o'clock hour, hopefully. Um, That's the That would be the goal, hopefully, that uh, the first runners, because... Uh, uh, we'd or like Stieg to see in the inaugural year came through what, like just before midnight, just before or just after it was right around like, midnight. Yeah. It was like what, give or take 10 minutes probably. Yeah. Uh, it was that close to midnight. I think that this year is going to run a little bit quicker, but definitely not nearly as fast as, uh, last year's race. So. And we are going to send it to kind of our static shot at Crown King as we have, again, runners have until 11.55 to be in and out of the Crown King aid station here. So we're, uh, we're taking a look at, you know, some of the um, – Kind of the the back of the Packers at this point. These people aren't in any danger of of cutoffs no, no. right now uh, by any means. But you know, everyone's out there uh, on this kind of existential adventure, right? And so um, we hope that all the runners that are you know at Crown King or just coming into Crown King are uh, are enjoying themselves. I think that. Uh when you get to crown king there's got to be a uh, a certain level of uh relief for sure and uh you know hopefully that brings a smile to their face and uh that uh they're able to appreciate uh the success they've had so far on the journey and uh while they do still have a long way to go you know they've accomplished quite a bit so far already We'll send it to Whiskey Row here. Just taking in the sights and sounds. Got folks starting to roll in. Aid station starting to get set up. And like you said earlier, Chris, this is just such a unique aid station 
Yeah, Chris, after dark, uh, Pacers could conceivably run 179 miles. And it is not uncommon at this race to have uh, to find out after the fact that somebody had a pay, like the same pacer for 100 plus miles. I've seen it. Yep. Oh, is this. Arlen Glick is pacing Sarah? Somebody posted that in the chat. I'm not We'll have to get a verification on that, but that. Oh, he is. Inside info Inside from our next info. guest. Oh, I know you are. We'll talk about that for sure. This is awesome. Whenever you're ready, you're more than welcome to sit down and. Yeah, what, what do we need from the live chat to like coerce you into. You know, putting the headset on, putting the microphone thrown on, Rory, and uh, gracing us with that beautiful voice. You know, Rory, we're gonna bring, bring we're gonna bring Rory Moynihan in here, and actually, while we do so, we are going to take a brief commercial break and uh, play a little commercial from our good friends over at Speedland. So, shout out to our friends at Speedland for helping support the stream. And, uh, yeah, we'll be back in just a few minutes. here at uh, the Cocodona 250. All right, Chris, the floor is yours. So I don't think there's going to be any audio. Well, we, we got to have the audio on this. It's going <laughs> to... I know. I know, I, I know. I know. Um, but... Uh, well, actually, I guess you can kind of see what he uh, what he's all about. Uh, Roy, come on in and have a seat. All right. <laughs> oh, and then we just got a Shelby, Shelby Farrell sighting uh, in the video there. Shout so I got Shelves. no audio here. Well, you're, uh, you, you, we don't actually, you the won't hear any iPad audio in the internal. So it, you won't hear audio in your ears. There's no monitor on that. But on the music yep. video. Oh, okay. So, yep. Well, to uh, address your question about the rhyming, I asked my crew skis for a few brewskis. Then I got passed by the Ostazuskis. That's a previously written bar. <laughs> I love that. That was your heavily in so, song from a couple right. of years ago. Folks, uh, we'll uh, pop it into the studio here for a moment. Uh, this is uh, Rory Monahan, uh, the trail gangster himself. Uh, Rory, uh, welcome to the Cocodona live stream. This is something that I've wanted to do for years. I mean, uh, I've always, uh, you know, we've been friends for a while and, Absolutely. and now that, uh, we've actually had the chance to get you in studio. I'm really excited to, uh, to have you in here and to, to be a part of this. And, uh, you're a member of the Air Viper racing team Thanks for having me, yeah. <laughs> and you're working on, uh, trying to uh, qualify for the Olympic trials in the yeah. marathon. Um, and, uh, what else do you have going on? Yeah, I, I know that goal doesn't particularly sound like a, a trail gangsta's goal, so I have some strengths on the road as that's my background. So that's something I've, I've been working on since I moved to Flagstaff. Um, I used to be a teacher, cross-country coach in the Valley at Desert Edge High School in Goodyear. And, um, yeah, at that point I was kind of just doing runs with my athletes after practice late at night in downtown Phoenix. And I qualified for Boston, ran Boston, and realized I had – had a pretty good, you know, I had strength in the, the road marathon. Yeah. So although I was kind of falling in love with the trail scene, I've just had this kind of bug that bit where 
I started meeting people like in Flagstaff who had qualified and it's just a goal that's within reach and I'd like to get. Um, what kind of brings us full circle is we're like blocks from my first residence in Flagstaff. Oh. Um, one thing I like about this city is like if you're coming here to run, sometimes you have to like take a bet on yourself. But I like I rented this bedroom. I won't say we're at just a few streets away mm -hmm. from this nice um, runner. And I just kind of planted myself there, lived there for a few months. I was like, I'm going to try to find some roommates at a run club at some of the run clubs and, you know, kind of worked from there. Well, this is an excellent community here in Flagstaff to be a part of if you're a runner. I mean, have you seen uh, gains in your abilities since you moved up here? And is it, you know, the elevation? Is it the, the community? Is it uh, approaching your training differently? What has helped make you uh, over to the point where uh, you're on the fringe of uh, accomplishing something that, uh, that a lot of people could only dream of? Great question. I mean... First and foremost, the elevation seems like a little bit of a hack. Um, definitely going to run faster just by living up here, sleeping at elevation for sure. But I got to say, the longer I've been here, the less I think that's the, the major component because I've gotten my butt kicked by people from Phoenix mm -hmm. <laughs> on certain courses and races. So I think it's more the, the culture and the environment of just excellent, seeing really good runners all around you the ability to meet up with talented runners on a daily basis or just any, I mean, it's not always about times and ability. It's just like a work ethic and everyone who lives here loves running, yeah. especially the trails. So a little plug, I got my peak trail runners uh, hat here. So that's another thing I, uh, I was set on just, I kind of, uh, what's cool. We go way back to about 2013 mm -hmm. and I kind of saw how Aravipa built up this incredible, basically a casual weekday run club into just a powerhouse of, you know, race directing and yeah. all these events. So that's something I kind of wanted to create on a small level here. And I feel like I'm getting there. That's awesome. <laughs> but no. uh, we saw it grow together. Yeah, so. for sure. It, it's, um, you know, and I'm glad to see that uh, you've encountered the, you know, these successes since you moved up here. Like I said, I obviously we've been friends, but I also have been following, you know, uh, with uh, some anxiousness and excitement uh, whenever you, when I find out, uh, oh, uh, I'm going to be uh, flying to Houston or I'm going to be flying to Duluth or wherever your, you know, your efforts to, uh, uh, to accomplish that uh, Olympic trials qualifier take you. So, you know, I'm glad to hear that uh, this has definitely made a positive difference in your life being up here. Um, I appreciate that. Describe your experience. I mean, you're, uh, well, I, I guess let's start with this. Um, what are you doing? Cheers. <laughs> All right. I'm not trying to stop your question. I was like, uh, this is a good time to get my drink. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so, keep going. So, Welcome to Aravipa After Dark, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, this is the this is the Ooh. the uh, the epitome of Aravipa After Dark right All here. Right. Okay. Now I'm ready. Now I'm ready. So, uh, what are you doing this week with regards to Cocodona, other than hanging out with us here tonight? Uh, you know, man. I feel like I always got some kind of projects going on. I like I like flexibility with my schedule and training. I'm a mm -hmm. substitute teacher, so um, I got to do that. I'm actually dog sitting <laughs> for some friends. I just joined the Rover app. I mean, I'm just kind of grinding on all levels with just side jobs to uh, enable, hopefully, trail gangsters to be the main hustle. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm pacing Sarah Ostazuski for a later section of the race, and I plan to be filming out there and fill in wherever needed, obviously being part of the Air Viper team and uh, knowing the course and watching it the past two years, I want to help out however I can. And I live less than a mile from downtown. Just to chime in, I think that uh, in the inaugural year, you, f you f were a follow cam for some of our uh, first finishers, weren't you? Yeah, huge honor watching uh, <laughs> Verstig bring it in. And I had actually just uh, met him like the previous – fall I, if I get yeah my timeline's right at man against horse um, so yeah I feel like I kind of had a unique insight to or I got to know him a little bit because if you don't I mean especially that lane of race you're not getting more than a couple words out of it <laughs> uh, and, and seeing that commercial too made me laugh because I'm like I've never <laughs> seen him that animated in my life there was someone in the chat who literally said they've known Versteeg for over five years and they've never seen him smile 
Except for the commercial that we played Except earlier for the today. Commercial. <laughs> that was a, a big smile. Biggest one I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think uh, if my memory serves me right, yeah, you weren't getting many words out of Versteeg at that point in the race. But uh, yeah, it's it's awesome how uh, how much unique experience you have uh, at the race from, you know, helping uh, film and being out on mm-hmm. course and just knowing the trails. So, hey, And a little hack for those videographers out there. One thing I did... I had two gimbals, <laughs> so I knew the live stream was kind of like, you know, even downtown, there's actually the spot downtown where you're not getting the best signal. Mm-hmm. So I had my own iPhone recording on a separate gimbal. So I have like actual footage of it that I really appreciate and look back and I've used in some of my videos. Um, so, yeah, um, we're going to, we're going to see if we can figure out the tech part of it and potentially share, uh, you know, some of your work. Well, we'll work with Matt on that, but, yeah. um, uh, could always do it live. But uh, we could, oh. you never know. <laughs> oh, I'm here for that. It's even better. You know why? Not only does that save me work, but I think it's more pleasing for the audience. You know, it's like going to a live concert versus uh, buying a CD or a vinyl, right? They're just two different experiences. Yes. And actually, you know? that's how I grade a lot of my favorite artists. <laughs> can they perform live? Like, how do they sound in person? Anyone can sound good on a well-produced record or album, but... yeah. You know, I, so we I, may I'm, have to we may have to make that happen. I can even give you I can pass this mic over so you don't even have to use the headset oh, yeah. and you can really you know Man. you can really get into it. So we'll have can to make that happen. Can I get a beat or anything? I can hear it or is that going to be hard? Just a, I can do acapella, but well, I could do it off my phone because you wouldn't yeah, have a headset on, so you'd be able to hear the beat. Sure, they We're, might pick up a little bit of the audio, but sure. This is going to be a lot of this fun. This is going to be oh, great. Um, let's, uh, I don't need any drinks. To, to <laughs> I, just, I love it. Today when I was substitute teaching, I had students asking me if that's something I would do because they found out I rap, have these videos. So now it's like I kind of like when the students don't know because uh, <laughs> no one's going to ask me to do a freestyle or something. Well, we will definitely be uh, challenging you to do that here uh, tonight. Um, are we able to uh, grab uh, some video on course anywhere right now? Do we have uh, some cameras available? All right. So right here, you're looking at uh, Whiskey Row. Of course, uh, you've run in Prescott before. Um, mm-hmm. You know, have you run like the Whiskey Basin races uh, up there? For sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, um, the what is your three ex- K? Okay, what is your experience with the uh, uh, the Cocodona Chorus? I mean, you know that uh, I know you've run Black Canyon, Crown King, Whiskey Basin. I mean, you've probably run as much of the course or more than I have, really, over time. I mean, uh, as a Flagstaff resident, uh, I know you've gone up Eldon, you know, right. and uh, run Walnut Canyon. I'm assuming as well. Uh, can you describe your uh, your familiarity with the Cocodona Chorus or? Well, a special thing about this course, I was kind of thinking about it as, as I was listening to other great commentators today. Uh, the way I thought of it, it's like a puzzle piece. All the Air Viper races are puzzle pieces that kind of fit together for Cocodona 250, mm-hmm. with the exception of some like double track roads that are connecting locations. So it's one, cool if you've done the races, because you kind of know what to expect, but then you see how it links up besides just visualizing a map. Um, and then if it's totally new to you, then you're really in for an adventure. So, um, yeah, all those courses have, you know, something that I like about them. The the Prescott trails are, you know, pretty underrated, a lot softer. Um, I like the, the area where that race finishes with uh, the lake there within view. Um, yeah. So. Lots of lakes is a really like gorgeous area. Each, each section. And yeah, your, your description of the downtown life afterwards, too, is, is accurate and. Yeah, well, most of them have like a Wild West feel. Yeah. That's throughout, well, just and, in a different way. And it's cool this race connects those different disparate towns. I mean, you know, like, you know, Whiskey Whiskey Row and, you know, and Prescott is cool. Uh, Jerome is cool. Uh, Cottonwood is cool. Um, you know, Flagstaff is cool. Like, to, like, mm-hmm. go from, like, town to town to town is a unique experience. Like, I know that that's a part of the experience at places like UTMB, but in America – Outside of like Hard Rock and Western states, there really aren't a lot of races where you're basically, excuse me, hopping from town to town to town. So this is, uh, you know, even you know, hundred milers in in the U.S. don't typically do that. They're usually set out in, you know, more remote areas. So while this does go through a lot of remote areas, it's it's designed to link various uh, cities uh, in this in this state. So. 
yeah, I think like that, said, that's the really puzzle cool. Puzzle pieces coming together. Absolutely. Kind of like those monster medals that you collect, and they all yeah. fit together into one. That's how I think of um, Looks like we might have a potential uh, bit of news here on the mm -hmm. course. Looking at the tracker now, take this with a grain of salt because, as we mentioned, um, it all depends on you know, ping and satellite location okay i don't it showed and, and this is why i wanted to preface that it showed michael versteeg at mile 66.1 and killian korth at mile 65.8 however the pinging of the satellites if you look closely uh killian korth satellite pinged 31 minutes ago so unless he basically laid down in the course and took a nap uh Michael Versteeg uh, most likely has not passed the Killian Korth. It might just be a situation where his tracker has not pinged. A little bit further back, Sarah Ostazewski has uh, just left uh, Camp Kippa at mile 63. So she's uh, on the course and currently leading the women's race. Uh, Mike Gronwegen, uh out of Seattle, Washington, is currently the third place male. Uh, and the second place... Uh, female right now, currently uh, Micah Thews uh, out of Colorado. And uh, the third place female, actually, there has been some movement there. If the tracker is to be, again, I had to double check this before I. Uh, um, so Eliza LaPierre is currently at mile 60.5 with a ping one minute ago. Dawn Greenwald is at mile 59.5, but her last radar ping was, tw or her last GPS ping was 29 minutes ago. So I'm going to operate under the assumption, again, unless Dawn completely stopped, that she is still uh, holding on ahead of uh, uh, Eliza and possibly Micah at that, uh, at that point. So um, we're still obviously, you know, they're a quarter of the way done. A little, a little hard to tell at this point. Yeah. Things can shake up. Eliza looks like we have a one of the few East Coasters up there in those top spots at the moment. Yeah. Uh, she's got an extensive uh, track record at Western States, though. So uh, she's uh, raced out West Familiar. plenty. Um, and uh, I know that uh, I believe that uh, she was AJW's pick to win Cocodona this year, uh, talking about her extensive uh, success at Western States. And we do have an update. It's Mika. It is Mika. Yeah, I, I get corrected every year. Uh, I feel, oh, I feel I, like, oh, I'm, I'm pronouncing it the opposite of what I normally pronounce it. Um, so it's Mika. Mika Thews. I'm oh, I'm always corrected. So I... I this, we'll, but no, we'll shout out to <laughs> Hill Country Digger in the chat. Thank you, Hill Country Digger. Yeah, appreciate oh, that. Yeah, your name... Um, uh, it, it, it what is the weirdest way someone has pronounced <laughs> your, your first name? Man. So well, Rory's name is spelled R-U-A-I-R-I, -R -I, correct? So it's the Gaelic spelling. My mom yes. was born in Ireland, so I do have dual citizenship there as well. So, mm. um, And it's actually the simplified version of it. Believe it or not, there's a harder version with a D and an H in there that's completely silent. <laughs> Uh, so my mom decided to do the streamlined version, just R-U-A-I-R-I. -I. Uh, I've heard Ruary is what I get commonly, but somehow I got this nickname at uh, high school cross-country meets where people just call me Ruhali. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ruhali Mahogany. I kid you not. <laughs> I don't know if it was exactly that, but the you know my high school teammates – we're just laughing hysterically. I think I, you know, was going up to get an award or something. And, and then it just, maybe it was some other version, but over the year it just became Rahali Mahogany. So that is that's supposedly pretty, the worst. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, that's, uh, that's <laughs> I would have expected that. Our compliance advisor when I was in college once pronounced my last name Floodgate. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, Floodgate, really? and it's just Feldhaik. So, so, so you have a running background. You ran in college as well, correct? Uh, where did you uh, Where did you run when you were? I was a, a D three runner at St. John's University in Minnesota, Central okay. Minnesota, St. Cloud area. 
So shout out Midwest, <laughs> Minnesota specifically. The um, easiest way to make yourself a friend of Matt's is to announce that you're from anywhere in the Midwest. Exactly. Hey. Exactly. I think we Grew already. Up in Fargo, uh, North Dakota. Yeah. No DAC. Minnesota's no DAC. Minnesota's a little cooler to claim at times. It depends <laughs> which one I want to use. <laughs> it's all the Midwest. That's like another case of dual citizenship. Yeah, yeah. Midwest. <laughs> uh, I get in arguments of who is Midwest. That's a whole separate thing. It took me a while to realize Ohio was Midwest because being so far out in North Dakota, I just didn't think they were. But uh, no, shout out Ohio though. Anyone from Ohio? <laughs> Hopefully, we've got a few people from Ohio out there. Um, uh, so you're going to be pacing uh, Sarah later on here, um, Sarah Ostazewski, who is currently leading our women's race. Um, have you have you talked strategy with her? Have you, have you uh, um, did you train with her at all prior to this? And uh, what have you seen uh, that maybe would make you think this is the year, as opposed to her near misses in terms of. Uh, uh, trying to win a race that uh, that seems to be eluding her at the moment. Is there something that you saw that made you think, okay, this is the year that Sarah Ostazewski wins Cocodona? Well, you know, I, I know that's definitely one of her goals to keep moving up the podium. I got to say this winter is probably the least that we've trained, one, due to the bad weather, and then just my focus on the roads. But speaking of focus, what I've seen from her, she seems really dialed in jokingly between friends and I, one thing we're having her work on, I think it might have been mentioned in the chat too, is, um, yeah, enjoy the race, but uh, a few less Instagram stories during. <laughs> during. <laughs> Which is funny because yeah. did you catch her taking a selfie with Dr. <sighs> Stephen Crawford? Yeah. <laughs> oh, he did. <laughs> you know. In Crown King. What, what she actually had mentioned on that is she was still going to do it, but kind of do it more efficiently. Um, so I know that was one component. She was definitely reevaluating her sleep strategies for sure. And obviously just so many things to unpack. I'd say she might attest to it as well. Number one thing is getting a coach, um, being a running coach myself. I have a coach, James Bonet, mm -hmm. uh, it helps so much. So I think her training has been a lot more methodical and the choices she makes with racing and training routes. Besides just doing what's fun and really hard, she's kind of doing it more strategically. So I, I think part of the reason she's looking so fresh is based how she's stacking up that training. Yeah, and she started working with a coach, I believe, at, sometime between the first Cocodona and Muggian, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I was just referencing before you came on, like how impressive her last 18 months or so of running has been, you know, from absolutely dominating Muggian Monster to... Uh, last year's run at Cocodona to what she's doing now and all these other incredible races she's had uh, in between. And I didn't even yeah. you know connect the dots there. Impressive growth. Uh, getting a coach is, is so important. I even remember uh, James Bonet telling me uh, just to have patience because some people get a coach. They expect results within you know six months. I'm sure you can uh, attest as well, oh, yeah. Chris. So I think you're just kind of seeing that payoff where it was working then, but – yeah, you just have to accumulate those training effects, and it could take up to two years to really see those monster gains, and this this could be the year where it pays off. Yeah, I'm going to have an interesting conversation, I'm sure, with my coach tomorrow night when he's here with me because uh, I put him in a very weird situation when I first hired him. Uh, I basically asked him if he could get me ready for a 100-miler in 10 weeks. Wait, By... your current – who is that? Pete. Oh, Pete, your yeah. current coach. Sorry, yeah. I, I thought at one point – I thought you said James for a sec. No, no, I, I, I had talked with James about it, but right. uh, I, uh, I felt like Pete was a better fit, and I think James Bonet is absolutely, oh, absolutely amazing. I mean, you know, the track record of runners that he's mm -hmm. coached speaks for itself. I mean, he's got you know world record holders, he's got American record holders that have all like you know been under his tutelage. So that's why I just wanted to clarify because I'd say there, you know, a lot of the Phoenix a athletes circulate with a few coaches, obviously. Um, there's more entering the game, but okay. Yeah, yeah. Pete Stellar. Yeah, and uh, he'll be joining us tomorrow night. But uh, right now, I am here with uh, the Trail Gangster himself, Roy Monahan, a, uh, a a member of the Flagstaff Trail and uh, Road Running community here. Uh, as uh, we're, uh, 
I wanted to bring him in because, frankly, he has such a passion and love for this sport. He's involved with uh, uh, several runners that are on this uh, on this journey, in particular, Shara Ostazewski. He'll be pacing later. And so, uh, and, and Rory's always uh, been a, a gregarious, outgoing person. So I wanted to make sure that uh, we finally got around to having you in the studio because I know we talked about it for, you know, months and years and, uh, that I really wanted to to hang out with you in the studio and, and talk running because I know that that's just something you value so much. Um, oh, and I'm loving this. Well, Finally we all, happening. So. <laughs> we also talked about, you know, your uh, um, the fact that you love to rap, and uh, we'll definitely be leveraging that uh, here oh, in a little bit. We'll, we'll, but, we'll provide some entertainment. But, but there's uh, something else I wanted to talk about as oh, well. Yeah. Uh, you have a series that you do on YouTube. And uh, I would like you to talk about that because uh, people might not realize it's a hidden gem and uh, they don't realize like you have interviewed like basically anybody who's anybody in the Arizona running scene uh, and everything up from, uh, you know, local, you know, FKT holders to Olympian medalists. Uh, Talk about what you do. And then after you explain sure. what you do to everyone, can you tell us, because I don't want to forget this question, can you tell us who the your favorite interview was out of all the amazing people you've, uh, you've <laughs> wow. interviewed? Like, pick your favorite kid, you know? Okay. I feel like, yeah, I, I don't want to distract from any coverage here. I feel like I'm getting my own interview. Oh, but, um, Matt will let us know if we're going to okay, okay. <laughs> miss something, so, so for sure. I, I'm so used to being on the flip side. I yeah. was almost a journalism major in, in college. Um, but, yeah. Anyway, uh, the the show you're referencing, which um, sometimes the output on YouTube is a little sporadic just because, honestly, it's a one-man show with Trail Gangsters. Tra- yeah. uh, video editing takes so long, and I'm uh, really picky when I do interviews. I like them to be in person. Um, I kind of started it pre-COVID, but what I noticed about the COVID interviews, and no offense to them, um, you just there's a certain thing that's not happening when you're not with them. and you get a better read of the person. Mm. So my show is Runners Rate the Bars, and I would dis- best describe it as a combination of, like, Hot Ones and <laughs> – oh, what's the other one? One of those review shows. I guess Hot, Hot Ones is, like, a big template yeah. in that it's a deep dive interview. The focus isn't, like, we're not just going to talk about your training block leading up to Western States. I want to get to know the person in a funny way, having, like, a prop or, like, a drink – some other focus is going to bring out different conversations. So there's two, two stages. We First part, we rate bars as in beer or alcohol. Mm-hmm. If they don't drink alcohol, um, I'll work with them on something else. Like I just did an interview where Stephen Hass, the coach of Dark Sky Distance, has never had a sip of alcohol. Wow. He's agent to some of the best athletes in the country, and uh, we had him rate sweet tea from some of the fast food Interesting. Spots. So I was having him rate like Chick Fil A and Canes, and I was going to say if you didn't say Canes, I was going <laughs> to. He nailed them too. A uh, little spoiler alert, but when that comes out. So anyway, um, by just having that, you know, he's taking a sip of that, and it's reminding him some story from his childhood. So it kind of takes the conversation in a new way. And then part two, it sounds like a lot of work, but it's worth it if you watch it. Uh, is rating the bars like music, rap yeah. lyrics. So, oh. Um, doesn't have to be rap. Like I've modified it. I've had Jeff Browning on there and Pete Mortimer. Obviously, they're they're not just. <laughs> man, their taste in music is crazy. <laughs> Sim- overlaps with Sarah. I understand Sarah has a cool playlist out there. A lot of heavy metal and rock. So, oh. Um, yeah. So, in a nutshell, we use those two things to get a really good interview out of runners. Yeah. So, going back to favorite, and it was probably the earliest. It's got to be Molly Seidel. That was what really one. blew my mind. And, you know, to to see, you know, because you knew Molly before she had, you know, uh, had meddled. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, what's that like to know that somebody that you know and that you were friends with, like, went to the Olympics and came away with a bronze medal? It's crazy. I mean, yeah. she brought the medal to Run Club, and you could hold it in your hands <laughs> and, like, feel the weight. And the, the week – or two weeks whenever she left for Tokyo she came to our run club and we had a send off for her so 
I will say after a while you get spoiled because <laughs> you get to see athletes like that, but that's probably the that's pinnacle and that's for you, the highest level athlete we've seen. And um, that was different, but you know, most of them are pretty humble and approachable and that that's what makes her special and fun. She's just a riot how she is on social media and being silly as how she is in person. Well, absolutely. I mean, a couple, the first Cocodona two years ago, you and I were hanging out at Mother Road, and all of a sudden, who comes up and taps us on the shoulder? It's Jim Walmsley. You know, I mean, that's exactly. the way this community is up here. It's <laughs> like it, it's stacked with you know high quality runners, but also high quality people as well that are always very welcoming. You know, I'm not anything. You know, I'm I'm not a runner on the level that uh, you know the runners up here are, but uh, everybody's always treated me very kindly and, uh, and welcomed me with open arms. So I'm glad to be up here as, you know, whenever I come into Flagstaff and visit. So. Oh, for sure. I'm, I'm just curious, uh, people out there, have you had any runner celebrity sightings in person? Maybe someone that kind yeah. of surprised it, you and, and what's so unique about trail running? Let, let me just circle back to that versus road marathons. I think people have pointed out you're on the start line with the be best runners in the world. Mm -hmm. If you're in a major marathon, of course, you're many corrals back. Maybe you're going to see Kipchoge briefly. I don't know Yeah. <laughs> if you're spectating Boston Marathon. But you can be on the start line with Jim Walmsley, Courtney DeWalter, and it makes it just different. You can approach them after the race. Yeah, it's an entirely different Road dynamic. Runners are whisked, off, whisked off, and you don't probably see them and go to their press conference and that's it. So yeah. They've got like handlers and their coaches yeah. are kind of like isolating them. Whereas like, it's not uncommon. I mean, hard rock, you go up to hard rock in, in uh, Colorado and Silverton, you're walking down the street and there's Killian. Oh, that, there's Francois. That was incredible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Last year, Killian and Jornet just walking around the street, like, uh, like everybody yeah. else, you know? So Francois pushing his, baby around in the stroller he we almost got him to go into the bar to do karaoke <laughs> with pete and i he literally was standing in the doorway of the bar and looking in we're like come on in we've got a couple of, of heads up on this uh liam aid station fireball uh ran 20 miles with arlen glick at western states camp on a whim uh ben wiley uh met uh, tyler green at his favorite diner in portland uh, apparently, uh, Tyler Green has uh, made the rounds <laughs> with some of our uh, audience uh, in Forest Park. Yeah, there's one. Back uh, to my question, yeah. Uh -huh. Sven uh, Gunvaldsen, uh, uh, Ben Gibbard, uh, the lead singer of Death Cab for Cutie, was it across the years this year? Uh, didn't oh, make it. Yeah, he I was just out there doing the 24 hour one day. Yeah, he's done. Uh, I Black got a Canyon. chance to run with him a little bit at Black Canyon. I know that was a big deal for a lot of spectators and. Oh, yeah, he would be a dream guest for Runners Rate the Bar, that perfect intersection. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. Runner, running music. Um, I ran into Eric Burns on the course, the former uh, Arizona Diamondback center fielder who has now mm -hmm. become uh, an ultra runner. I ran into him on the course oh. at Black Canyon as it was one of the years that they had out and back sections, and uh, I saw him out there. I love when we pull new people into the sport. Absolutely. Yeah, let us know who you've run into oh. out there, whether it be on the on the course or on the road or uh, in uh, in a restaurant somewhere. We'd love to hear about your uh, celebrity runner um, T Rock experiences. Uh, Tommy Rives, you know, local celebrity and inspiration, did New York City Marathon again. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Since you know, his, uh, seeing his road to recovery has been pretty inspiring for sure. Someone met Mike O running in Stash, met Mike McKnight. Who's out there, right? Mike McKnight's another very approachable person. I mean, he's, yeah, I mean, you he's know, uh, if you did, if you weren't familiar with what he does, you, you wouldn't realize that he is, uh, you know, one of the greats of the game. I mean, he was at it across the years uh, a couple of years ago uh, doing an experiment on himself. He mm -hmm. ran 119 miles in 24 hours without taking in any calories. That was something, <laughs> a spectacle. <laughs> <laughs> Um, opposite of my approach. Corey's got one that everybody up here has experienced. I, I'm just, I'm liking watching these roll in here. So, uh, yeah, Corey, Jim Walmsley blazing by on South Kaibab. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a very common experience in the running community, uh, especially, uh, up in the, the Canyon. I think that everybody has the Walmsley going fast as hell by me, uh, experience in their lives. Mine was at, uh, Kendall mountain. 
Uh, he was actually, I looked later on Strava, he was doing a 436 downhill at Kendall Mountain. Oh, my Like God. on I that know. Jeep it, road. Absolutely nuts. I saw that. Yeah, when I did it after Hard Rock, I kind of, you know, I try not to look at it beforehand, to be honest. I just do the run. Mm-hmm. And then I, when I saw what his splits were, I, it was alarming yeah <laughs> alarmingly fast <laughs> i know matt's met a lot of running celebrities uh i've met quite or i've met a few most more probably in the road and track scene right. sure um and so that was maybe where my next question was rory like obviously living in flagstaff and you train with a lot of uh elites and on the kind of road and track side still but you have people from all over the world coming into town for training camps things like that who is the uh like most interesting person you've maybe not even conversed with, but just seen in person around town. Like I remember seeing Jess Hull uh, when she's obviously no longer with Union Athletic Club, but when she was doing a training mm-hmm. camp here right. with them. Uh, have oh, you ever people seen, like, from out of town. Yeah, like the Ingebrigtsens have been here training. Like oh. have, you, have you ever run into Jakob or anything yeah. like that? So I guess we're going to get my story. So after I – uh, first rented this bedroom a few blocks from here. <laughs> I feel like he's kind of holding out on who it, no, who it belongs to. That's, okay. Uh, I could probably even mention it. Margaret Manafort. She's a, a very talented uh, master's trail runner in the community. Um, so she's, yeah, hosted some runners before. Oh, so cool. She was kind of my launching pad. And then I met some incredible uh, runners, Dylan Bellis and Craig Hunt. Got to shout them out. Yeah, Craig Hunt, uh, fantastic there's runner. A, a big name trail runner there. Um, wait, what was I trying to link it to? Dang. I'm like a story a about uh, to... an interesting person that... Uh... Oh, right, right. So we moved, we lived on O'Leary Street. So if you know O'Leary Street Market, it's got a kind of a rundown vibe and a leprechaun on the sign. <laughs> you can get late night snacks. Yeah, Pete, like Takis. <laughs> whatever, I, <laughs> whatever I feel like, okay. <laughs> Junk food and all that. And... Uh, we're a couple blocks from the NAU track, and that's when I had moved to focus on the road marathon, so I still had that uh, speed workout focus, so I'd go to the NAU track for intervals and whatnot, and like one of the first or second workouts I did there, it is Mo Farah and his coach, um, wow. just about to start some 800s, I believe, and um, one cool thing that makes Flagstaff different, Mike Smith um, is the NAU coach. And he's super welcoming, and he basically has a, um, well, I don't know, I guess it's kind of known. You can get on the track if you want to. You just say you're with the, the running group or community. There's kind of like a password to just get in there. So I could work out there, but then if you're at that level, he got like extra permission to have his coach ride a bike on the track, which isn't usually allowed to have a bicycle mm-hmm. <laughs> pacing you. So that was pretty cool. So I got a picture with Mo Farah. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, pretty approachable. Oh, and then Abdi, Abdi Rahman was with him. But for some reason, I didn't recognize Abdi, and I feel bad because he's been on, like, he's going for his fifth Olympic team. So I think, (laughs) if I recall, someone was like, you gave Abdi your phone? And then I just won the picture with Mo Farah. So I feel bad now. (laughs) Oh, man, that's hilarious. Yeah, hey, Abdi, take a picture. Yeah, (laughs) that's the problem here. It's like... (laughs) So uh, when you're uh, um, when you take a look at this Cocodona roster, I don't know how extensively extensively you've looked at it. Uh, uh, who are some of the names that you're familiar with beyond uh, Sarah Ostazewski, who of course you're going to be pacing, and uh, Michael Versteeg, who uh, you basically uh, uh, ran alongside. I don't know if you have uh, uh, access to a roster list in your oh, uh, just locals and stuff. Yeah, like, oh, just who in that yeah. um, in that uh, list have you had some experience with? For sure. Oh God is. How do you not get distracted by the comments rolling in here? Oh, it's like we have, <laughs> we have so many threads, and I, as a teacher, I like to tie up the loose ends. I'm like, oh, I wanted to. Oh, that then point. this is probably point, so <laughs> driving you crazy. Oh, I can I can manage it too. You know? Sure. Uh, but uh, well, I, I know I saw a comment on there that we were talking about a lot of the people at the very top. Um, Alexander Lamb, I think he's Lammy Lamb on Instagram. Oh, go Michael. That's is nice. taking a whiskey shot? Of course. Okay. <laughs> uh, also, this is going to be ADD episode, uh, stream here. I got something else. I'm going to bring some props out for this, awaiting the arrival of someone at Whiskey Basin here. Uh, oh. So Alexander Lamb, I wanted to shout him out because he's 
a doctor in the area. He has a crazy schedule, of course, works super hard. He does train with uh, Sarah and Melissa quite a bit. Um, Bib number one two seven. He's moving soon, and he's just had this mission before he moves on somewhere else. He, I know he's um, better friends with uh, them, so I, I'm not sure where he's going next. But I just know his last thing before moving was, let me sign up for Cocodona 250 so I can see all the main trails in Arizona. Are you seeing him on there? Yeah, I know. Alexander is uh, having a pretty good race. He's uh, uh, He should be hitting uh, Camp Kippa probably within the right. next two hours. So, so uh, Yeah, and we saw him saw a it. few times early on, and he was actually running with uh, another Flagstaff local, Kerry Henderson, uh, who's oh. back after uh, you know a finish last year. Wanting to get the uh, that full course experience, wanting to get through that first uh, mm-hmm. thirty five miles. Um, oh, she was on so. my short list that I would mention as well. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, incredible runner there, crewed by uh, one of my good friends, Austin Corbett, co founder of Peak Trail Runners, and yeah, she's kind of trying to crack the code by going for it again, uh, and she um, works for the nonprofit Wilderness uh, Volunteers. So we've worked with them for, um, you know, just important events, trail maintenance. She's just so heavily involved and really an activist for preserving the very trails that she's running on right now. Yeah, and another interesting thing, I can't let uh, a Carrie Henderson mention go without noting she's yes. from the great state of Illinois. So uh, DeKalb, Illinois. Yes. <laughs> I believe I believe she's a U of I alum, though, so I don't think she went to NIU, but... DeKalb, don't Illinois. have her, famous, don't have her whole bio, but famous she's for Illinois. Cindy Crawford and Barb Wire. Yep, two things from uh, DeKalb, hey. Illinois, I and everybody love... else in my family with a college degree went to NIU. I'm literally the the uh, black sheep of the family, having come out here to go to ASU. So, mm-hmm. but then I stayed here, and now they're all moving out here. So. But, uh, but yeah, um, you know, I'm really glad to have you out here, you know, and we're going to, you know, be hanging out here tonight. Uh, uh, this is the Cocodona 250. I'm Chris Warden. This is uh, Roy Monahan, the trail gangsta himself. Uh, what you're seeing right now is the Whiskey Row uh, aid station. Yes, indeed. There is not a lot going on there right now, but they are getting ready for runners to start hitting Whiskey Row. We generally expected the runners to first hit anywhere between 10 p.m. and midnight. The closer to 10 p.m., personally, the better. Uh, We'd love to see uh, our our top uh, runners hit uh, that aid station before we go off the air tonight. Yeah, my guess is just based on where they hit Camp Kippa that they're going to be probably pretty close to like that 1030 to 11 uh, time frame. So. We'll, we'll keep an here. eye on when they come through uh, Friendly Pines because that'll give us, you know, a much better indicator at that point. They're seven miles out. We'll pick them up probably uh, a couple miles from the aid station with some of our runner cams. Um, so, yeah, once they hit Friendly Pines, we should uh, should have maybe a, a little bit better of an idea. Uh, of where they're at. And it looks like the last update I'm seeing, Killian Korth updated nine minutes ago at mile 69.4. Mm-hmm. Uh, so about a mile and a half from Friendly Pines as of uh, about nine minutes ago. So, um, yeah, and Verstig is at mile 68.6, and he just updated. So he's about two and a half miles out. Okay. Um, uh, what you're seeing now, uh, it looks like they've got a fire pit set up at Whiskey Row. Uh, I did see uh, the Prescott area trail runners uh, getting things set up. I saw Paula Olson in the uh, aid station there. Paula is a, uh, a runner and volunteer here in the, uh, the, uh, the Aravipa trail running community. Uh, this is Camp Kippa. Camp Kippa is about 63 miles in. It's a bit away from everything. So, uh, you know, we take what we can get out there. Thanks to Courtney, who is on the course there uh, filming at Camp Kippa. We're grateful to have your, uh, uh, your presence out there and uh, bringing us what you can. Um, uh, right now, uh, the run has kind of slowed down a little bit. Um, and the, the packs have, have separated. So... This is to be expected. This is the kind of thing that happens in a race like this. It's, 
it's fun to have, you know, big groups and packs of, of runners, especially, you know, fast runners making their way through. But sometimes we have uh, these times and that's, you know, where we get to have a little bit of fun and get to explore. One of the things that you did was after uh, dark, but talk. Yeah, this is Air Vipe After Dark. This is what it's all about. But I will say, you know, they, they might be uh, trying to decide if, you know, they keep moving at night, getting some sleep. We kind of wonder how, how much of a toll the heat took on them. So I guess that's what we're about to discover here. What is the longest race that you've run to this point? Is it 100K or have you done anything beyond that? You know, I've topped out at 100K, a Lake Sonoma 100K. It was kind of a weird off year where they took away the golden ticket status. So um, I think they've brought it back. But anyway, it turned out to be, I think, bonus five or six miles. and Oh, 100 degree heat, similar to what the Canyons 100K runners just dealt with, and mm -hmm. 100 milers. But uh, yeah. So, um, how I would you. I haven't quite had to take a trail nap. Never. Okay. That's so, my I, that's confession. what I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah. I need to get my street cred up with that. Never taking a trail nap. <laughs> so, it sounds like you our. Guys? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm a back of the packer who's done, uh, you know, some, some longer stuff. So, absolutely. I've been. Uh, I've, I've slouched down, uh, you know, against a tree or two in my yeah. day for sure. Uh, we're getting I'm word a former that road and track guy. If you think I'm taking a trail map, you're out of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I asked the question. Not everyone has. Uh, we have a headlamp and we have, Oh, we have our first, uh, or first person in a while to hit. Was that, uh, I, I didn't get, was that, uh, uh, Mika or was that, uh, Chris? Yeah, this is the part of the night where it's kind of hard to tell. Let's get the headlights coming in here. And is that, that's a dog in the That's the Chris right there, yeah. <laughs> Where? Did I miss that? There's a little, I, uh, off to the side. I don't think so this is the live saw, one, and dog. this is the what they see on YouTube. Oh, so oh you, you're going to want to okay. watch this one. Okay, um, see, hey, I'm, I'm learning on the he's spot learning his, He's finding his way around the studio. I love yeah, it. guys. And it looks like based on the tracker, again, not a, not foolproof Ooh, by any two means. two headlamps. But it should be probably Christopher, Mika, and Don Greenwald all kind of mm -hmm. uh, fairly close. That's, That's Don right for there. For sure, yeah. And that might have been Mika, was... yeah. So, yeah, they all came in uh, within about two minutes of one another. I just want to shout out Don for uh, consistently wearing, like, easily identifiable clothing. She for knows she what she's doing. One. Uh, she's done it so far today. It's like, oh, I can pick her out because she's wearing the bright pink yeah. shirt. Yeah. That's Don. Strategic. Yeah, you know? absolutely. It makes it easier for us to be able to identify you. So, yeah, Don uh, definitely... Uh, I, I think I actually joked with her about it once. It's like, you know, she's very easily recognizable when she's out there. Even when she wasn't racing last year at Cocodona, she yeah. was running alongside uh, some Senior of the final finishers. Beaver Street. Uh, Absolutely. Some of our final finishers. And it took me a second. I was like, wait a minute. That's Don Greenwald right there. So, yeah. So when even when she's not running this race, she is all in and being a part of it. So, so. bright colors, advantage for the spectators, disadvantage if you're trying to compete. What do you think? Because I know the uh, – New era Vipa team singlets or T-shirts are a bright yellow. <laughs> Very bright. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, like, I like it. I think that, I don't know. I would be interested in, like, your perspective as to, is it a disadvantage for you as a competitor? Like, you're easily identifiable, right? But I think, uh, like, that becomes, you know, part of the story and part of the brand. I think, yeah, I guess right? I, like you look at like I always, I always relate things back to like college, right? Where it's like the Oklahoma State cross country kits. Like you can pick them out of anywhere because they're bright, bright mm -hmm. orange. Um, I think that I think we need more of that. In and the then sport. there's those days, you know, when you watch cross country meet, and we start to get that at uh, one of the big races there. We had a pack of Air Viper runners, but um. Yeah, you can just see them off in the distance. It's just this. I think it's, it's cool. It's kind of like a statement, you know. It's like, wow, there's one. I remember you'd yeah. kind of count out to see what the score was, and it's. Yeah. I would also love to. I think uh, Finn has talked about it to get some more cross country style scoring uh, in these competitive ultras. 
Well, yeah, and this is probably like a much bigger conversation, but I think that one of the things that ultra running, I was just thinking about this the other night, that ultra running is missing is like the same thing you see in track with like the team aspect. And then that is where I think then you could start to build, um, you know, some of these scored meets. I know that a race in California tried to do it once, maybe did it one year, uh, like almost like a battle of the brands type thing. Uh, but I think it'd be cool to have more of those and a variety of different distances, right? Like, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that that'd be cool, but I'd also love to see more just like training groups. Like think if the Coconino Cowboys had negotiated their contract as a group instead of individually, and then it's like the Hoka Coconino Cowboys or something like it could have been any brand, but an AZ elite with Hoka. Like, but think how cool that would be, you know, um, I don't know. I think that there's a group in Boulder. Like, yeah. what if they, you know, combine together to to do stuff like that? I think some of that could be cool, but I don't know that – I don't know whether the sport is there quite yet. But and I, yeah, it's I like know. an interesting conversation to throw around, yeah, right? Yeah, the team dynamic, there's still some room to grow. Even in Flagstaff, it's like the road and track teams are much more established than the uh, the trail teams. Like, you think there'd be way more trail teams out here, um, but it's kind of – Looks like that was uh, Mika. So. Okay. Uh, Mika Thews just uh, left uh, Camp Kippa ahead of Don Greenwald. Uh, we'll see how long it takes Don and uh, our other runner, we believe, was Chris uh, Chris Saint Jean, but or Saint Jean. But um, I've said it both ways. Yeah, I think somebody step. actually said it was Jean. So Jean. Okay. Yeah. Well, tradition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. He knows what his name is. <laughs> So it was that a Eli- Yeah, that was uh, Eliza? Eliza Lapierre. So uh, we've had uh, we've got a few runners in the uh, the Camp Kippa Aid right now. So if that is the case, then uh, Mika is in second, and Eliza has moved up to third on the women's side because I believe Don Greenwald is still in there. But again, uh, you know. Dawn might not be a known commodity to a lot of people watching from everywhere else, but uh, she's shown that she belongs in the discussion of uh, uh, who is a potential uh, to to win this race or podium this race here because uh, she does have that 20-21 uh, 20, uh, uh, second-place finish where only Maggie Guter will beat her. Yep, yeah, and uh it looks like maybe eliza's uh tracker just hasn't updated in a while and that was maybe why we'd mr mika is is probably through the it's hard to tell if they're out of the aid station or not um until their trackers like update a few times um there is a, a possibility it could slow people down a bit uh it looks like albert's noting that Andrew uh, Glazer and four other runners went off course about a mile. So bound to happen. Yeah, and we'll work to try and get you an update from Race Command on uh, maybe what exactly happened there as well. Interesting that uh, it looks like the top four women have separated themselves by a pretty significant margin um, because the next women after the top four that are here at Camp Kippa uh, include a group of uh, Alicia Jenkins and Sally McRae. Um, and uh, they are about five miles back, which uh, seems like a, a surprisingly uh, large margin for this point in the race. But but who knows? Um, you know, I know that there are a lot of people that are rooting for Sally, and she's had success at everything uh, that she's done. But 200 miles plus is a different animal. And uh, we saw it even last year uh, with, uh, you know, a runner, you know, with the talent level of Eric Sensman. You know, Eric Sensman has won golden tickets and, uh, and you know, raced his way into Western states. But, uh, and he had a very respectable year last year, don't get me wrong. But he wasn't anywhere near the podium because it's just, it, it takes, you know, a different skill set. Now, some people have that skill set to do right. anything they want. And like he had a different being. approach going into it because, um, yeah, even... You know, you get people asking all the time, like, when's Jim Walmsley going to do it? And uh, some of the way these guys race, and I, some people have asked me if I'd like to do it down the road, I think I might just have a totally different mindset where it's such a grind and it's 
kind of a celebration along the way that would be almost a relief not to go for it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that would make sense because yeah, I mean, you're used to, you're a gas pedal guy. You're a guy who, you know, throws down and, and runs very fast for, you know, whether it be, you know, 20, you know, 15, 25, 30, 50 miles, you know, have, have you ever been in a race where you, knew right off the bat you're like okay i've got to stay eased off the gas pedal or you know you got to ease off the gas gas pedal and stay eased off the gas pedal it's a different experience it is yeah completely different experience yeah, but i'd still love to see you do it uh, i've got a taste <laughs> of it with the 100k where it, but it, it just doesn't compare to to what they're doing so we're uh, approaching the uh, well. We're, oh, there's Don Greenwald leaving uh, Camp Kippa right now. Only a couple minutes behind uh, um, uh, the women that uh, left ahead of her, uh, Eliza Lapierre and Mika Thews. As so, I mean, you're talking. It's you exciting know, to see, right? Yeah, two, one three, four. There. One. That's one thing, though. Uh, I mean, you know, in a 200 mile plus race, you know, a few minutes is, is nothing. Um, have you noticed that there's been a sudden jump in the, how tight races get? Uh, I mean, we saw it here in, I have. at Prescott and Whiskey Basin where three hundredths of a, se- or three tenths of a second separated first and second in the 91 K. And then of course we saw it at canyons where it was like literally a sprint finish. Um, why do you think that is? You know, I, I was thinking part of it could be strategy too, as you're getting more top tier athletes, some of their abilities are matched really well. And especially in a race like this, this section at night, I think you just want to have some proximity. There's got to be something pulling you along. Mm-hmm. I, I believe it was uh, Pete who described his kind of epic battle, right? Wasn't it a back and forth? with year one and Dax, I believe. Yeah. So, yeah. For second place, um, you know, strategy. And then I just think, you know, the talent at the top is really increasing. Looks like our, uh, our staff at uh, camp Kip are uh, having a little bit of fun. Uh, they're basically sitting right next to a fire and, uh, I'm glad that they've got that fire right there cause they need to stay warm because, uh, as you can see, uh, well, uh, it might not be like frigidly cold. There's snow on the ground. Right. So it's cold enough that snow has remained in Camp Kippa in the shaded areas. And that looks like a couple feet deep uh, worth of snow that are, that's right next to the side of the building. So, uh, so it's definitely uh, chilly up there. So hoping that uh, they're able to stay warm up there. Um, do we have, I'm going to take a quick peek at the tracker and see if we've got any expected runners hitting Camp Kippa here yeah, sometime. Rebecca was asking if Michael's off course. For Stieg or but, McKnight? Uh, yeah, that would help to clarify. Um, well, there's like four Michaels in the top ten. <laughs> <laughs> Which As Michael? of right now, the only two uh, people who I've gotten confirmation that are off course are Bib76, David Dehen, okay. and Bib143, Bruce Gungle. Okay. Um, those two are... Uh, currently off course, and you can basically, if you're looking on the live tracker, you can see that they took a right-hand turn when they should have made a left, and it looks like David is almost back on course. He's working his way back on the trails there. And Versteeg just uh, pinged back on the course. It, he was his... Uh... And that is one thing to just keep in mind over the next you know few days if you're tuning in at home to the live tracker is you will have some GPS float on uh, on these things. So... You know, sometimes runners may look a little bit off course, like they uh, went off trail and are on the side of a mountain. It's probably just that their uh, GPS tracker has floated a little bit. But we will do our best, if you pointed out to us, to try and get, uh, you know, either confirmation or uh, one way or the other from uh, race command. So we appreciate it either way. I'm going to look back uh, further on the course. Looks like we've just got a handful of runners that have not hit Crown King yet. I'll see if I can get a a more definitive total in terms of runners that have not hit yet hit mile thirty seven. Looks like um, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Maybe about 12 or 13 runners. Um, the furthest back is Brett Barker at mile 29. So Brett has about eight miles to go and two hours and 45 minutes to do it. So not only does Brett have to get into Crown King, but he's got to get out of Crown King as well. Um, I spoke with Brett. I met with Brett yesterday uh, in the streets yeah. of Flagstaff. So uh, I'm hoping We've that... Quite uh, a few people, yeah. Yeah, it's been great. It's been absolutely great. This, you know, the... The energy and, you know, when you see somebody hauling around a bunch of luggage, <laughs> like kind of watering town, you kind of know what they're there for. Welcome to Flagstaff. Like, oh, you're running Coca Dona, mm -hmm. huh? Like you've got duct tape on their luggage because it's got a bib number. and Running stuff just hanging out. Like. Yep. Yeah. So uh, hopefully Brett Barker of uh, Gilbert, Arizona, is able to uh, make the cutoff as well as everybody else who's still on the course. I mean, we do have a, a handful of um, – uh, DNFs actually uh, the most notable name on the DNF list. I can't confirm it 100%, but uh, it looks like it might be uh, the jester at Eddinghausen. Um, if uh, the tracker is accurate, it looks like he his day might have drawn to a close. Uh, um, and really? It's yeah. Bad. Well, and uh, he's very experienced in the oh, heat. He's I run, mean, he loves running in the valley. Does. Yeah, he's run more than he's run more two uh, hundred milers than pretty much anybody. But as I had mentioned to other people, this is not his focus. Like, this is right. a rugged race. Like, he'll go out and he'll run Havelina, and then he'll run four more 100 milers that same month. And he'll be competitive in some of them. Um, you know, he'll go out in a 24-hour race and knock out 125, 130 miles. But, but a rough or rugged race like Cocodona, where you start out with 10,000 feet of climb, you know, I know that uh, having uh, – uh, talked to a couple of the people who have crewed him in the past. You know, he ran Mogollon Monster in the past, and and he he, he it's not that he can't you do got them. A it's a sample there. It's a hard, yeah, gnarly. yeah. It's a hard race, and I'm not saying that he's not built for hard stuff. It's just that he's the kind of guy that's built to go 500 miles in six days, as opposed to you know a race like this, which is a much more uh, uh, technical thing. He's not normally a technical type runner. Maybe still an amazing athlete by any stretch that, of the imagination. That's also what makes it cool. You don't know until you put a runner out there. I see uh, Daniel's kind of speculating like, hey, if, well, Annie ha Hughes has run previously, but if Annie was running again this year, I think Sarah might be giving her a run for her money, which is, you know, kind of that's, interesting. Like, hey, where would people be at this part? But each year has been so different. That's true. Yeah, Amber, uh, the Jester is a repeat bad water uh, runner, so he's used to the heat. The heat is not the issue with the Jester. No. That man has evaporative cooling and heat mitigation strategies like nobody I've ever seen. He's literally wearing a suit out in the desert and still, you know, running sub-2400 milers. He's, he's, that's never the issue with him. Yeah, and I did ask Race Command if the the tracker for DNFs specifically would be one hundred percent accurate, and they said ninety nine point nine percent accurate. Okay. So um, obviously, there's always the one off rare occurrence that like something weird happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but my guess is, if they're listed as a DNF in the tracker that they've uh, chosen to uh, to end their day, so noted. Thanks, Rory. Well, we've like I said, we've only got a handful of people who haven't, who are still on the course, who haven't hit Crown King yet, and uh, let's uh, let's hope that uh, they all make it. I see that the sweep has uh, uh, has caught up to the final couple of runners. Um, uh, Brett Barker is bib number one eight seven. Uh, Stephanie Mitchell bib number two o four. Uh, they're currently about at mile 29.5 to mile 30, and we're going to need to see them get to and get through mile 37 uh, basically uh, by midnight tonight. And uh, as we mentioned, this is Whiskey Row in downtown Prescott. We don't have any runner sightings yet, but as soon as we have them, uh, we will obviously uh, get eyes. I believe that uh, Spider Pena has left Whiskey Row and is making his way out there. Uh, Dan Pena is uh, a very talented runner, and My he's going to be able to keep yeah. up with whoever is in there. He kept up with Versteeg that first year. Um, he's ready. Yeah, he's definitely ready. So, uh, and just to, to preface how ready he is, he is currently 
in his car there we awaiting go. the runners right this where they the meet shot. the uh, Senator Highway. So, or where the Senator Highway starts to hit the road. So he, he he's out there. This... He's ready. Shad is going to go out for the second runner, I believe, as nice. well. So we've got so, a couple guys. So Spider Pena leaves his camera phone on in his car every year. So this is the third year that he's been out here to do this. This, so uh, this is accident right now. <coughs> this no. following gig. And no, he, he sits there at this corner. And okay. he waits. Basically just watching because he knows where the runners come out. And then basically as soon as he sees a headlamp, I'm sure he just springs into action. And, and he knows exactly what he's doing. Camp Kippa, now that we have a We're, there. We are blessed to have Good volunteers to have like that. In your crew for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, you know what I've decided, Chris? What? I'm going to take no more U of A slander for the rest of Spider Pena's shift here. Uh, for, the, for the good graces, <laughs> for, his for, for his sake, you know, he's doing oh, that's kind. Uh, such a great job. So I'll, I'll have none of it. I'll have none of it. All yeah. kidding aside, we'll I say- don't dislike U of A. I, I root against U of A three days a year when we play them in football and in yeah, basketball. It matters who they play. Yeah, I mean, but USC, on the other hand, I can't stand that school. USC is my least favorite uh, school uh, in the NCAA. And all of uh, Los Angeles just turned the live stream off. Thank oh. you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, why did, why did our numbers drop so shortly? Uh, man, and I, I just want to shout out the, the great work you're doing here with producing and announcing. I mean, I think, I think it's cool to talk about it live on there. The numbers are strong compared to what I've seen past couple of years, like 15 or – 1500 steady throughout the day yeah so i and guess i got to shout out the people watching too but I yeah think thank you to everybody you're putting out well you know the 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 visuals have been great today it looks like we have our next oh. set of runners coming in or is that a car i think it's a vehicle doubling back uh yeah yeah no that's... runners allowed to get in vehicles okay <laughs> Yeah, we had that. Uh, <laughs> you already talked about that. Okay, okay. okay. No, sure no, I, we didn't. Getting... We didn't talk about it. But uh, for uh, those that aren't, I'm from... sure that joke's going to get cracked a lot. But hey, at the very least, it it did suck to see that. But that's the most I've heard ultra running talked about on the major news networks. Oh well, I've had that discussion with people and too. You've had that too, yeah. One of the things about this, and I get it. Like people get frustrated who love trail and ultra running that the only stories that get any run in the mainstream press are the negative types of stories. I mean, if you look at the last three that I could think of, the recent story where uh, the runner, a former world record holder in the 48 hour gets into a car and accepts a ride right. and accepts the finisher award. Uh, prior to that, it was uh, um, uh, Kelly Agnew. It, uh, across the years. I mean, you know, why? Because the mainstream media can kind of throw jabs at like, haha, runner porta potty jokes. Well, you know, I, I get it. I don't like it, but I understand why. I mean, there are so many things that they could be celebrating in our sport. You know, whenever somebody like, you know, when, uh, when a runner does some sort of amazing thing or breaks like a long, a long existing record, like when Nick Curry broke the, you know, American 24 hour record that had stood for several years or, you know, something of that, you know, that level when Courtney DeWalter not only beats, you know, not only wins a race, but like, ba- you know, destroys the field in a 200 mile race and beats everybody male or female by 10 hours. You know, those are things that they could easily be celebrating, but they choose not to. Why? Because we care about it as a running community, but everybody else is like, oh, well, cool. Meanwhile, the morning show fodder is far more fueled by, oh, runner hides in porta yeah. potty to win race. They, they are looking for the clicks. Yeah. I will say as impressive as the ultra running feats are, and there's so many different races, it's really hard to wrap your mind around how hard this, these events are and what it involves. So you can explain that to the average person and they'll be like whatever, but everyone has some basic gauge of, Oh, that marathon time, like Boston? Oh, that that time? Under three hours? Okay, that's fast. I ran a mile in uh, middle school or high school, so I can at least compare Mm -hmm. myself to that. So that's part of the challenge. But, hey, I'd say sometimes no press. Or what is the saying? Bad? Uh, 
bad press is better than no press. Bad, yeah. I mean, yeah. Good it, press is bad press. That's the saying I'm looking for. And then you get people, yeah, they click on it. They, they might go down that rabbit hole and get kind of interested in it. I think one of the – some runners – wasn't some runner on, out there stumbled across a blog article, and that's how they got into trail running? Oh, that happens all the I time. Mean, I mean, yeah. you know, I we I wish I could remember – we've had a couple of instances where people talked about that, where they were like, hey – uh, somebody tuned in earlier today to the live stream saying, I just discovered trail running 20 minutes ago after watching a video on Sally McRae's YouTube channel. And now they tuned into the Cocodona right. live stream. Like we love the organic growth. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes you have to roll with the punches when you talk about trail and ultra running because, you know, it, yeah, it, you know, a story like, you know, the you know runner getting into a car during a race or, you know, something like that you know, is a bit of a, a punch in the gut. But if it causes them to go down a rabbit hole and explore a little bit more and find some intrigue and potentially, yeah, you know, grow the sport, right you know, you can turn the positive negative into a positive. Exactly. We're getting there. We're making progress. And we're, then to add on to that, what, as we're looking at this view here, what's unique about these races, the way you get the average person to care about the sport and get into it, I can't tell you living so close to downtown Flagstaff how many non-runners take an interest because they work downtown, they're shopping downtown, and when they see it coming through their city and they take notice and then they start asking questions like, wait, they went how far? Wait, they started where? And that's one of my favorite things um, about this race. Yeah, the, the scenery is incredible, but seeing the locals' reactions in town. Do we have any more shots left of Crown King? Do we have any lighting out there on that? Okay, so we've uh, wrapped up our filming at the Crown King A. We will still try and keep track of the runners that uh, we'll keep an eye to see if uh, the runners that are uh, striving to reach uh, Crown King, the first major checkpoint and cutoff, uh, the runners have to make that point mile 37 by five minutes to midnight. And, uh, uh-oh. <laughs> oh, no, you keep doing your thing. Okay. Sharpie. Sharpie. Yeah, no, as, as we get to <laughs> everybody the after dark, you know, teacher. I got all kinds of little games and activities at my disposal. When I'd see the, the eyes glazing over, attention shifting, I'd have, you know, something to, uh, to get the students engaged. So. Oh, no. Do I look glazed over? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. It's a metaphor. Okay. I mean, for how many hours have you put in tonight? Because you look fresh. Well, do I really? I, I don't know where I don't know where I'm at right now. Like, I mean, I we started what time to this morning today, Matt? Four thirty. So we were on the air at four thirty. I stayed on till about nine, and then I worked my day job from nine till about four thirty. And then you had soccer practice, so I came in and produced and hung out with Finn and Brett. And now I'm back here, so it's been a, a long day. It's a grind. It's, it's a grind, but it's a fun grind. Yeah. So you look look fresh. You don't smell well, fresh. But well, yeah, I'm oh. sure I probably don't smell any, like <laughs> anything playing, great man. right now. Uh, is Chad is asking if there's coverage at Friendly Pines. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any cameras out there. It's one of those more remote places. Uh, one of the things that I do want to stress is that um, once we hit like satis or the Satisfy Fane Ranch and Mingus, the coverage gets better, at least at the aid stations that we're going to be at. I think that we get a little bit better coverage as, as time goes on. I mean, Crown King itself is like the only place you can get coverage within, you know, 15 miles in any direction. Like Crown King is truly remote. It just happens to have enough infrastructure there. So the hope is that, for instance, by this time tomorrow when the, the lead runners are hitting Sedona and beyond, uh, that uh, we'll be able to, um, you know, have uh, – you know, multiple uh, aid station um, follow cams hanging out. So, uh, but uh, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to let runners know that we're asking about where we were at or where we weren't. So, mm -hmm. but right now we're just uh, hanging out, watching a, uh, sitting by the fire at Whiskey Row, kind of. Soothing. Well, I, I know um, previously we were anticipating what possibly Whiskey Row 11 
45 arrival. Hopefully before then. Hopefully I was hoping by that, closer 10 to 11. Yeah. And remind me what mile that's at. That would be at mile 78. 78. So, yeah, I, I definitely think we'll we'll see our first come person come in there. Um, I thought we could kind of make it a little interesting, though. Oh, no. Got a couple. Where is this going to be visible? Whiskey shooters here. All okay. right. In addition, I always have, like I said, my teacher props. <laughs> I was thinking we could perhaps make – some kind of prediction that we put here on who's coming in first since we have, you know, the top two are, are pretty close. Things could change up. You never know. Sure. And we could maybe put a prediction so it's visible for our audience. And then depending who gets it right or wrong, we uh, take a shot of whiskey. Okay. Thoughts on that? I, I'm, I'm game. Originally, my idea was just, hey, let's celebrate that someone made it to Whiskey Road tonight. <laughs> and I would take the maker's mark because that's – what I want, and you, you get the, the fireball, and I, and I would get the Liam. It's a ma- <laughs> the Liam, the Liam. He said earlier. Speaking of names getting mispronounced, is it how, really? I can't believe someone got Liam wrong. Liam. <laughs> oh, I thought I, I no, I thought you said it was. The no, li- I was messing with. Oh my god! No, but that's what he said in the the chat because uh, we had a bunch of people say, "Oh, my name gets uh, said this way." So anyway, you're right. Eight station fireball, and I got Maker's Mark. This actually has a little nostalgic value to me, so I was going to take Do that. Tell. Plus, um, Pete always has this on hand. Right? It's a maker's – oh, no, he likes uh, monkey shoulder. Too. Yeah. Either or. He's a whiskey He likes guy. whiskey. You're monkey gonna, shoulders, buffalo trace, he loves it all. He's probably going to laugh at the size of the whiskey. He's like, okay. And I think we may have just seen Michael McKnight go into Camp Kippa. All right. Michael McKnight at Camp Kippa. Um, staying within shouting distance of the leader, uh, leaders on the men's side. Uh, he's not uh, hanging out up front, but uh, definitely uh, doing very well at this point. So he's, uh, I believe, the seventh male to hit uh, Camp Kippa. Yeah, we still have those top four females, four females in the top ten. I look right. Let's see. And yeah, as far as uh, the front of the race, uh, Killian Korth, his his uh, GPS last pinged 43 minutes ago at mile 69.4. If I were to just say conservatively that he was doing 15 minute miles at this point, that uh, he would probably be. His pace at that time was 3.1 miles per hour. Okay, so maybe go down to three miles an hour. But that could have been that could have pinged on an uphill section or yeah. something where he was high, like that's a hike. So for oh, I think for a runner like that, that's that would be him hiking. So I would assume he's probably yeah averaging maybe somewhere between uh, 15 to 15 to like 17, 18 minutes. So we could see him about by 10:30. Yeah, he. I would imagine that he is still kind of right on what um, my like expected predictions were for um, like our live stream planning purposes. So I'm guessing that he is through Friendly Pines and was probably through Friendly Pines at least ten minutes ago. I agree. Um, which would then, in theory, put him at Whiskey Row around ten thirty, ten forty five. So, uh, Spider Pena, you're on, uh, you're on watch. Well, Spider Pena, one, he said he's running angry because the Suns are losing. Uh, <laughs> and two, he, he has said that, uh, he said that he's going to be staying as late as he has to to see, uh, some of his friends coming through. So, oh, game over at that. oh, yeah. that Suns game was not pretty. That's not good. And Courtney says that was not McKnight, that was Bib 63. So, I apologize. McKnight should be there, but we may have just missed him come through the feed. So that was Bib 63 Austin, Austin, Austin Newblum. Cali. McKinleyville. Yeah, it's hard to I tell see, uh, because McKnight oh, Chris... hasn't updated in uh, 26 minutes there. Oh, wow. So um, I want to take a moment, uh, uh, if you can pull up the comment from Kirsten Alexander. Um, I mentioned that I'd met Brett Barker yesterday on the streets of uh, Flagstaff, but uh, 
Uh, if everyone can cheer on my brother-in-law, Brett Barker, that would be so great. He lost his dad a couple of weeks ago and really wants to complete this race for himself and his dad. It's going to be one of those stories, man. <laughs> it just tugs at the heartstrings. Uh, like I said, I just met Brett yesterday. He didn't mention any of that. Um, I, I was talking to him as he was packing his stuff into the, the shuttle bus for the runners that headed down to Black Canyon City. And uh, he was feeling optimistic. He, he felt like he could grind it out. And so now, you know, that just shows you that everybody's got a story and you definitely want to um, you know, see, you know, see him succeed here. I, I would love nothing more than to see him, you know, hit that cutoff and uh, continue his story here. At We've Copidon. got Kevin Goldberg doing what Kevin Goldberg does these days. He's uh in the live chat comments while out on course racing uh, the event. So shout out to uh, shout out to Goldberg for uh, for tuning in again. He did this a lot last year as well, and it was uh, it was always fun. Maybe uh, later on in the race, depending on how you're doing, Kevin, we'll uh, we'll send you a link to check in. So many batteries. Yeah, because he's on his phone. He, yeah, he's... he can't just stop and <laughs> can't just stop and charge it up. You Are know? there any it's Kevin close. Goldberg fans in the chat? I don't think he had. I think actually after last year, after all the harassment they gave us, he told them not to come to the <laughs> to the chat for me. No. Got a couple coming through there. After. I'm, just, I'm kidding. just kidding. We there's a bunch of uh, Kevin Gold. They've been uh, much tamer this year, you know. Yeah, but I think that maybe uh, maybe their day jobs are more uh, more intense. Well, than, we've seen more of Goldberg this year on the camera too. Yep. See, than in so years they past. They of course, he's uh, been at the very front of the race too. He's been in the early. top five most of the day. Well, and we know him now. <laughs> That's true. That is <laughs> shout true. Out to, shout out to Kevin. Nothing but love for Kevin a lot Goldberg. Of Glaze fans, Andrew Glaze. I did want to yeah go back to Brett Barker and just note you know obviously that's. That's something I was kind of talking about with some friends. First of all, how do you even fall asleep before an event this big and the pressure, let alone all the life stress you're carrying with you? And then on top of that, grief is, you know, one of the hardest things to to power through. I will say um, some of my best races, though, have come after lower points in my life or challenging points, and it's just a matter of how you channel that en energy. And I've, I've found um, – coaching some athletes through hard races like attaching a personal meaning like that's why some of those charity events when you run for someone mm -hmm. a larger purpose obviously are gonna be able to get more out of it so yeah of course our condolences to brett but i hope he can turn that grief into something magical with his finish and i'm sure it's going to be emotional throughout but i Really love to follow up on that story when he finishes. Well said. I think that that's a fantastic way to put it, Rory. Thank you. So we were also talking about this. Uh, you had a a story or a oh. something you wanted to do here. Yeah, switch gears. Well, can keep it light too. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like a lesson plan. Uh, shout out any teachers out there. I'm guessing. They're already in bed because they, <laughs> <laughs> they got a, their lesson plans already created. They got to get up super early. I used to live that lifestyle. Now I'm just a substitute teacher, so I, I do it a little bit less. But um, at the time, I, folk, I spent a lot of time, like especially that first year, just coming up with ideas in the classroom that would be entertaining. So this could be one of those examples where it might be a flop or it could just be funny, and I like a visual. But I was thinking – Originally, I was just thinking we could do a celebratory shot when mm -hmm. someone gets to Whiskey Row, like the first two runners. But I thought we could up the ante. I know you're into sports betting, aren't you? Um, Are you on those apps? Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, huh. free trail doesn't count. No, I, I've been known to log on and make a couple of uh, wild and crazy uh, prognostications. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, have you had time to tweet today? By the way, I don't think I actually I have. Say. Yeah, speaking it's of, it's been a quiet day on Twitter for Chris. <laughs> anyway, I mean, we still have that that b battle up top. I think that's worth placing a bet on. We could we could uh, each pick someone. I might write a Michael Versteeg on the sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. You could write Killian Korth. Maybe I don't know. I'm pacing Sarah later. Maybe I write Sarah's name down. But the point is. Um, maybe we can do it in a way where the audience sees it, mm -hmm. but then can we look past it? Is this going to work? I don't know. I'll, I'm game Let's for whatever. It. How do we do this? 
All right. How about this? Let's just each write our prediction. We're probably going to see it because we're going to be looking at ourselves here. We could but just put it face be down. Oh. I mean, or we could like each hand it to Matt, like, and he could. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Let's see. I'm just going to write whiskey row prediction first coming through. Okay. What are you thinking out there? Are we going to have much shuffling in the next few miles? And by few, it's we're coming in at 78 miles. So yeah, so about uh, 10 miles or give or take. Uh, you know, I, there's, you know, maybe a little bit of variance with the with the tracker and the ping, but whiskey row prediction. First name, first initial. We'll each write our prediction for the first to come through Whiskey Row. You want me to just tell you mine? Sure. I, I think that Killian is going to come through first. That's a safe bet. Well, not safe. You're, he's in second there, so. Hmm. But you got Whiskey Man himself. Yeah. The year he won it, he was first through there. Mm-hmm. If I recall, uh, Drew Freeze got out to a hot start. Oh, Drew was running hot, very hot. Literally hot and then mm-hmm. overheated. But Verstegen, who was second uh, that first year? Mike McKnight. Pete? Mike McKnight. Well, uh, no, the first year, Pete. Mike McKnight was in second at this oh, point. Oh, at this point. Okay, row. yeah. Okay. So that is bolds. Okay, I'm going to write Killian for you. It's tough. Whiskey man just seems logical to me. I, I think he's just going to power through. <laughs> he knows those trails so well. He's going to come in strong, get energy boost off that. He's fueled by his new drink. So, <sighs> But I have a lot of faith in Sarah, too. I mean, she's coming out the gate strong. Yeah, I don't know, because Versteeg won't be able to get his flota until uh... – <laughs> until uh, later in the race at uh, Fain Ranch. So, yeah, I'm going with uh, the current. uh, Let's see how my handwriting is here. I'll try to make it nice and bold. No rush here. We're just, we're chilling. (laughs) How is your uh, handwriting? Terrible. As a student, and st- awful. Well, that's one of the things that remains constant, right? Basically, what your handwriting is like when you're a kid <laughs> is what it's like later on. <laughs> well, my handwriting is like that of a child, so <laughs> oh, okay, it's so pretty he's... bad. <laughs> Yours is actually pretty good, so I'm really good at like bubble letters, kind of graffiti style stuff. Uh, so I'll take it. We're going to be bouncing around, John. We're going to have the feed from Kippa coming in, and we're also going to keep things at Whiskey Row as well. We're going to be uh, – those are the only two places that it seems like we might have uh, a solid signal at until uh, our follow filmer, Spider Pena, catches uh, whoever is the first one to town in Prescott. How are you doing beverage-wise, otherwise? Good? Oh, I'm good. It's feeling you today. Liquid death, caffeine? Liquid death has been keeping me going for sure. Also had a nice uh, cup of coffee with heavy cream. That was fantastic. Dairy-based, non-dairy? Dairy-based. I shouldn't (laughs) um, because I am... Lactose intolerant, but sometimes you just got to fade it. Our most recent runners have hit uh, Camp Kippa. We'll see if we can determine who those individuals are. Do you guys write your predictions down yet? Yes. Because I want to give an update. Uh Uh-oh. 
All right. At Friendly Pines, Mike Versteeg, 16 hours, 37 minutes. Killian Korth, 16 hours, 38 minutes. Oh. He, see, now it's finalized. I predicted that Michael Versteeg would come through first at Whiskey Row, Whiskey Man himself. And you're going with Killian Korth. Yep. I, I have faith in Sarah. I like the way she's running. I think she's a lot more strategic this year. So I like exactly where she's at. No need to press on the gas here late at night. Um, yeah, someone else holding a picture of Michael taking a shot of whiskey. So it fits his style, personality. Sarah, I got to say, very disciplined. I think that's another factor with her training. Um, she has very sporadically has – like a beer here, there, but I don't know. I could probably count them, at least the ones I'm seeing. So ultimately, I, I think that's a benefit to her training. Just focused. Get that quality sleep, <laughs> which we're not going to get. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get a, we'll get it in bits and pieces here. But uh, so we have a, our friendly prediction wager. Yep. Did we do it right? Like, do I have to write it? backwards because of the i guess no it'll the, it'll flips it right yeah okay i think does it can you all read this yeah yeah that's okay. what i got cool all right um so we have someone in the camera here but i don't think anyone's come through we have is it six through Camp Kippa? I'm still trying to get a, a feel for this. I'm a MacBook guy. Seeing how this is treating me. Six through team. Kippa? Oh, we've got more than that. No, way more. And I think we've got more like 10 or 11 through Kippa at this point. So Mike McKnight is right behind Don. So that was Mike McKnight there. We thought it might have been because uh, three people came in at the same time. It was Dawn, uh, Mika, and a gentleman that uh, we thought was McKnight. Then uh, we weren't quite sure. But, yeah, so it sounds like it was um, Michael McKnight uh, that had come in uh, with Dawn and uh, Mika. And then we – did we miss Christopher St. Jean coming through? Uh, he came in a little bit earlier. I don't know if I noted him. Maybe I was getting my setup ready. I'm not familiar with uh, 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 Christopher at all. Um, I guess he's a local here. Is that Goldberg right there? Yes, it is. Mm. Them Goldberg shorts that we couldn't figure out whether it was. Uh, Man, he's is he watching the live stream and he didn't even come over and say hi or wave? Yeah, what the, what's That's the deal, Kevin? Disappointing. I wonder if we can get a little <clears throat> sound bites. I mean, you know. We, we hear all about it when we don't give Goldberg enough love, and then he just blows us off. Wow. We'll see more of him. We will see plenty of uh, Kevin Goldberg uh, throughout the race. Does he have a Duolingo uh, streak going? Is that what somebody yeah. does? <laughs> hey, I, I approve of that more than like those Snapchat streaks. So I think there's a little bit more. That's a thing. Depth, credibility, yeah. As a, a teacher, and uh, I also lead some trips in the summer to foreign countries. That's right, like I'm going yeah. to Croatia and France this summer. Oh, nice. Uh, one thing that I've had happen, it's, I've been in Costa Rica and Fiji, and these part of the trip as we go somewhere remote, these kids are desperately uh, sending messages to their friends back home, hey, log into my Snapchat and keep the streak going with my friend because <laughs> – some of them have like two year streaks and stuff. So I've done Duolingo, but I can't remember what kind of incentives they give you there to keep it going. But I think it's like learning a new language would be the incentive you'd think. Well but. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds easy, but what makes you actually want to click into that? They give you little points and you get a little badge. <laughs> so So uh are you feeling like uh maybe sharing a little bit of your talent here? Uh Ooh. Are we at that point? I don't know. Are you <laughs> at that point? <laughs> uh, uh. Is there something that inspires you that uh, you were thinking about wanting to, uh, I guess, uh, uh, to throw a rhyme out there about? I don't know. It's up to you. Uh, this is uh, 
this is your floor right now. There's a lot right of now. potential. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on in the chat. We've got, yeah. uh, you know, this potential. amazing race, uh, these uh, awesome athletes. Uh, you know, it's a, a really cool environment, you know, Cocodona. I mean, like I said, I wish we could figure out the tech and get your uh, your video on from last year's Cocodona. I Because I've just... It, it cracks me up. <laughs> like how hard, okay, I'm going to spin back to that for just a second. Right. Uh, you filmed that video with uh, uh, Sarah Ostaszewski last year. And Melissa. And Melissa. And how hard was it for them to keep a straight face? <sighs> P, uh, you know, I will say they're used to it. They, Cause they were mean mugging there. Like they really yeah. were. <laughs> there was a lot of uh, outtakes where we were laughing. I'd say the hardest part was um, it was just the middle of the day downtown and people are walking by like, what are you doing? Why are you wearing short shorts? Like standing on, you know, the wall there, you know. Yeah, there were some people dancing. walking yeah. by. <laughs> Through a chair in the middle of the square where normally the finish line would be. So honestly, yeah, I, I they were they were cracking smiles a bit, but I think I kind of anyone who hangs out with me a lot. If you're based here, at some point you're going to get asked to film a video, and uh, <laughs> before I potentially spit some bars, I would Guilty. like to know Chris is in one of the OG Trail Gangsters <laughs> videos. Shh, don't tell anybody. Way back. Uh, and imagine this: I play a basically a a running wannabe. Oh man! Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, the hit is That's So Trail, and it, it originally launched. It, it's responsible for the inception of Trail Gangsters. Made a video called That's So Trail, and we got a backhanded compliment from Runner's World. They published <laughs> uh, an article about it. They called me up. They interviewed me. And then the headline that came out was like, oh, they think it's funny, and they're sharing it. And then it's like, this rap music video about trail running is so bad, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> like, man, okay, whatever. But it did give us a little boost, and it got shared, and it's the first thing that made me realize, like, hey, I should uh, continue doing this. And yeah. Anyway, uh, with that video, it was more than a one-day shoot. Like, uh, Yeah, that was the Coco. a big I, project. I planned it out, and I'd go to a group run, and it was the early days of Air Vipa. I'd be at one of the – smaller races and i you know ask someone hey can you do this can you look like you have a cramp i forget what i asked you to do something outrageous i had to walk through uh the old i run store with you oh right right and uh basically yes. act like oh, i was yeah. trying on a sack of shoes and oh, like I was, I was this big like wannabe runner that thought if i bought all the gear that it would make me a runner yeah it's you, funny how things turn out doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> you know honestly that one's so far back from my memory. Now, of course, you got the fir you got the opening verse, so you're right in there. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I look. I'm gonna have to watch that yeah. again sometime. To me, it's kind of like any artist. Um, your early work, you can sort of cringe at it, but then, you know, I'm still proud of it too. So. So yeah, it, you know, I mean, you know, we're under no like not like you have to come up with something in a couple minutes here but if you want to think about it over yeah. you know while we're hanging out here and uh you know something comes to mind and you'd like to share you know we'll see if we can mm -hmm. uh well here's something i'll address it very briefly i know we got a little lull as we await runners to whiskey row and we we see if our predictions are correct um i do dub my weekly video freestyle friday and sometimes i get into not arguments, but just debates with people on social media who like rap. And um, a lot of people say, hey, do a freestyle. So that's the hardest art form impromptu. So I, I very rarely do that. Um, sometimes I'll do it live. I've done it on the Trail Gangsta's channel and Instagram. So I don't know. I, I think I might save that for like the last, last hour of the show. But I do have a set list always on hand. <laughs> so I can definitely uh, – lend you a verse or two so how's that sound yeah yeah absolutely I, i'm i'm happy to hear you share whatever yeah. you feel comfortable Air sharing but after dark as europe is waking up we have some international people tuning in so good morning yeah good morning to those of oh. you who are just waking up to us aaron's driving to chamonix lucky he <laughs> gets morning miles in um Oh, the Are squirrel's you... nut butter video at Big Pine. I remember that oh, one. Oh, and then we got that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that... Call back to you, calls back to your uh, early, uh, your work, your early catalog. Yeah, yeah. I could. 
I don't know. If we need some commercial breaks, I would like to show that one because visually I like that. That's another thing. Um, I, I'm happy to perform live, but they're often created with a visual in mind, so it, it's like a package deal. Yeah. But at the Aravipa team retreat, um, it's become a tradition year or two on the team. Uh, usually on one of the nights, uh, usually like the last night, we do our training runs, photo shoot. Evening we hang out you know, grill, have some drinks and performed a little concert. Uh, so one of those was up on Instagram of short shorts. Oh, nice. Rap, so. I'll have to check that out. Cause I know you've performed elsewhere too. I know you performed at born to run, mm -hmm. you know, I... that, yeah, that was, that was tied in with that. So trail. So the early mm -hmm. days and yeah, I love it. Um, it's something I was actually fairly shy in middle school. It wasn't until I kind of realized I had this just fun knack for writing and I became an English major and, you know, doing this, that I kind of built confidence from it. So, uh, folks who, who are just tuning in, uh, it sounds like we've got some people waking up uh, on the uh, the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, I'm Chris Warden. This is uh, Roy Monahan. Uh, we've got uh, Matt Feldake behind the glass uh, handling the production. Uh, Rory is uh, a local here in Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, uh, also known as the Trail Gangsta, and. Uh, um, if you're interested in seeing some of his stuff, I guess uh, share uh, your social media so people can uh, uh, check your uh, stuff yeah, out. Sure thing. It's at Trail Gangsters with an AZ. Emphasis on the AZ. Obviously an O to Arizona. Oh, yeah, we can put that in there. So. Yeah, I, I highly encourage you to check him out. Like, you know, and it's not just like, you know, like a rap video that you're making up all the time. You're also like creating memes. And, you know, I know that uh, you had talked, uh, I believe uh, how you had um, uh, communicated with uh, Liam, a station fireball about, uh, you know, your, your common interest in, uh, uh, you know, just having fun with a, an activity with a sport that you love. Oh, for sure. It's been fun to watch it evolve and, Shout out Aid Station Fireball and any accounts that do funny content. I'd say trail runners overall, having that road and trail background, tend to have more fun and or tend to be more lighthearted than road runners. But still, sometimes it's like people are taking it way too seriously. So yeah. I kind of like to be the counterculture and really, I don't know, just make light of stuff and people seem to respond. And I think humor is essential. Yeah, no, you, it, it's it's always a lot of fun, you know. I mean, whether it be you know uh, something that you're coming up with off the top of your head, or if it's one of those uh, video productions that you do uh, take more time with. That's one of the cool things about it is that you know I've seen both. You know, I mean, uh, excuse me, uh, that year that you did that having a hundred video, you threw that together in like hours. It's quick like too. it was fast, and I love that thing. I would love to like, it, folks, if you go to the YouTube uh, channel for Trail Gangsters, of course, after we're off the air, and uh, check out some of Roy's videos. You know, they're anywhere from 60 seconds to maybe two and a half minutes, and they're some of them are fantastic. And he's, just, you know, so clever at times. Well, they're saying one. you're the little dicky of trail Lil running Dickie here. Trail That's actually, running. he's got bars, man. <laughs> hey, respect, and I love that show as well. <laughs> I am caught up. Uh, I don't watch a lot of shows, but I kind of like that one because it's ADD. I can jump into it quickly, and uh, it's funny. I respect a uh, little Dicky. I'll, I'll take it. It used to be Eminem, you know, mm. in uh, high school when I I did a talent show one time. Someone or people called me Eminem, so I was cool with that. But uh, uh, but hey, before I got my beat queued up, I did want to point out because obviously you're used to being behind the microphone, but I'm, and you've been in the one of the first Trail Gangsters videos. Are you at the end of top two? Is that true? So we had Anthony Saviola said, Chris, are you at the end of the Havilene 100 movie top two? I'd say that's... The credits. Maybe like doing something silly. I know there's some great scenes where you're wearing that. You got oh. short shorts and uh, a tuck suit on top. I don't know. Just saying. Yeah, yeah, that's me. I'm not the only one who has to that's, perform here. <laughs> that's me. No. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, uh, I did not realize that that footage was going to be used for uh, 
a uh, an era Vipa film. Um, but uh, it was uh, it was fun at the time. So, all right. Without further ado, I won't drag it on. We'll do a set of bars here. Do you want the headset mic or the handheld mic here? Let's do the handheld, and then I can hear the beat, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'll mute those two headsets there. Okay. So we just have audio on this mic. I'm going to mute it for one second for y'all. I just do the beat. Let's see if we can hear this here. How's, let's see if they can get the beat first. Tiny mic, no tiny mics here. Okay. Can you guys hear the beat on the, would it? Cause I like to get the cadence right with the beat. How's that beat sound? Just drop a flame if it sounds good. Otherwise I'll turn it up a little bit more. Oh, uh, it's maxed out. What do you think? Okay. We'll bring it back, and then I'll dive into it. Air Viper After Bars. Check. Shout out Liam. Okay. Check. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Got my Guinness fueled up. Let's do it. Uh, Got to wait for the beat to drop, you know? Life's a treadmill, it's a rat race, so crank it up to a fast pace. It can be good to have bad breaks, so go for the gold F last place. Running a rap, running a rap, no NFL, I'm running it back. Full steam ahead, I'm Thomas the Tank. I run the scene, I promise I'm dank. I'm the guy that you won't beat. All I do is run, I don't sleep. On a new level, I won't peak. Chasing goals that you won't reach. I got lava flow, that's Pompeii. Call me is what moms say. I run up hills a long way. 3K vert, call me Andre. Even when I'm old, I won't be slow. The switch is stuck, I'm in beast mode. My life's the movie, hustle and flow. Get it? Cause I hustle and flow, I'm a TG. No gang, gang. Fast like a cowboy, bang, bang. I'm Tom cruising like Top Gun. Don't hold me back, I won't stop, son. I bet you wish you were this fit. I'm a Garmin, you're a Fitbit. I'm switching gears like a stick shift. Done with the run, that's a quick trip. Hey. That's it. Wow. <laughs> oh, that shoot. Fantastic. I said Garmin. I have a Koros. <laughs> Koros, Molly Seidel edition. Shout out Molly. <laughs> that was. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that was fantastic. Woo. I like that. I'm a little out of breath. I got my heart rate up. That was Every great. time I perform. Cool. I enjoyed that <laughs> tremendously. I mean, I've, you know, obviously seen all your videos, but like, I, I don't think I've ever actually seen you perform it live. You haven't heard like, it live. Wow. Yeah, so that was actually a lot of fun. I appreciate that. Uh, my mic. We're going to have to uh, cut that and maybe put it, uh, put it in post. And, uh, oh, yeah, we can do something that like that. To, to one of our uh, <laughs> stories or something oh, like nice. that. That was great. Uh, I folks, appreciate the compliments coming through. That was it, fantastic. Yeah, it looks like the reception is pretty good on that. That was uh, a fit bit. Done with yep. the run. That's a quick <laughs> trip, because that's that's not a Midwest thing. I learned that when I moved here. Quick trip. Uh, yeah, that's true. So yeah, always got got some double entendres in there, and uh, yeah, three K vert. Three K vert. Call me yeah, Andre. Andre. That I Garmin. lived in Atlanta for six years, so Oof. I love that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that Garmin Fitbit line. Uh, people are like, people are liking it. Really, Dang, really impressed. I might by get it. a Garmin watch in the mail or something. <laughs> One of their uh, marketing people might pick up on that and be like, oh, (laughs) hey. Uh, I'm open to that debate. I can, I actually, now that I've had both, I I like things about both watches. But um, yeah, appreciate it. Uh, Dude, thanks for doing that. That was was so cool. It was fun. Um, We're going to pivot back to the the race. Uh, We've got, uh, speaking of fire, we have the the fire pit at... uh, at Whiskey Row here, uh, the Prescott Area Trail Runners are setting up anxiously awaiting that first runner. Of course, you and I have a, a wager now going on. We do. 
We I have our picks to see who is going to hit Whiskey Row first. Uh, I have picked Killian Korth. You have picked Michael Versteeg. And Whiskey last we checked, himself. last we checked, they're moments apart from one another. So uh, uh, at one point, Killian Korth seemed to have had a, uh, a significantly, not like in terms of the grand scheme of things, but in terms of getting to Whiskey Row. Now they're fairly close to one another. So uh, we're going to see what happens there. And of course, this is... Uh, this is part of the fun. So, yeah, uh, Killian Korth was. I love it. As you reference, we've had these um, close finishes lately in uh, some high profile races. So, this is. Can you imagine if a race like this came down to a sprint? Um, <laughs> this final sprint down that alley in oh, the square. Somebody would get hurt really bad. <laughs> They'd stumble into one of those uh, cement uh, pillars right there or something like that. Yeah. Right. So. Versteeg pinged at 72.24 minutes ago, and Killian pinged at 72.55 five minutes ago. Wow, and you got the point four update. Yeah. Yeah. So That uh, is it. That's as close you, you can get. Uh, and, and kudos to Killian Korth so far for acquitting himself extremely well. It was a name that uh, came up in our uh, preview show when AGW and I talked about this race, but we didn't actually, like, talk about him as a contender. He's just somebody with a nice resume and uh, had some experience here last year. He, he was, a, he was running very well before uh, he ended up uh, getting injured. So it looks like he came back and, uh, uh, and is looking to make a statement out here so far. Obviously we're still very early into the race. I mean, we're still less than a third yeah. of the way in, but when people look good at this point, you know, we'll see how long they can sustain it. Maybe he can sustain it for another 180 miles. We'll see. Um, yeah, really ha- hard to call. I, I'm just trying to kind of focus in on the, this particular moment when they come to the next aid station. It, I think it's kind of interesting, too. Like, um, maybe other people want to speak to this. I haven't run a race this long, but I imagine, I don't know, there's less urgency to come through. So even though they're right there, like, I mean, What's what are they? What's Versteeg doing when he sees so, Killian here? You know. Oh yeah, I mean, I is can't. Is he gonna battle back just to go in, and then they get their food and drinks and hang out and talk? You know. So. Well, that's one of the things I'm gonna talk to uh, Pete Mortimer about tomorrow yeah, because he caught Dax like basically between Walnut Canyon and Mount Eldon. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you're talking about uh, you know closing in and catching you know somebody for second place you know, in the last 10 miles of a 250, it's like, what goes through, like, you know, what's that interaction like? I mean, it's, you know, you're not moving fast enough that you can't be talking. You have to be able to carry a breath. And do you just kind of like put your head down and say, good job. Or do you like, I like know. oh, hey, what's going on? You know, I mean, because you both know what's happening. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, Dax, who still had a, a wonderful race. Dax knew what was happening. Pete knew what was happening. What was that interaction like when you're, you know, you're both grinding and, and yeah, you know, is I'll, it friendly? Is it uh, <laughs> adversarial? Is I'll it leave that, joking uh, story up to him? Cause it's his story, but I know they exchanged some words, mostly encouraging. Oh, good. I will say, I don't know if Dax had a pacer at that point. I believe our friend from run club, shout out peak trail runners, uh, Ryan Zamirski was, um, really helping him yeah, out there. Ryan. So yeah. yeah. And he's kind of got that just killer instinct when racing. So, I think that would almost just give Pete an edge, you know, chasing someone down when they're like, hey, you know, Ryan had visuals on Dax. So anyway, we go ahead. Maybe they'll just uh, coast into Whiskey Row casually and exchange some words. And I think at some level you're always eyeing up what the other person is doing when they're leaving. Um, so uh, those that are paying attention to what's going on at the back of the pack here, um, we our sweepers have uh, caught the back of the pack. That doesn't mean that they're getting swept off the course. What that means is that the sweepers are basically able to serve as de facto pacers at this point because they, you know, you've got to stay in front of the sweepers. The sweepers know that they cannot get to Crown King any earlier than 11.55 p.m. So it's, it's really uh, almost a you know, a measure of uh, encouragement from those sweepers. Um, 
I'm I'm looking to see if it might be somebody that we know it's because on the cusp, but if I'm able to leverage and like maybe make a phone call or a text or something like that, I'll see what I can do. But uh, that's the thirty-seven. So yeah. Course sweep. Okay, so. Yeah, it doesn't have any last names on the the sweeper page on the volunteer. So people I don't. People asking about the temp at Whiskey Row. I mean, you know, typical desert climate. It's a little bit hotter, a little closer in elevation to Flagstaff. It's kind of like a midpoint, like four to five thousand. So let's take a look. We can uh, about forty degrees. I'm guessing tonight, but for a low, or uh, I'm just kind of guessing. But what I'm saying is, even if it doesn't sound very cold, to say people from the Midwest, I know Wisconsin and. Uh, Minnesota, North Dakota just had a blizzard recently in the uh, end of April. Yeah, that kind of contrast between the heat they're running in earlier and just expending energy, the sweat on your skin mm -hmm. can get chilly quickly. Well, uh, trying to, I mean, and you being from the Midwest, you can understand and appreciate this. The the temperature variance out here, you feel it a lot faster and a lot harder That's true. here. I mean, you know, when you go to the Midwest, cold is cold. When it's 10 below, you know it's 10 below. But I've had experiences out here, like, for instance, that across the years, I remember we had a runner from back east who was complaining about how cold it was. They were like, I can't believe this town gets so bitterly cold. And it was like 40 degrees. Huh, but yeah. the air being thin out here is going to hit people differently. Was that a spider cam that we were possibly looking at or no? Oh, is it a shad thing, cam? Yeah. Do you remember how crispy that shad cam was uh, coming into the finish line last year? Oh, yeah. Because you just got a little taste of it. He's heading out to uh, probably just wait for runners. They're still a little bit away, um, but they're moving strong. So, oh, we got so Stephanie Mitchell and uh, Brett Barker are, are uh, currently um, our final runners uh, to be hitting. Um, actually, there'll be the the final uh, runners to. Uh, hit uh, Lane Mountain, which is the aid station before Crown King. They're about a 5K out from there. So, Hey, Matt, can you explain what the hold release is? A few people have asked, and I don't know if I'm going to. Okay. So my understanding was that it was. An update from race commander. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll explain, because we've had a few people ask what the hold release is. I think I have an yeah, idea of it. I'd like to know. But I don't want to. I, I don't want to make a mistake when I'm describing it. Basically, I think it's it was something designed to alleviate traffic during uh, spots where uh, it can be a bit difficult to uh, handle large volumes of traffic, like Crown King. You can only handle so many cars in Crown King. You know that. You've been up there, so. Yeah, limited. Fun. That may be true. I'm going to get confirmation on that. But another uh, interesting story here for you, Chris. Apparently, some hungry javelinas took four packets of hamburger buns from the uh, Friendly Pines aid station. Oh yeah! Oh no! So a little stinkers. Yeah, keep your <laughs> keep your eyes out. Uh, keep your eyes open out there. Javelinas are uh, are out and about, which is kind of surprising. There. Uh, this uh, is from race. Yeah, there. Yeah, it's from race command. So if they're pulling my for leg the number of people, <laughs> for the number of people that would be there, but. That is not the most unusual situation we've had with animals during a live stream, though. The big one? Remember the uh, uh, up at uh, Kendall Mountain? Is there a mountain lion? Marmots. Marmots. Oh, okay. yeah. The, the, the year we live streamed Kendall Mountain, and the day before we had, like, crispy footage from the summit or the high point of the course, which isn't the proper summit, uh, and marmots ate our cables overnight. Oh, okay. And so we had I like a uh, super this, yeah. grainy yeah. uh, footage from up there. Like we could only get like Jeez. decent coverage from like one side of the of the uh, mountain. Nature. Let's see how. Hey, I wanted to shout out Brett Barker again because he is running in memory of his dad who recently passed. And I know he might be based on his progress, one of the people – on the bubble there? Yeah, he it, it's going to be he's so he's going to have to do some work support. here. Yeah, he's so uh, uh Brett Barker has uh roughly um an hour and 
42 minutes to go about seven miles. Uh, so uh, he's definitely going to have to uh, uh, keep moving forward. Yeah. But the nice thing about that section is that once you get to the top of Lane Mountain, it is a nice downhill. It's the last two miles of the Crown King last Scramble. Two miles. Oh, yeah. So hopefully uh, 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 Brett has, uh, you know, got something that he can push through. And then, as we mentioned before, one of the nice things about once you get to Crown King, you don't face another cutoff situation until tomorrow at 5 p.m. So you can recompose yourself, and uh, as long as you've gotten out of the Crown King aid station by 11.55 tonight, you've still got a shot to, you know, make this race go your way. Got out, or you rest up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, so regarding, sorry, regarding the hold release spot, it was actually for crews. Yeah. So they kept crews down at Bumblebee Ranch, and they weren't, they released them up to Crown King when the runner hit that spot on the trail. Okay, yeah, and that's what I was afraid yeah, I was because yeah, yeah. that's what I meant, but I didn't know how to articulate it. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's what uh, hold release means. It uh, it just is basically when your runner hits that point, then the crew is allowed to proceed to Crown King because uh, if you've never been to Crown King, the the population is about 150 people in terms of permanent residents. No paved roads. One gas pump. Like you know, it's 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 a small town, literally in the middle of nowhere, and uh, it, it would be very taxing to have a lot of in and out traffic uh, over the course of several hours there. Like even with uh, with you know the Crown King scramble, we're like we all get there and then we all like hang out or like half of us hang out. I mean, you stay up there and. You know, a bunch of us will hang out up there overnight, but then there are times where, um, you know, a lot of the runners, you know, are leaving town. So it's it's not like the whole town yeah, is overrun, but yeah, uh, small, in this situation, but... it could be. Yeah, we've had we've had some fun experiences there as well. So. Oh yeah, <laughs> I I have it's my favorite race of the year. Every year, I still uh, I still maintain that, and it's. <laughs> it's not because finisher. it's a, a very good race for me all the time. I just love what the weekend means to me. Well, another reason I'm glad we're, you know, united in broadcast, just because we have, we referenced previously, we go back to I'm trying to pin down, I guess 20, I want to say it's 2014 for sure. Yeah, uh, that sounds about right. Because, yeah, we definitely met at a race, and then I would help out with some of the, early air Viper track workouts that yeah, we hosted. That's so right. You're yeah. There a lot. So I really appreciate seeing that. Cause you know, you work on yeah. the and short speed stuff. And I think that was, you know, a beneficial thing to have in place. Oh, for sure. I miss that. I do miss that. It was, uh, we used to have a, a track workout here weekly, uh, or here in Phoenix. Yeah. And, uh, Rory was one of the hosts of that. And, uh, you know, it definitely did me some good and my kid loved it. I mean, you know, it was what really got him involved in running. And even though he doesn't, like, run anymore, race anymore, really, he still likes to go out and explore and hike and everything like that. And he's obviously staying very active now it's, that he's in high school. It's been fun to so. watch him grow, too. Literally, he's Yeah, it's now. been wonderful. Dang. Yeah, people asking about uh, um, uh, sleep habits of runners. <laughs> it's really a runner-by-runner -runner basis. There's no... For, first of all, there's no tried, tested, and true way to do it. If you talk to somebody like Michael McKnight, he's going to approach things one way. Um, String Bean McConaughey, as a Seatown fan, I can't remember exactly. I'll take his word for it that 39 minutes is what uh, uh, String Bean took in terms of naps. I mean, I could go back and look through texts because uh, I got uh, messages from his coach saying that uh, he was going to lay down for 8 minutes here, 12 minutes here. So... Uh, some runners do it that way. Some people, and, and when uh, String Bean was taking a nap, he was taking a nap in like the van or whatever cruiser that they had uh, for him. Michael Versteeg, as if for those that were watching earlier, they saw him literally lay down in a shaded area of the road, like right in the middle of the road, and take a nap. So, you know, everybody's approach is going to be different. Some people will take that. Uh, you know, nap right on the trail, the dirt nap, as some people like to call it. Uh, others are going to want to get to a sleep station and get a full night's sleep. Uh, one of the things that really is jarring to me when we're covering this race 
every morning when I wake up, I'm so disoriented because I've been watching this, you know, as things have gone tonight and, uh, and it's dark and, uh, you know, we don't have the drones in the sky and, uh, you know, things, things do kind of cool down, especially the first two days. Now, days three, four, five, things are happening, but the first couple of days, if you don't have like the, like we, because we don't have the f drones, we can't don't have the visuals that we had earlier in the day. So that's why we're hanging out, you know, by the fire here in in Whiskey Row. But when I wake up tomorrow morning, it'll be like some like energetic aid station. It'll be the first thing I see when I open my eyes. I mean, and and since I'm staying here at the house, I will like walk over here and I'll see, you know, as we're setting up to do the morning show. You know, uh, I'll see where everybody's at, and it'll be like, holy crap. Like, the world has been going on without me in this race. It's such a unique experience That's to true. cover this race in that way. Yeah, waking up in your case, and then I'm just thinking going back to – I took a quick nap this afternoon, and, you know, during this week, I'm, everything I do, I kind of link it to what the runners are feeling. I'm like, man, <laughs> getting up early is easy. The runners have been, like, going all night, and then just – got up from this very short nap and I just felt so groggy and disoriented and I usually I can kind of pick the right amount of time to sleep so let alone doing it in a race where you're just making some cases split second decisions where you're going to sleep and, and how you do it um, I will say a lot of these runners probably at the top of the pack have experience that they're, they're kind of dialing in their their nap plans perhaps but I have kind of a interesting tidbit here i'm actually coaching a runner from california and she's training for the lake tahoe 200 okay which course has dramatically been changed it's no longer a loop and it was supposed to be an out and back and now it's gotten delayed mm -hmm. and anyway um she sent me a, a document from the medical director and i thought it's almost like a case study here so uh this is what the medical director said uh, that she got in Google survey feedbacks from the runners there. So mm -hmm. I thought I could just read a little snip and see yeah, please if you do. wanted to comment on that. So of the 32 responses, 28 finishers, four DNFs from who filled out the survey, the one of the questions, I won't read the whole document, said, what was your actual sleep routine? The majority slept more at the beginning of the race. 60 to 90 minutes every 50 miles was the average at Lake Tahoe 200. As the race went on, sleep break uh, seemed to break down to 20-minute naps on the trail. Sleepwalking ensued and was the cause of those frequent naps, which usually set in the sleepwalking, sleep running. I know runners out there have told me they, they did that sets in around 120 to 150 miles based on these surveys. So it's, it's kind of cool to – it would be nice, obviously, to have an even larger pool of data. Yeah. Yeah, it would be a, a really interesting study. I mean, that's uh, that's some uh, grad level work though. Like somebody would put together for, uh, you know, for you know some research. But yeah, I, you know, we're the two hundred mile is still a relatively new discipline when it comes to, you know, I mean, you know, when it comes to trail running. You know, we we just keep going bigger and further and. And, uh, you know, maybe in 10 years, we'll look back and, and kind of chuckle or, you know, even smirk at, you know, the way that people handled their, uh, I think we will. Uh, their behaviors uh, during 200 mile races. I mean, you know, there's been changes and in, in strides in 100 mile races and shorter distances. So, I mean, there's a reason why, uh, you know, these uh, course records have just been tumbling over the past several years. So uh, you could see uh, back to these visuals here. Yeah. Yeah, Paula Olson uh, of uh, uh, Prescott Area Trail Runners uh, hanging out and getting things ready for the first runners that are going to hit Whiskey Row. Uh, do we have a, a camera out at Kippa that is operational right now, Matt? Or we can see if we can uh, follow in. Switch back there. Well, there's your Camp Kippa cam. <laughs> it is uh, – it's dark, but, you know, I mean, you know, it, it's – I don't know if we have any runners that are necessarily approaching Kippa at this point. Say, even just going down those stairs, backing up. I wonder if that feels like anything. Well, I mean, it, in really my personal experience, after 100K, everything hurts. Everything. So. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I can, you know, I, I can tell you from personal experience with regard to that. Looks like we have a runner that is 
departing Kippa. Can we get a number on the bag there? No. Um, that might we'll have been. We'll see if Courtney can uh, send us the bib number if she was able to get it. Is she in the group? Okay, so yeah, Courtney. Uh, anytime, uh, if uh, if you happen to see a bib number and you're able to uh, text it to us, feel free. Uh, and we're back over to uh, uh, there's a fireball party bucket. Uh huh. Hey, what do you hey. know? We got some whiskey here. Um, as you can see, that station is uh, is got a lot of options for runners. They are individually yeah. wrapping the pizza slices for the great. runners to make sure that uh, uh, they're all ready and they can just grab and go. That yeah, was bib twenty eight that just left Camp Kippa. Bib twenty eight that just left Camp Kippa would have been oh, Tanya Keys. Oh, it was Tanya Keys. Okay, so Tanya ran this Tanya. race and finished yep. last year. Yep. Hardy, Hardy runner. Uh, yeah, probably excited to take on the uh, quote normal course here this year. Yeah, though. I I got to interview her at the Eldon Aid Station oh. last year. On I don't know if we might have time if there's a little. Lo Lull, but it'd be cool to kind of show some of the clips. Um, interview that's of right, because you did go up at, to Eldon or it looked like at a mile 243. But she's just such a tough, gritty runner. She ran most of it unsupported last year. The moment uh, I was talking to her, she was talking about the many hallucination hallucinations <laughs> she was having, uh, from snowmen to robots. And I had previously met her also, uh, at a man against horse. So I've, okay. I've met a lot. You know, the gritty runners tend to pick the tough races, so she raced there. Man Against Horse is a tough race, too. Tough, rocky course, hot. I mean, it's it's good prep. You're covering some of the similar terrain, so. That was my first 50-miler. Uh, I, I thought it was one I, of your uh, ones. And it has aggressive cutoffs, too. <laughs> like, it, it's a 50-miler with a 12-hour cutoff, and you have a 2,000-plus-foot climb at mile 31. Um, and, uh, I finished with about nine minutes to spare that year and I got lost at the top of Mingus mountain. Close. So, and I will say with that one, part of the problem is people go off course. There's a oh, few yeah. that could, uh, could be marked better. I had, had some issues with that, but, um, it's kind of cool just meeting these runners at certain races that are especially tough. And that's part of training. I think you got to pick ones that you have the stress for that cutoff. Was that and, possibly yeah. Jimmy Strayhorn right there? Or, you know, I, I couldn't wonder. see the number. Although I did see that Jimmy had dyed his hair purple or pink, I believe, in the race photos. Jimmy's a hell of a runner. He's run Desert Solstice and uh, has about a 16-hour 100-miler. Um, he's uh, out Sweet. of uh, Camp Verde. Okay. So uh, hey. he's a local guy. He and The Pete middle ground of... Yep. He and Pete Kostelnik trained a lot together getting ready for Cocodona, so. Camford, yeah, some underrated trails in that region for sure. And it's also a popular training spot for a lot of the the roadies, the track runners. Um, there's this rectangle loop that we run over and over, and it's a unique feature of Flagstaff. You can drop a couple thousand feet in under an hour. And oh, wow. Quality workouts in there without having to go all the way down to Phoenix, and you just come back up. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. I mean, the Verde Valley is is, is perfect. perfect in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, you're looking at Whiskey Road. The runners that they're coming in off of the course are going to be heading down exactly like he's showing you right there. Uh -huh. uh, that was a perfect modeling of how the runners are going to run down the street on just Whiskey like Row. Um, it, it is a... <laughs> It would be kind of fun. It'd be a logistical nightmare, but it'd be kind of fun if this happened to like be on a Friday or Saturday night in Prescott. I, I want to see. I want to see the runners mix it up with these college students. <laughs> see what happens there. <laughs> well, here in here in town, they can do that. Like, I don't know if there's a lot of college students in Prescott. Really, are there? I mean, there's I guess Prescott College and not as many. Your Yavapai they College. Have the aeronautical. Embry Riddle. Embry. That's right up there but yeah yeah they're studying <laughs> nerds now <laughs> i 
So Tom. if Liam was asking, is that fireball? Yeah, that's that's fireball. That's why I, I called it the Liam when I <laughs> when the I Liam. saw that. Uh, we got our wager here, and we did this a while ago. It was close at the time, but hey, we buckled down with our bets. I'm guessing that Whiskey Man Michael Versteeg will enter Whiskey Row first, and Chris is going with Killian and – we're going to somehow decide who takes the shot. Maybe it'll come down to who gets the crap you want versus the crap <laughs> one. We'll do an update here. Okay, so Killian Korth, he, oh, were you going to give us a, an update? Oh, sorry. Uh, Killian Korth pinged nine minutes ago at mile 73.7. And Michael Versteeg pinged five minutes ago at mile 73.6. So they're in a virtual tie at this point. Like you're talking about a quarter of a mile at most separating them one way or the other. Yeah, uh, so like see it. how do you feel? interesting this time of night. Go ahead. How are you feeling about your wager? <laughs> eh, I stand by it. Hey, I I actually i am down to take a shot of whiskey at this point. So uh, did you hear about the blimp? I, w I did tune in for the blimp convo. I, I saw someone uh, revive that. Yeah, the afternoon uh, show, Finn Melanson and Brett Horneg uh, from the Single Track Podcast. Uh, floated the idea of trying to raise enough money for Air Viper to buy a blimp. Um, yeah. And uh, we had a couple of Super Chat donations. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, they said that uh, based on what a blimp cost, it roughly left us $39,999,900 and maybe $90 got short. To, so. It says, got to $40 million, so it says, did we re reach our goal? <laughs> Uh, yeah, some donations came through, not quite that much, but uh, yeah, it was fun hearing that. You never know what's going to come up, especially Air Vibe After Dark, but uh, I like the uh, the puns that came up, names too. There was the Air of Vipa, mm -hmm. solid, and then I think 8 Station Fireball had some good ones. Oh, I thought Leadville Zeppelin would have been yeah. Big fun. Blimpin, I think was one. I like that. See, All I, aid station support should have a different chat that they update as runners enter X at aid stations. I mean, yeah, that would be nice for live stream purposes, but uh, it's a lot to try and get volunteers for uh, races to begin with. And uh, you, you want to be careful in how much you ask them to do. If you overwhelm them, then they're not going to want to help in future events. I think you just got to keep, you know, we're still trying to make this better. So work yeah. on what you can. And yeah, who knows? I, I'd love to see what this looks like 10 years from now. It'll probably just be mind-blowing. Oh, I, 10 years from now, I, I'm going to be wearing like a headset walking around Heritage Square, like basically calling the action, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, interviewing runners as they cross the finish line. I think that we're going to be at that point. I mean, you know, aren't we going to have like worldwide, uh, like Google Fi, like, Everywhere, at least that's what I understand. I don't know nothing about technology. Hey, but they also said we were, weren't we supposed to be wearing those Google Glass oh things by now? Remember how dumb those looked? <laughs> and we are not wearing those. No, there is no Google <laughs> Glass God. to be worn anymore, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> remember? Like, I remember seeing the previews. It's like, you can look at your social media feed in your glasses. Yeah, because we don't need enough distractions, right? Yeah, like, but now we're just, we got neck problems from doing that. So, yeah, this is the Whiskey Row Aid Station. As you can see, it's a pretty sizable uh, area. It's, uh, it's the site of a former bar that uh, uh, burned down in 2012 uh, uh, in Whiskey Row. Um, they've turned the area into uh, an open space uh, where they have events such as uh, gatherings and uh, aid stations for 250-mile runs. I like the ambient lighting there. Good pick-me-up spot to roll into. In the background is the historic Yavapai County Courthouse as well, which is uh, uh, the former, uh, you know, as mentioned, as was mentioned earlier, the uh, original territorial capital of the state of Arizona. Yeah, it's a it's a neat little area, and and thanks to the whoever uh, allows us to be there in Prescott. Is that... That looks like Mike McKnight. That looks like Mike Camp McKnight Kippa. right there. 
And by looks like Mike McKnight, I mean that is 1,000% Mike McKnight yeah. at Camp Kippa. Glasses. Yeah, because he was wearing that full white ensemble earlier. Yeah, so that's Mike McKnight right there. Somebody had said he'd come through earlier. No, that's him right there. So he must be spending some time there. He looks relaxed. Looks like he's just kind of chatting with people as he's heading in. Any way to get his audio or? I don't know. Let's see if we can figure out. That might have been Jimmy Strayhorn who just walked in past him. Yeah, Jimmy is at Camp Kippa, so that would have been. Uh, and just as another moving. update, <laughs> Bib okay. 11, I believe that's Josh Perry, um, left Camp Kippa seven minutes ago. Okay. <coughs> yeah, Josh Perry uh, was uh, my pick for the uh, – Cocodona 250, originally during the uh, preview show. I based that on his Arizona FKT. Mm -hmm. Do not fear, he is not wandering around Potato no, Patch. that is not accurate. <laughs> Interesting. Michael Versteeg at 74.3 miles two minutes ago. Killian Korth at mile 73.7, 16 minutes ago. So that's a, yeah, they're they're really I, close I, together. I, I don't know. I think it's just going to come down to the video footage. <laughs> well, I, I think at this point I, it's safe to say that we will be here to catch them because if uh, Verstig is at mile 74 and Killian is at mile, uh, I think he's still at 74 as well, um, they're only four miles out from Whiskey Row, and that means that uh, – Shad and Spider Pena will be catching them as they hit Whiskey Row or as they hit the town of Prescott. I mean, they're literally our, our follow filmers are going to literally going to follow them through town, which is pretty cool. The same way you did when yep. you now followed Versteeg at Buffalo Park. You know the drill. So this is kind of what we're looking for. Um, it would be cooler, perhaps, to see it during the daytime. But for those who are tuning in, I mean, we have people in Europe who are waking up, so kind of motivating. Oh, I guess that that was the suit that Mike McKnight wore at Badwater. So, uh, I mean, you know, again, a guy who knows how to gear for these kinds of races. Yeah, so I, again, what for those people waking up, I find it kind of cool. Whatever you think is tough about your training run this week, tune into this live stream. <laughs> puts it in perspective. Hey, uh, we got time for a commercial? Let's do the Flota. You guys want the Flota? It's been a couple hours. Flota? For those who have... have uh, How many times have you played it? <laughs> <laughs> they're getting their money's worth. <laughs> That's a short enough one. Where and it courtesy of our good friends at Satisfy Running, who will be taking over the Satisfy Fane Ranch aid station at mile 100 tomorrow, I present to you Flota. Soda. Uh, that is. I uh, absolutely love it. I've got. Uh, <laughs> I've already got a freestyle Friday idea for Rory off of the uh, off of Flota. So I'll have to, I'll have to pitch that to him. No? Did you just think of it after watching that? I am game. I would. <laughs> I love getting some. Uh, so Celebrity of, appearances. I have Jeff Browning in one of them. Well, I'm just saying instead of Love Sosa, 
we do love Loda. Oh, going good. Chief Keith. Yeah. Oh, oh my. Going back a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, I I haven't heard that. That's a that's a hard beat kind of trap style. So we could do something with that. So much fun. The yeah. question is, could we get him? <laughs> I I want to know what it took to get him to smile like that. <laughs> and I I don't know if we can elaborate. <laughs> I don't know if it's uh, anything we can mention. It is after problem. dark. But <laughs> yeah. Oh. From uh, you can hear me on your mic. Oh, okay. So yeah, it is Era Viper After Dark. Yeah, Travis, I agree. It doesn't get old. I think it's just, it's so much fun. <laughs> yeah, wow, we got some. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. <laughs> None of the food. Uh, Christopher Kraft said it, not me. Um, <laughs> oh, man. <I> don't <laughs> the float of love is, is a thing. I mean, so... So the the runners, as they hit (laughs) Fain Ranch, are going to be able to try Flota for the first time. I mean, I haven't tried it. You know, Matt, have you had a chance to try it yet? Flota? Yeah. No, I'm almost positive runners at Fain Ranch will Will be be the first first, people. I mean, aside from the staff and yeah product it doesn't testing even come up when you search it does it or maybe now it does at first i thought it was like not an actual product i thought they just made like a parody commercial to be funny that's but what according i thought to jamil he said they are going to have it at the satisfy fane ranch aid station yeah because if you if you google search Floda, nothing comes up so i'm seeing you well it's because it's not out yet well yeah but Okay. I, okay. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if it was all like a, it really was like a a bit? And yeah. It what, if it was, what if I was just a a cog in the game here, and it's all just a bit? <laughs> we're being taken to. <laughs> we're like hyping this product that doesn't exist. <laughs> oh, was on card in the chat. It was deep, deep fake versteen. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> AI created it. Uh, just getting ready that would that would explain the smile yeah exactly <laughs> well if, I mean if the runners like it you know it, it's definitely got the attention of the people who have uh, who have seen the, the commercial and I don't blame you because I think that that is hilarious I I can't get over it Create the hype. Yeah. And then people get to try. I mean, I want to see who's going to do that first review. That could be a fun Rate the Bars episode with him. Yeah, there you I go. The, try the Flota yeah, flavors. Flotas, yeah. Uh, yeah, the Whiskey Row is uh, quiet tonight. In fact, I don't know if I've ever seen it so quiet this out there. Chill. Now, granted, I don't typically go out drinking in Prescott on a Monday night, but I've been there enough nights to know that it's it's extremely quiet tonight. Well, even all the vehicles with crews and whatnot parked. Well, I think that, yeah, I was going to actually say that as well, that it looks like all of the yeah, that's where it's the from. vehicles are crew vehicles on Whiskey Row right now. Wouldn't be surprised if they're trying to yeah, catch. Yeah, you can see the setups. Should I maybe get a nap before their runner comes in and... Uh, Audrey Kelly, we're going to find out later that Flota was a Mandela effect thing that we all remember but never actually existed. Whoa. Like the Sinbad Genie movie. Uh-huh. Stuff like that. Oh, uh-huh. yeah. Yeah, those are all. I mean, if they've got their back end open and their, you know, big old vans, then yeah, those are crew vehicles, definitely. Uh, just hanging out and waiting for their runners. Well, hey, speaking of rating, I don't know if this is a good time to talk about it, but uh-huh. uh, Peter was making fun of my eating habits and the junk that <laughs> I get, but I was in the – whatever. I, you know, treated you myself. You hear that? It sounds like a clapback. <laughs> oh, I, we give each other crap. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to eat my concrete mixer, but I was just curious um, if maybe you guys want to weigh in what you think the – the best burger spots are in Flag. That's one of my favorite things to 
to discuss because um, we've actually taken quite the loss as – oh, we're looking at a little pup there. Maybe he wants some should I too. Um, Mama Burger has been closed for at least six months going on longer due to re renovation. And in my opinion, it's one of the top burger spots in town. So that's why I went to Culver's instead. What do you think? I know Matt has been here about a year now. Yep. Yeah. So I've been here a little over a year now. Ma I still, I'm still a big Diablo burger guy. Diablo. Okay. I think it's, I think that it's, I think it's solid. I think it's really solid. I think Mama Burger is probably typically my favorite, but it hasn't been open since last fall, you know? Mm -hmm. And then when you do try to go through the drive-thru, it's like a 45-minute wait, you know? Because it's that good. Had, I must go late. I don't know. I haven't had any issues. Well, yeah. Not too I go like, I've oh. got three kids. I go Fibers. like kids do <laughs> time, you know? That's like, that's, dinner. that's peak hour. Yeah, you're trying to get dinner for the family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit different uh. you know but maybe that's the thing maybe i need like oh a yeah. late afternoon snack and we get burgers at 8 p.m so we had someone say diablo yeah my only issue is it's just the it's high quality it's just a small for a higher price tag um one i would like to plug though is tinderbox kitchen has a really good burger with like bacon jam and it is quality <laughs> I believe I've only had one burger at a local joint uh, here in Flagstaff, and I can't remember the name of it, but it was after Cocodona 2021. I was actually having lunch with uh, Andre and his partner, Jan, where oh, yeah. Andre was a little bit delirious and telling us how he was 16 miles off course around Fort Tuthill. Uh -huh. Like he had somehow like gone eight miles off in a random direction. We just all kind of nodded and said, uh-huh. But uh, I, it was a tasty burger. I just wish I could remember the name of the place. Hey, Jan, Andre, you watching? Do well, do they do a uh, do they do like a March Madness bracket for burger joints in Flagstaff this year? I think like Discover Flagstaff or someone well, downtown did. I'm glad he pointed out because Pete's still up with us here. Uptown Pubs Burger was yeah. our sponsor. Best in Flag, and they are sponsor. Yep. I yeah, I so. think that. I think that they did do like a social media mm -hmm. thing for best bur burger joint and flag. You know, Pete would know the best meat places. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, I, you know, I true. trust Pete's opinion. I should have a burger there. Usually, when I go there, I'm just getting a, a pint of Guinness. So, wait, is that ice cream shop actually open then in Whiskey Row? No, it can't no. be open. I got ice cream. They don't got ice cream. Oh my! Yeah. Oh yeah. That's cool. That's the shot right there, downtown uh, Prescott Whiskey Row, overlooking the aid station, right on Whiskey Row in downtown Prescott, as part of the Cocodona Two Fifty. Yeah, Pete, where's the? Best uh, burgers, he said, my house. Welcome to my house. Tracker refreshed and Killian ahead. Oh. Mile 75.4, pinged zero minutes ago. Mile 74.7, Versteeg pinged six, pinged six minutes ago. I mean, this is going to be so close. This is great. Oh, look at that. Beautiful uh, uh, shot of uh, downtown Prescott. Aerial view and we got to thank the towns that are receptive. I know there's certain areas we had yeah. some issues. Um, yeah, some places really don't like drones at night. Film, yeah. What? Yeah, no, I'm saying some places don't, but like it's cool that they're you know. No, okay we're with good it. here. Yeah. This is amazing. Just to be able to see this this town kind of. In the dark by street lamp. Shout out! Shout out to Troy. Troy was our uh, wonderful drone pilot who was uh, originally going to go to Camp Kippa, but had some uh, some tire issues. So he's here giving us these beautiful shots into the wee hours of the evening. Incredible. 
Well, it's not that late here locally. Ten forty-seven. Oh, I guess it is. Got, You're talking to a I got dad. Th- I got three kids, man. Ten forty-three is way past bedtime. Yep, Killian's Tonight's just, just getting started for again. Rory. Uh, I think Chris and I are both night owls, so. <laughs> so Killian Korth is about two point one miles out. Michael Versteeg is was three point three miles out as of eleven minutes ago. And knowing how talented Versteeg is, I'm guessing that he can see Killian or vice versa. So they I believe are we'll have a runner cam on Killian soon. He should be exiting um, the. Uh, Senator Highway here in just a minute onto Hazley Road, and I believe that is where uh, Dan and possibly Shad uh, are both at. So we should have eyes uh, There's an intersection. on Killian in the not too distant future. I remember there was an intersection on Hazley that, like, they were able to pick them up all of a sudden. That's what I remember uh, about years past. Yeah, it, it might be you a might little be right. bit further. No, I think that that is could be a little further down at this intersection. It could be Valley Ranch Circle and Hazley. You might be right. Either way. Yeah, we're gonna pick we'll, up uh, uh, runner runner visual here real soon, which is a, a real treat um, at this point in the race because, uh, as we mentioned, you know this is the only drone shot that we've had in several hours. Um, you know, once it gets dark, we're pretty limited in the areas we can fly, um, and uh, you know some of our aid station cams just don't have a lot going on. So this is going to be uh, uh, a lot of fun picking up. Uh, either Killian Korth or Michael Versteeg. Um, we'll see who it is, or potentially Sarah Ostaszewski, who's really not that far back from them either. You know, yeah, this this is just incredible to look at, especially just knowing a lot of these people. Sarah in the mix. It uh, does add a different... Saint Jean, which I think you had asked me a question about him. We didn't really get to touch on, on his story, but, um, yeah, I, I know a bit about him and have shared many... Uh, training runs though okay he is uh yeah i think he's equipped to to finish this thing out he's a really gritty runner uh like mid-20s to me he seems like a baby but um he's got some speed for sure he's from the east coast originally and speaking of i kind of talked about a lot of people make bets with their running and they kind of move to a place Mm -hmm. like flagstaff which is kind of what i did Seems like that's what he did as well. So he um, was living in a van for, I think, the better part of a year when he first moved to Flagstaff and just parking at different trailheads, getting crazy training runs in. And um, he works remotely. He does, like, computer programming, I believe. And, yeah, just hard worker grinds it out. He did the Speed Goat double last summer and has done some really tough races. So... It'll be interesting to see if he can kind of stitch together this really multi long multi day effort. Yeah, I have to admit I, I know n- nothing about him, so it'll be interesting. You know, and, and sometimes well, that's we'll why have we're here to help each other out. Yeah, so, yeah. we have people who uh, you know have this as their you know coming out party in terms of you know making a, a having a statement result at a race. You know, and this is a big one. You know, uh, you know in terms of. Uh, you know the the viewership and the uh, the attention that Cocodona gets. Uh, you know, and and being a part of the the Flagstaff scene up there or up here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's, it's obvious that he's training with uh, some talented runners, and he's surrounding himself with uh, uh, some elite level uh, competitors. So, taking notes. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering if he shared any miles. Well believe sarah's been ahead throughout as early as it is we're not gonna in all likelihood uh see uh anybody running right down the middle of the street uh like we did the uh first year of cocodona i remember that (laughs) dominic grossman i met him last year i think it's um 
I believe that Killian has about a three minute lead on Verstig if I had to guess it based on where they're at and where their pinging responses are. You just pinged again or just checked it out? It's going to be super close here as they enter town. People hanging out, waiting to see those first runners. We did just get word that uh, Alex Lamb is at uh, Camp Kippa. So just got reported that he came through as well as Brian Janzik. Uh, he just came through Camp Dr. Kippa. Dr. Lamb, glad to hear it. We well. shouted him out earlier. So Brian Janzik yep. uh, going for his third finish here. Yep, that is correct. Yeah, there's a a, a little crew of uh, strong runners there at Camp Kippa right now in Grossman, Janzik, and Jimmy Strayhorn. Uh, all three of them are are accomplished, uh, strong runners. Uh, Janzik, I believe have finished in the top 15 both years that he's run Cocodona. So, uh, uh, he's proven himself on this course to be uh, quite competitive. Jimmy Strayhorn, uh, more of a, uh, flat, uh, fixed time specialist, um, having logged about a, I think 1608 is his PR in the hundred mile. And, uh, Dominic Grossman having, you know, a more robust resume than just about anybody, uh, in the field, but, you know, all three of them, extremely talented runners, uh, uh, currently hanging out at Camp Kippa. So we did get word on McKnight. He either missed a turn or missed the aid station uh, and had oh. to See, double back two miles. So the aid station, you are coming down the um down the course one way you do an out and back to the aid station and then you head out on the course going in the same direction you were heading um and so he must have just missed that turn realized that he missed the aid station had to double back go to the aid station and he's back ah. out there so that's what the boots on the ground is telling us Frustrating and part of what happens with these distances, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's. Let's see if I can. And this time of night, you know. <laughs> okay, here we go. Actually, if if you could, um, I was going to zoom in on the uh, iPad here to kind of show uh, viewers exactly what we're talking about. So the runners are actually moving from right to left here on the map. And as they head down here, as they're heading down, uh, I believe that's Poland Road, uh, they actually have to take a right to go into Camp Kippa. Yes. And then they had to have, and the, as Matt mentioned, they have to head back down, back south to the road and then continue west before they head north. And so uh, my understanding or my interpretation is that Versteeg did not make that right-hand turn that he was supposed to make in order to make it there. So uh, that did cost him some time. Um, but uh, if anybody can uh, uh, troubleshoot uh, and, and figure things out and how to make time, uh, it is uh, the man who is uh, probably more versed in this distance than anybody. And it looks like we've got eyes. And is that our Shad or our, our Pena cam? Pena cam and that I was going to say that's most definitely not Michael Versteeg. So Killian Korth uh, looks like uh, he's hitting Prescott's streets now. Our first runner to hit Prescott and uh, is approaching Whiskey Row. But as we mentioned, uh, I am of the belief that uh, Killian and Michael Versteeg are very close to one another in terms of uh, uh, how far apart they are. 
It'll be cool to see if I know that Troy's trying to get the drone back up. If he can get an aerial shot that would show both of them, I wonder if they would be, uh, if they would be in frame, uh, like in the same frame on that shot. That would really show us kind of yes. how far apart they are. I'd like to see it. It looks like he's, uh, you know, taking it easy as uh, he heads into yeah. into town. Decent shuffle. I'm sure the uh, pavement feels a little bit different now. Yeah. Let alone, alone being on the sidewalk, you have to watch your feet a little bit more with the dips. I mean, they haven't really been in a paved road situation for this length the entire race at this point. I mean, you're not hitting any pavement in Crown King. You're yeah. not hitting any coming out of Black That's Canyon City. So yeah, this stretch. is yeah, this is a an extended stretch of road that they're going to be on here uh, as they once they actually hit the streets of Prescott and heading to Whiskey Row. Yeah, and shout out to Dan and Shad. They're uh they're a bit away from <laughs> from Whiskey Row, uh, and they're out there. They're going to follow these runners all the way to the aid station, and then. Uh, you know, Spider Pena parked his car out there, so he's, so he's got to go back all the way back. He's getting his miles in. Well, he, a he's a heck of an athlete, so uh, he is. Uh, I'm sure he'll be just fine. And we did just have four people come into Camp Kippa, just to give everyone an update. Bib twenty seven, Bib twenty. Bib 46 and Bib 112. So that was... That was Alicia Jenkins. That was Garrett Nelson. Logan Zeigenmeyer. And Kevin Metz all just came into Camp Kippa there. quick update on the back of the pack it looks like stephanie mitchell is about 30 and a half miles in at this point uh, and brett barker is 31 and a half miles now these runners uh at the uh at the back of the pack they have uh 59 minutes uh to get to uh the crown get into and out of crown king aid i want to make uh, that distinction it's part of it, yeah. as it is very important that uh, not only do they make it into Crown King aid, but they have to depart as well. Let's get in, get in tight there. Yeah, Brett tight Barker uh, is at 31.5. It pinged just this minute. We do have eyes um, on Versteeg here, too. Yeah, uh, here we go. Oh, wow. Exciting. Stephanie Mitchell, uh, her last ping was 58 minutes ago, so she might actually be further ahead because right now the uh, – the pain, uh, the tracker shows her behind the sweepers, which is obviously not the case. Mile seventy six point five, mile seventy six point six. Yeah, they're uh, they're less than two tenths of a mile apart from each other at this point. We've been waiting for it. Didn't quite get that drone shot, but now we can see both visuals on both our top two runners oh now might be able to change up a shot I think our drone is going out to look for the runner still it's tough though once you get uh too far out of town and <laughs> you don't have any uh <laughs> lights out there it's not even worth worth going out there because it'll just be a, a black abyss so right. he may be waiting right here before that uh wall of darkness worth the shot for the runners we are just thrilled to have those other visuals. And we'll see if in a minute Shad can refresh his feed to see if we can just get that Versteeg cam cleaned up. But for the meantime, oh, okay. we will be on Killian Korth here. It looks like he's... Uh from what I can tell, loosening up a little bit from the earlier Yeah, he shots. looks better than he did yeah. five minutes ago for sure. I think it might have been, which can happen. It kind of throws you for a loop to switch surfaces. He got onto his first stretch of pavement on the sidewalk, and now he's 
he had kind of a choppier stride, and now he looks like he's flowing a little bit. He is got a bit of a decline here from what I can tell, so that might be part of it as he runs down into Whiskey Row. Yeah, as they're heading into town, there it is. Uh, it's it's a pretty solid uh, uh, downhill, so um, use it. It's not quite as uh, pronounced of a downhill as the descent into Crown King, but it's still a pretty solid uh, downhill. If that's him, he looks he's looking better by every moment. That's yeah, that is a shot of our leader, Killian Korth. Yeah, he there. Looks... Oh, yeah, he's picking it up. And means... Versteeg should only be probably around 400 meters behind him. He's not far back. Yeah. And the addition of the camera light could alert him where Killing is. So I'm sure he's he's got a visual. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't think that it's. I I wouldn't believe that it would make a difference in how Versteeg approaches his uh, um, his entry into uh, right, Prescott. He need to yeah, I mean, he's he's here to race for 250, not for uh, for 78. But what? Uh, I thought they cared about our bet. <laughs> well, you never know. You never know. Maybe, uh, yeah. maybe if uh, the camera told him, then uh, Versteeg would pick up the pace. No wise move, doing what they need to. Looks like oh, Versteeg is running down the middle of the road like he owns the place. He is choosing the middle of the road. Yeah. <laughs> Right uh, on the median. That is classic for Stieg right there. What just uh, like a beautiful uh, parallel here, right? Like Killian <laughs> staying on the sidewalk, going to the crossing walk to cross the road. And here's Versteeg just <laughs> right down, down the down middle the center, of the road. You know? Yeah. At least he has his shirt on this time, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent. That's that's Shad that's with Versteeg then. Yeah, that's a uh, crystal clear shot right there. That's really solid. That's really really good video right there. I'm so glad. So, uh, for those just tuning in, um, for those perhaps just waking up uh, uh, in Europe, this is the, uh, the the first two men to hit Prescott. The the second, I guess you would say, major. Uh, well, the second crew. Uh, point for the Cocodona 250 here. Uh, it's mile 78. And uh, compared to 2021, Versteeg is going to be hitting Whiskey Row probably about a half hour to 45 minutes earlier than he did. Yep. So. Uh, can, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll look at his split. And uh, so Killian Korth is in the orange and Michael Versteeg is in the black. Uh, Killian is currently leading, but uh, we're under the impression that it's less than a quarter mile uh, between the two of them. And uh, as we've noted uh, uh, to uh, to you out there, uh, Killian Korth is on the sidewalk and uh, just did a double head check at the crosswalk. And Versteeg is literally running down the middle of the street in the middle of the night. So... Uh, and it looks like Killian has perhaps a Kogala waste light there where Versteeg has no light on right now, if you notice that. Do you think it's because he just doesn't feel like he needs it, or do you think it's because he is in pursuit and little doesn't hunt. want to? Well, like you said, I don't know. If a little bit of gamesmanship? I, I personally think he might want to roll into It is his hometown. Route, hometown. I mean, this is Up where front. this is where Versteeg it's lives. Right there, you know. Yeah. We'll do it, and then he knows the streets, and he's relying on the street lights running down the middle of the road. So I think he's he knows what he's doing. I'm gonna pull your mic up a little bit closer to your mouth. Oh just yeah. To make sure, so people can hear you better. Got it. Awesome. Yeah, uh, you know, 
And as we mentioned, and, and as you pointed out, is uh, when Killian first hit uh, um, uh, the streets of Prescott, he looked a little bit awkward or janky, but uh, it's definitely corrected, and he looks more level and steady. And as you mentioned, it could have been simply because he was, you know, he'd been on dirt for 60 miles, and all Stiff, of a sudden yeah. you, you put him on uh, on concrete and uh, asphalt, and it's going to have a different feel to it. And just the excitement as he gets closer to town, more lights, more visuals, and pretty soon here he'll probably be hearing other folks. Our drone is back above Wishy Row, and uh, we also have the cam that's actually going to be coming out of the Whiskey Row 8 as well. So uh, we're going to have, uh, you know, hopefully some uh, good footage of the two of them as they hit Whiskey Row. And then it becomes decision time as we pivot from Killian Korth to Versteeg because, you know, at Look what at point? That. Oh, there they are. There you can they see are. Excellent shot. Okay. Oh, go back to the previous one, please, Matt. You can see right there, Killian like Korth is right in front of him by a few feet, 78 miles into the race. Versteeg is running him down. You can see him looking over. Yeah. Too. I know. I, Absolutely. I'm telling you, there's a hometown pride. Look at this. I knew he would want to bring it in. This is fantastic. Dude, he's going to try and out-sprint him here, yeah, isn't he? He can rest. Oh. Oh, oh he dropped something. Shrama. He, it looks like. Oh. Hmm. Be careful there. No no muling. Just, help pick, <laughs> just uh, pick something up for him. Does Versteeg want to make it to the... Yeah. Oh, he yeah, wants to be the first person gonna, to Whiskey <laughs> Row. Be <laughs> this is fantastic. This is... Incredible. Oh, and here he goes. The airplane yep, arms in the middle the airplane. of the road. Let's go. Look at Michael Versteeg this as is, he's hitting his hometown, that Whiskey Row A station. This is, this they is are it. Neck, you got them in they're the neck same and neck. shot. This is fantastic. And Versteeg, it looks like making. he's overtaken Killian Korth. Maybe. If he doesn't get stopped by that <laughs> car. But there's a, that's a police car. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's running down the middle of the street. <laughs> Okay, so oh, actually he, they he took that right him. turn. We They're saw the on pass. Whiskey Row. Yeah, this is it. We saw the pass. Ooh. Michael Versteeg passes Killian Korth as they turn onto Whiskey Row, the site of the uh, Mile 78 aid station. Versteeg running down the middle of the street. <laughs> and here it continues. <laughs> and here he comes. And Versteeg is the first person to hit Whiskey Row uh, just ahead of Killian Korth, who had been leading for the last 25 or so miles, at least to our understanding. And now Versteeg has uh, hit the aid station. Um, and uh, for all of our excitement, this is still day one. A little injection of drama. Here. Yeah. This is what we needed after, uh, you know, chill. Yeah, this is great. And, so and they're, they're set up with their respective crews, you know, up, you know, across the, uh, the area from one another. Um, I don't know what kind of, if they, whether they've got music playing there, if we might be able to get audio or what. But uh, Killian Korth right there in the orange is standing, speaking to his crew and caretakers. Whereas uh, yeah, we'll see uh, Versteeg if, is throwing on another layer. We'll see if Steven can unmute on his end, and then I can just control the mute toggle on Perfect. my end, depending on... Uh, any sort of audio here. No, if you caught that, uh, Stephen Crawford. Okay, cool. Good. Hey guys, I can hey. hear you. I can't now. Looks like Versteeg is uh, partaking in a burrito. Yeah, Stephen can hear us. We just want to tune in to the uh, kind of the sounds of the aid station here. We won't be able to hear you in studio, uh, but uh, as long as there's not a lot of music, we will keep you unmuted just so that we can kind of listen to what's going on here. Can they hear us? Mm. They can hear us. Yeah. Okay. If they've got us, if they've got the stream on. Mm -hmm. 
got it. Yeah, that was a, a nice little, like you said, an injection of energy. I mean, that was... Uh, is Korth already leaving Whiskey Row? He did not just leave. With well, he is. Yeah, he took the left out. Or does he need something else from the crew? Is it maybe his no. crew is red Vehicle. down here? No, he's. Yeah, he's heading down to uh, Montezuma. That would be quite the power move response. Yeah. Interesting. That's almost too short of a stop there, in my opinion. Uh, but he is. Taken off. He, you know what? He just wants to get to the uh, Flo de Fane Ranch aid station by Satisfy. <laughs> <laughs> that could be it. I th See, I was thinking perhaps uh, Versteeg expended some energy just for that little push, but he's kind of resting up getting a burrito. I, I wonder if it was in response to that push he made or <laughs> if he, he would have done that anyway. Yeah, maybe. I know that. He took his time here in year one as well, in the inaugural year. Oh, yeah. Obviously, he had, uh, I believe he had a little bit more of a, a gap, obviously, because this was the closest we've ever seen coming into this aid station. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I believe he had uh, more of a gap, and he sat down and said he wanted to, uh, he wanted to shoot hoops with Chris Paul and, and Devin Booker if he won. <laughs> <laughs> Iconic moment in Cocodona lore. We do have Steven back up here. There is uh, Michael Versteeg, 2021 winner, and currently in second place. Uh, he came into the aid station ahead of the new leader, uh, and once again leader, Killian Korth. Uh, Killian is uh, probably already a couple blocks down the street at this point, but uh, Versteeg knows what he's doing. I mean, you know, this is... Uh, his hometown, he's taking his time, and I think that when it comes to a race like this, it really doesn't, it's not going to pay uh, dividends to rush if you are going to make mistakes while doing it. I'm not saying that Killian did, but, you know, while it was, as uh, Roy mentioned, an absolute power move, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll see how uh, Versteeg uh, counter punches, really. That's racing sometimes you make kind of impulsive decisions uh i'm not saying it was necessarily impulsive but if he, it wasn't for his presence there and he might have acted differently yeah I, I mean you know maybe uh michael is going to you know push himself a few minutes faster because this is definitely faster than he was in and out in 2021 this is roughly yeah. about a uh he was in there about six minutes, but Killian was only in there two. So uh, that's uh, uh, pretty impressive. So, so at again, this point in the race. This is affecting his move here. So hard to say. Don't they say run your own race? But yeah. <laughs> yeah, you want to run your race, but at the same time, how can you not become, uh, um, you know, uh, wrapped up in uh, what somebody else is doing. And as Michael heads off uh, uh, into the, uh, the the night on uh, Whiskey Row, um, we're going to take this time to kind of circle things up and uh, draw our broadcast day to a close. Uh, things worked out really well in terms of our timing. So Oh yeah, uh, we'll uh, we'll bring it back to the studio here in a moment. But uh, I think we're gonna we'll finish it uh, with that with the uh, studio here. So I say we okay. Well, let's get our propers out of the way. I before think that we do was that. so dramatic. We got it. You can't not. End yeah. Like no, I agree. Um, we're, I'm gonna take one last refresh of the the leaderboard and see if we can give an exactly. update on the women as well. Um, uh, right now, uh, as you just saw on the men's side, your leader is Killian Korth, who has approximately a four minute lead on 2021 winner, Michael Versteeg, uh, in third place on the men's side right now, it looks like it is Mike Groenwegen. Uh, one of the things about this is that I don't know anything about Mike Groenwegen and I'm looking forward to learning more about him tomorrow, uh, when we resume our broadcast in the morning, cause, uh, Matt and I will be waking up and uh, on the call. Um, on the women's side, uh, Sarah Ostazewski, two-time finisher and two-time top five finisher, is currently leading the women's 
uh, race. Uh, and uh, But it's not by much. Uh, she's uh, a few minutes ahead of uh, Mika Thews, uh, who are, they're both uh, about four miles out of Whiskey Row at this point. And then uh, at third slash fourth place, oh boy, uh, Dawn Greenwalt and Eliza Lapierre, uh, their their last ping was both at mile 69.8. One was 11 minutes ago. That was Dawn. And Eliza was 13 minutes ago. So they're basically two minutes apart as well. So Potentially uh, that's where we're at. Together, yeah. I'm going to take a quick spin back to the uh, um, – uh, the runners that are approaching crown King uh, and to give them uh, uh, a moment as well. Uh, crown King of course is the first uh, hard cutoff of the race. Uh, runners have to make it there by 1155 local time, which gives them roughly 40 minutes uh, to get to mile 37.4. And uh, not only do they have to be in crown King, but they have to be out of crown King as well. And we do have a couple of runners where it is going to come down to the wire. Uh, unfortunately, as much as we would love to stay on and cover that, we just don't have the, uh, the personnel to, uh, uh, to do it. But we're going to do our best. Um, let's see. On, uh, on the women's side, uh, it looks like Stephanie Mitchell. Is, her, her signal last pinged an hour 16 ago from mile 30. So she could very well be, um, uh, you know, much closer than we realize. Um, Jim Logan. Okay. I'm, I'm a little bit, we're going to, Chris was in the mix there. Yeah. But, oh, I get what you're saying. We'll have to take it with a grain of salt. I want to find out where, uh, Brett Barker, uh, local favorite is right now. Brett Barker is, currently about third about five and a half miles out of uh uh crown king at this point and uh he still has yet to summit lane mountain and um you know just speaking honestly it's it, he's gonna have to dig real deep um you know it's i'm not saying he can't but it's he's still got a good mile of climb left uh, of a fairly r rough climb before he starts to get into a descent down into Crown King. So uh, we're going to be crossing our fingers yeah. for uh, Brett and uh, see how things go there. Um, Rory. Yes. This has uh, been an absolute blast. Um, and of course, Chris, uh, pleasure. we had a little bit of a wager here and it came down to the wire. It couldn't have come any closer. I'm so, glad we did this. Yeah, I, I am too. <laughs> because so, that far out, it seemed like, eh. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Rory had Michael Versteeg as the first uh, runner to hit Whiskey Row. And I had uh, Killian Korth. And Michael Versteeg passed Killian Korth with less than a tenth of a mile to go in order to get yeah. into Whiskey uh, Row first. Virtual he photo then gave finish. up that lead. Yeah. <laughs> but, but for the fleeting... I mean, what, 20 seconds, 30 seconds? We had a Could wager not on have the line. to that. Had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I thought people might roll in casually. It would be kind of fun. They'd chat, but it seemed like they were having a little battle there. Yeah. A little something to prove. And maybe it's lighthearted, but it affected their decision. But here. is anything with Michael Versteeg ever lighthearted? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Well, I mean,. That's going to be one of the fun things, you know. I'm actually going to be able to get a great night's sleep tonight because I, kn you know, I yes. know that we we busted our butts to you to cover this race. It. Yeah, we and you know it's been fun, but a wager is a wager. How does the how do the stakes work here? So, yeah, I lined it up. I think because I won, <laughs> I was hoping I would take the good one, so I'm going to take I, the good. I, I think that's fair. Do you want to take one, one together? I'm not a whiskey guy. Like I, I'll like I'll drink this, you know, begrudgingly. But that stuff, I don't appreciate it. Like, so you won't appreciate it anyway. Yeah. Okay. So I would rather, I would rather drink the, you know, the old Liam. The old Liam. <laughs> so you are going to drink it though. Yeah. Okay. I'll great. Know. I, I thought you bet. were leaving me after all those drinks we shared at Crown King. Oh my goodness, <laughs> we have shared many drinks at Crown Post King. Post race. <laughs> yes. So. Yes. Over uh, over several years. A celebration of the fact that I won the bet 
And then I had this opportunity to. Yeah, uh, I, I'm so glad, like I mentioned, with you. to be able to bring you on to this show uh, here at the Cocodona 250. Uh, Rory, this is not going to be the last time that we do this. It might be the last time we make a wager like this. Yeah, it's kind of high stakes. So. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, we got to. Maker, I don't normally drink stuff this we good. have to, You know, we have to control our gambling urges at this <laughs> point, so. Yes, Pete, I know that's not whiskey. It's at least not in his eyes. How do you open this stuff I don't know. Pete, what do I do? Oh, Oh, it's right here. Yeah, there you go. I'm such a noob. (laughs) It's not Guinness. Rory doesn't know how to open it. Well, when it was Guinness, he didn't really know how to open it either. (laughs) Guinness, and then this. Pete told me to do an Irish car bomb (laughs) earlier, so I guess I'm just missing Bailey's. Wow. (laughs) He, he got it. <laughs> Sorry. I guess this is why it's so good. You got to work to get to it. You got to earn it. <laughs> oh, my God. Live action. There's nothing like great, it. Uh, great entertainment. Wax tie. You should be able to turn it from there. To now. be fair, I traveled with this. The reason it's personal to me, it was a uh, wedding gift. Peel it. <laughs> Feel it? People. Oh, no. It's yeah, now you can turn it, right? Is it not turning? No. Like I said, I traveled with this. It's been in there you multiple times. Te- oh, my God. <laughs> this guy's making me look like an idiot. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I loosened it up, though. I loosened it up. All right. Oh, well, great. cheers. Let's cut to the chase. But I won. Yes, you did. Hmm. Oh, my like a metaphor first part of the race good maker's mark second part of the race burns like hell <sighs> fireball <laughs> well uh <laughs> that brings a day uh, a very entertaining day here at the coconut 250 2023 <sighs> to a close uh, once again uh Just roy monahan thanks for joining me i'm chris warden uh we will be back on the air tomorrow at what 6 a.m we said local time 6 a.m so that gives us about uh Six and a half hours to compose ourselves. Matt and I as we'll be back on the air. Rory, always a pleasure. Thanks for having me on.